On the evening of November the 23rd, 2012, Sam Puckett and Carly Shay, two friends who had known each other for their entire lives, stepped onto the elevator of Carly's apartment for the final time. The two rode down together, knowing that it was fully possible that they would never see each other again. They exchanged few words and a sentimental gift before finally seeing each other off. iCarly had started airing on Nickelodeon barely five years before, and in the blink of an eye, it had become one of the biggest shows on the network, and perhaps one of the most popular live-action children's shows of all time. And now, as the curtains came to a close and Sam rode off into the night, there was only one thing that the network still had left. A legacy to preserve. On April the 16th, 1994, all that first hit the airwaves as part of the recently launched SNCC programming block. The program was a sketch variety show, much like Saturday Night Live, although it wasn't live, it starred children, and it was most likely taped sometime before their bedtime. The show was immediately a hit, with the second episode introducing the famous Good Burger skit to the program, which would grow into an iconic piece of pop culture even outside of the show. Just a few years into its broadcast, the show's two most popular cast members were spun off into their own show, Keenan and Cal, which ran for four seasons and was extremely popular for the time. During this period, a cinematic adaptation of the Good Burger skits was also released. Keenan Thompson's career would continue after this, with him being cast in SNL merely three years after leaving Nickelodeon, a position which he still holds to this day. It rapidly was becoming obvious that all that was a breeding ground for successful performers and projects at Nickelodeon. Despite this, in 1999, the show went into a brief production hiatus, with the choice ultimately being made to completely cycle out every cast member on the show. In the wake of this, a new concept was created that would totally change the trajectory of Nickelodeon content. Amanda Bynes, one of the cast members all that now sought to replace, was given a show of her own, to be known as simply The Amanda Show. Although The Amanda Show featured a variety of content, by the end, three performers on the show stood out among the rest. The first of these was Nancy Sullivan, who was often illustrated playing ill-fated adult characters. And more obviously, there was Drake Bell and Josh Peck, who were often illustrated as buffoonish friends known for getting into fights. And so, when The Amanda Show ended in 2002, it was decided to create a new show to hold the specific talent talents, known as Drake and Josh. The show presented the titular pair as recently acquainted stepbrothers, getting used to their new lives together, all while battling their sadistic sister, who quickly became seen as the breakout talent of the show, leading to her actress getting her own program when Drake and Josh ended in 2007. My general point here is that from a certain point of view, iCarly existed not only as an extremely popular program, it also stood tall as a representative of of Nickelodeon history, as it was essentially a spin off of a spin off of a spin off. And so, as you can imagine, when iCarly came to an end in 2012, there was an anticipation that Nickelodeon would continue this two decade tradition of legacy and profit. And out of all of the stars of iCarly, there was only one person that shone above the rest. One person who truly proved that they were talented and popular enough to usher in a new era of Nickelodeon history. And that star's name... was... Gibby. 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 <laughs> 
Okay, so for those of you who are out of the loop, iCarly was such a popular show at Nickelodeon that when it ended, it was decided that the show would have not one, but two spin-offs, both featuring significant iCarly characters in their own standalone stories. Both of these spin-offs had pilot episodes, which were scripted, recorded, and put in front of the decision makers at Nickelodeon, and both spin-offs were heavily set up in the actual iCarly finale. However, only one of these spin-offs actually came into being. Now, this video is quite obviously about the iCarly spin-off that actually exists, but I thought it would be fun to start things off here with a little bit of a pre-intermission, discussing what could have been, and more specifically, the iCarly spin-off that almost nobody knows about. And I'm talking about, of course, Gibby! Exclamation mark. Here's the story. In the first week of August 2012, when most teenagers were enjoying their summers lounging on the beach listening to Wiz Khalifa and LMFAO, Noah Monk was once again on a Sunset Boulevard soundstage. For the following nine days, a pilot starring Noah as Gibby would be filmed, and then fully edited before the month was out. This was then shown to Nickelodeon executives, who did not go for it. So it was shelved, and then quickly forgotten. Sam and Cat was announced before filming had even finished on the Gibby pilot, and that show's first episode went into production one month later. Now, earlier in this miniseries, I have occasionally implied that Gibby was in fact an earlier incarnation of Sam and Cat, and that one of the projects being cancelled is what led the other into existing. However, while researching this part of the video, I discovered that in fact, it was originally intended that Gibby and Sam and Cat would coexist as sister shows at the exact same time. However, while doing further research, I discovered that my original hunch was technically actually correct. Just a few years ago, Jeanette McCurdy did a one-woman show about her life, which is now being adapted into a book you should pre-order, and someone who went to that one-woman show told me a detail that I have never seen discussed anywhere else. Basically, from what I have been told, there is a third, distinct iCarly spin-off which predates both of the understood recorded projects that almost nobody knows about, except for Jeanette McCurdy. The show would have featured a noticeably older Sam Puckett, now a guidance counselor after years of personal growth, becoming a mentor figure to a group of teenagers at a middle school where she is employed. If filmed, this pilot would have shown an incredible amount of growth for Sam, who while once a troubled teen in and out of juvie, is now an adjusted adult trying to help kids who are on the same path that she once was. However, shortly after these plans were started, Nickelodeon executives decided to end the iCarly sister show, Victorious, and with this came the realization that Ariana Grande was extremely popular with kids online. So the choice was made to add Ariana to the Untitled Sam project. With this came the understanding that a cat valentine can't work in a middle school, and the plot was quickly shifted in a major way. Sam and Cat would now feature the characters as babysitters living in California, setting the tone much closer to Victorious than iCarly, and more importantly, instead of featuring four middle school leads who would be featured throughout the entire show, most of the kids in Sam and Cat would revolve in and out episode by episode. Now, I don't have a lot of evidence for this because details about all this stuff is very sparse, but it's currently my theory that the Gibby pilot was in fact a hasty reworking of a lot of the material that they threw in the waste bin when Ariana joined the Untitled Sam project. Specifically, the fact that the show is about Gibby working in a middle school and becoming a mentor figure to a group of eccentric tweenagers. Now, when I first started planning this miniseries and I came to this part of the project, it was my intention that we would just skip Gibby entirely, because at the time, we knew almost nothing about it, and it seemed kind of boring. However, sadly, last year, the entire script leaked online. Which means that I now have no excuse to not tell you every single thing that there is to know 
about the Gibby pilot. My plan from here on out is that we're going to create a loose canon reconstruction of this lost serial. I'm going to get some of my friends in, they're going to record, you know, some of the lines that are in the script, and I'm going to get an animator to do a little puppet show for us, and it's going to kind of represent what this pilot might have looked like. And we're all just going to pretend that we're actually watching the real thing. Now, before we get into this, um, I just want to tell a quick story because there's some stuff in this segment that is so cool that it simply needs an introduction. So when I was working on this, I knew that if I was going to reconstruct the Gibby pilot, that I would need some visuals for it. You know what I mean? I, I need something to work off of. So what I started doing is I started reaching out to cast and crew that worked on, you know, this pilot episode and kind of going like, look, I'm trying to do this project, you know, and I'm looking for people that took photos on set. You understand what I'm saying? And some of the people I reached out to knew who I was, some of the people didn't, but I got a lot of photos, you know, because people had phones back then, people had iPads, so people were sending me all these different photos. And it really helped with this segment, but one person sent something so cool that I just have to highlight it by itself. So this person apparently was at some stage in a room with a multicam monitor showing them filming the actual pilot, and throughout the day, they occasionally took photos of this monitor. Which means that even though it looks like crap, I have semi-legitimate screen grabs of the actual Gibby pilot in my possession. Now, before we get into this unprecedented exploration of a once lost chapter in Nickelodeon history, I want to talk to you a little bit about security. These days, there are a lot of ways that hackers can try to steal personal information. I've learned a lot of things about security over the last decade, but one of the big things is never trust an email with an overly attentive tone. I can't count on one hand the amount of times I've opened my email and someone has sent me something that goes along the lines of, uh, hi, this is Google. We're gonna delete your account unless you log in with this link. And of course, it's not actually Google, it's a fake website designed to trick you into sending your password to a stranger. That's why I've taken to always checking where an email is coming from, and I always set up two-factor authorization when it's a possibility. Being careful is key, because when you're not careful, hackers can gain access to your computer, your bank account info, or worse, your unreleased sitcom scripts. But accidents do happen, and when it comes to malicious attacks online, you can't find a better ally in security than today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is an international company which focuses on security, convenience, and access of content. The site hosts 5,000 proxy servers in 59 countries, with remote access allowing you to experience the internet from all corners of the globe. However, NordVPN has since expanded their operations, and there's a lot of new features that come with the software that really make it worth the investment. I'm specifically referring to the threat protection features including an ad blocker that kills malicious pop-ups and spam, and technology that specifically tracks malware and stops it from entering your computer. I really like that these functions are at work in the background at all times, even when you don't have the VPN portion of the software running, meaning that you always have these checks and balances to trust in. Right now, if you go to nordvpn.com slash Quinton, you'll get a huge discount off a two-year plan and four extra months free. It's an incredible deal. Plus, if you decide you don't like the product in the first 30 days, there is a money back guarantee for those four weeks. No questions asked, meaning this really is a risk-free venture. So once again, check these guys out at nordvpn.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N, and a big thanks for them sponsoring, because honestly, without them, I don't know if this segment would have really been possible. Uh, but with all that out of the way, Let's get into our third show in the NSU. Gibby! Exclamation mark. Okay, before we start this reconstruction, do a little bit of role-playing with me here. Pretend for a moment that you are an executive at Nickelodeon, and you are being shown a pilot for a potential show in late 2012. As the projector burrs and the video file begins, it is crucial 
that this opening scene conveys to you the quality and longevity of this pitch. This is the first thing you see. We fade up to an interior at Ridgeway High School, where a teacher, Mr. Waggett, is bent over a table. Two nurses stand by his side, trying desperately to treat a wound on his ass cheeks. He screams, for the intensity of the ass pain is unbearable. Ah! Please, hold still! I can't, it hurts! Mr. Waggett, I'm so sorry! You get away from me! Suddenly, another familiar face enters the classroom. Principal Franklin, a regular character on iCarly. He shoos everyone out of the room, save for Gibby. As the nurses drag Waggett away, he lets out a final proclamation. I want Gibby punished! You hear me, Gibby? You hear me? So? How's it going? Gibby, you brought a weasel to class? Yes, sir. Why? Because we had a big test today and I was nervous. Petting Wheezy makes me feel calm. Well, Wheezy didn't make your teacher feel calm when he was biting his butt. That's how weasels express love. So right off the bat, we can take note that Gibby includes something that makes it totally unique when compared to iCarly. That being an implied time loop. Watching iCarly as a kid, I always presumed that one of the reasons the show ended when it did was that if it lasted any longer, it would be completely impossible to believe that these guys were still young enough to be in high school. Especially as it was clearly stated that the characters were aging in real time. So it's weird to discover that the pitch for Gibby's spinoff was that the titular character would have been perpetually 16 years old, presumably sticking to his high school hijinks for as long as the show would be on. Was the implication meant to be that the other iCarly characters were also still in high school and just perpetually off screen? Either way, it's hard for me to imagine turning on the TV in 2015 or 2016 only to see Gibby on screen in the third season of his spinoff still pretending to be in high school. Anyways, you remember in the final episode of iCarly when the writers spent like 20 minutes carefully setting up that Gibby now has a pet ferret and that everyone keeps calling him a weasel for some reason? Here, we find out that this is because owning a weasel is Gibby's entire personality post iCarly. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to give you Saturday detention. What? But Saturday is the Seattle Weasel Convention! That doesn't- Please! Me and Wheezy are gonna wear matching outfits! I've been sewing for weeks! Wanting to give in to Gibby's request, Franklin comes up with a new punishment. Gibby will use his study period all week to help in the cafeteria on the middle school side of the building. And then, uh, the title sequence plays. We sh should we make up a Gibby theme? We just need to- Get get an AI to absorb like every like back house Mike Drake Bell song, and then we, <laughs> and then we, <laughs> we take whatever it gives us back, where, where it's just like one day at a time, being a man. Gibby! <laughs> <laughs> to sum up the next section as quickly as possible, Gibby is doing his promised punishment when he sees a group of mean kids bullying four unpopular students by throwing chicken nuggets at them. Gibby stands up for the quartet, saying that they're his friends and they should be left alone. The bullies are so embarrassed to be called out by a D-list internet celebrity that they apologize and leave. The four kids, thinking Gibby meant what he said, follow him to his lockers in the high school side of the building where they invite him to hang out, because after all, he said they were his friends. Gibby, feeling guilty over the situation, agrees to hang out with them at the local rec center, known as Bixby's. However, as he prepares to leave the school, two extremely attractive cheerleaders approach him and basically proposition him for a three-way. Hey, Gibby. Hi, Gibby. Hey, girls. What's up? We were just going to my house. 
to work on new cheer moves. You want to come watch us? Yes! That'd be... Impossible, because I already have plans. Oh, come on. We're going to try a double upside down cartwheel. Together. Oh! No, thank you. Come on, kids. The, the gall of putting it in the pilot, though. Like, <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> I feel like with Victoria's, they like held out. They were like, they were like, let's not put the sex jokes in front of the executives, but we'll put it in later. The goal of having it in the pilot episode. <laughs> At the rec center, Gibby spends most of the visit bored out of his mind, as you would too, I imagine, if you had to hang out with a bunch of middle schoolers. It's here that we're properly introduced to all of the kids and their respective gimmicks. First, there's Winston, who suffers from extreme paranoia, always presuming the worst and suffering from anxious breakdowns at a moment's notice. Then there's Markon. Markon believes he is a robot sent from the future, who is stuck in 2013. He typically speaks like a droid, often dropping casual predictions of a very cartoonish apocalyptic future. He thinks he's a robot sent from the future? I am a robot sent from the future. Though, the real term is robo-droid. The real term is mentally ill. One more insult and I'll spray you with my robo-fluid. Charming. That was one of my favorite Disney Channel shows. And no one talks about it anymore. No, the future Did Phil ever forever. get back to the future? I didn't finish the show. Flip is a kiss-ass, holding no individuality whatsoever and simply trying to mirror whoever he is speaking to. Usually Gibby. And finally, there's Jordy. The girl. Jordy is basically a tiny version of Sam from iCarly. She's very mean to everyone around her and puts everyone off with her callous demeanor. The most notable thing about these four friends is that they're not really friends at all. They are simply the four least popular kids in school and spend time together merely out of the circumstance of being at the bottom of the totem pole. In one scene, when one of the kids is bullied by ninth graders, the others scamper and do nothing. Gibby chastises them for this, saying that friends should stick up for each other no matter the circumstance. After this, we are introduced to the final two incidentals of the show, both employees at the rec center. The first is Ozzy, a buffoonish village idiot who often fails at the jobs that he's been asked to do. Listen up! Listen up, everybody. This hat was turned into the lost and found. If this is your hat, and you can prove it's your hat... Hey, didn't you lose a hat last week? Yeah, but... Dang, this is my hat. Clearly, the system works. Go about your business. Me and Hippie have this thing where whenever we talk about these shows, we talk about, like... The Gibbyfication of Nickelodeon shows, where like Gibby was such a big hit that like th over time they just kept adding Gibbies to the shows, yeah. to where there'd be like six Gibbies. <laughs> like like uh, Victorious <laughs> has like four Gibbies, and it's just like oh, for real game shakers. Like game most of the cast is Gibby. Yeah, most of the cast is just Gibby, and we're just like there's something funny. Basically, what's happening here is that G Gibby is so preoccupied with being the straight man that they're introducing another Gibby. <laughs> To do funny shit! After Ozzy is introduced, we meet his boss, an older woman named Sierra, played by the daughter of Diane from Cheers. I'm not, I'm not joking, look that up. Sierra enters holding two basketballs, both covered in lotion. And, and my god, you're never gonna guess where this goes. I told you to put sunscreen on those two little boys outside and fill the basketballs with air. Yeah, I did all that. No! You put sunscreen on the basketballs. <laughs> and then you're like, wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> and look at those two little boys. Two fifth grade boys whose tummies are filled with air. <laughs> Walk in. So much pressure. <laughs> what the fuck is happening? What the fuck? Did he, did he put fucking air pump up their asses? Can you 
believe the executives didn't go for this? It has all the workings of a classic Nickelodeon hit. Do you know what's really funny? Do you know what's really funny? They could have had, they could have not leaked this script. So someone working on the show just put it out last year. They could have kept this a secret. But they didn't. They were like, no, we're just going to put this out. <laughs> like self-destructive attitude. Releasing this script to the world. Oh my god. After this memorable sequence, Gibby enters and is recognized by Sierra, who remembers seeing him on the internet. Gibby is smitten and attempts to make his move. You know, you are not bad looking. I'm 24 and I have a boyfriend. I'm 16 and I have a weasel. After this, Sierra spots two shady characters hanging out in the rec center who seem to be looking for something. She briefly tries to deal with them, but is distracted by Gibby's jailbaiting. Anyways, Gibby then attempts to teach the four middle schoolers how to play a game called Dodgeline. The game is dodgeball, but played on trampolines. A pretty stupid idea which the showrunners actually recycled a few years later when the game showed up on Henry Danger. The kids aren't good at the game, so Ozzy ends up joining Gibby to spar. Ozzy is too good at Dodgeline, however, and ends up jumping so high that his head gets stuck in the ceiling. The paramedics come and take him to the hospital, and Sierra considers going to watch over him since he's underage and his parents are out of town. She's afraid to leave the rec center alone, but Gibby promises to look after the place. Sierra is impressed by this initiative and offers him a job at Bixby's. Gibby accepts the position and agrees to close up shop. After sending the kids home, however, he's approached by these shady characters from earlier who intend to rob the rec center. We want money. Where's the money? What money? Gotta be some around here somewhere. Let me go. Ah, come on. I'm an internet celebrity. Ah, where's the money? I don't know. I've only been working here for 17 minutes. Break his thumb. No, don't. I need both my thumbs to wash my weasel. <laughs> <laughs> the four middle schoolers eventually return and realize that because Gibby is their friend, they have to help him, no matter the circumstance. They save him by attacking the baddies with dodgeballs, and once freed from his restraints, the emancipated Gibster removes his shirt, hulking up, as the script says, and kicking the men out of the center. The kids tell Gibby that this has been the best day of their lives, and then they... Also, take their clothes off. I don't know why. It just it just kind of it just kind of happens, you know. Like right at the end, they all uh, they all get naked for some reason, and then Gibby comes over and he gives them all one big naked group hug. And uh, the executives did not go for this one. These screen grabs are actually iPad photos of a multicam setup, as you'll remember, and one of the angles shows the exterior of Bixby's during all of this. And it really makes you wonder, what would it be like to just walk by this rec center in the middle of the night and see this through the window without context? Or with context, because context doesn't help, trust me. Anyways, this scene specifically is the reason that this pilot will never be released. And that's the Gibby spinoff. <laughs> Okay, so now that we have officially finished the Gibby pilot, there are a few curiosities that I would like to put out to air. Uh, these are not questions that I have answers to, but they are questions that I would like to ramble about endlessly. The first, and by far the biggest to me, is did the Gibby spinoff ever have a serious chance of being made? Or did Nickelodeon finance this pilot basically to humor the people making it? I've personally gone back and forth on this a few times. When I first started researching Gibby, I was convinced that it's such a stupid idea that there's no way it ever had an actual chance of being made. But now that I've gone through all this and I've seen the Gibby pilot, I've helped put it back together, I'm convinced that there was so much money put into this little thing that Nickelodeon could not have financed all of this if they weren't at the very least 
giving it a chance. I think it's very possible that the financiers and decision makers at Nickelodeon entered that room totally prepared to sign off on everything and get this ball rolling, only to then leave the room saying to each other, no one can ever see this. Somebody flew too close to the sun with the Gibby pilot. In the following years, the writers that worked on the Gibby pilot would recycle the material in several different places. And I'm actually not just talking about the script, because I'm actually mainly talking about the massive set that they constructed for Bixby's. Now, this is all mainly based on my personal judgment, just kind of eyeing things here, but it seems to me that the set for Bixby's would eventually be cut in half, with the two different sides being built into two different sets for two different shows. The current standing theory is that the far right side of Bixby's became Henry's living room from Henry Danger, while the far left side of Bixby's became the game room from Game Shakers. This is kind of hard to gauge at first because they really strip these sets down, but the easiest way to tell is to look for doors, windows, raised platforms, and staircases. Door, window, door, window, door, raised platform, staircase, door, raised platform, staircase. And of course, the actual material in the script for Gibby would also be recycled in many other scripts in coming years, but the interesting thing to me is that whenever the writers would do this, they would always do it in such a way that it maintained continuity, as if they still intended that the Gibby pilot was canon, even if it never had been released to the public. Uh, the most obvious example to me is that uh, Dodgeline showing up in Henry Danger does not overwrite the Gibby pilot or contradict it in any way. It's a completely different plot line with the same sport, almost as if it is a throwback to the Gibby pilot that no one but the writers could possibly understand. And then there is Markan. I'll try not to linger on this too long because I know this video has been a waste of your time so far, but in the final season of Henry Danger from 2019, they do a pretty on the nose parody of the Terminator movies. In the story, we find out that in the coming decades, the machines will rise up and humanity will go to war against them. The person who ends up leading the human resistance against the robots is Piper, Henry's sister, who goes back in time to the 2010s as an elderly woman to warn her family that a robot has been sent back into the past to kill her younger self. And I know this sounds like a pointless tangent, but here's the twist. We find out that in the future, the machines build all robots to look like children, mainly so that humans will not find them threatening. Which implies, and here's the big reveal, that Markon is actually a robot from the future. Because what else would explain that Markon has been describing an apocalyptic future, which is very clearly consistent with the actual canon future of the NSU? And you know what? I'm getting that list back out, and I'm writing down future robot apocalypse and robots from the future that look like children. There's gonna be, like, a significant amount of people who find my channel through this video, and they're gonna click on it like, oh wow, a Sam and Cat video, I remember that show. And then they're just gonna be like, what the f fuck is this? So, the second big question that I want to answer at the end of this segment is, would the Gibby spinoff have actually been worth watching? Is it a tragedy that this show wasn't ultimately made, right? And, uh, you know, I'm just gonna be honest about my feelings. I think a lot of people hold on to a curiosity about the Gibby spinoff because they presume that it would have been the anti-Sam and Cat. Whatever they don't like about Sam and Cat, they presume the Gibby pilot would have done all those things right. And I, do, I certainly don't think that's the case. And I would go as far as to say that in this 22-minute script, there is not a single thing that I actually think would be worth watching the show for, except for Markon. 
Because I think there's something so funny about that long play, right? Like the writers deciding at the very beginning, Markon is actually a robot from the future. And then them writing the entire show knowing they have that in their back pockets and refusing to use it until the final season. That would be iconic. Everything else sucks. But it's worth saying, everything sucks on purpose because that's what they were going for. To recap a lot of what I've set up in my last few videos, in the early 2010s, television networks developed a sudden shift in demographics where teenagers who once watched television religiously were now shifting to online exclusive platforms. Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Twitch, Vine, you name it. And after this tidal wave hit, most of the people who were still religiously watching kid shows on cable were literal babies. I mean, there was once a huge demographic, the main demographic arguably, of 10 to 15 year olds who only watched Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, and Cartoon Network, and now people were barely getting past Blue's Clues age before they tuned out and got an iPad. So the real reason that Gibby looks bad to you or I is that it was a show for toddlers. And you and I are not toddlers. I hope. I hope no one's putting on Quinn fucking reviews for their two-year-old. So by late September 2012, when the Sam and Cat pilot was finally being filmed, it was clear that everything was on the line. This was the final chance these writers had to make a follow-up to iCarly, and it had to continue the legacy of all these previous different shows while making the executives happy and while being a proper show for babies that maintain the aesthetic of someone just jingling car keys in front of your face. And now, I think, more than half an hour into this video, we are properly set up to review Sam and Cat, the iCarly spinoff, and let me remind you, also, the Victorious spinoff. But before we do that, I just want to quickly stop right here and kind of manage expectations. When I first announced this miniseries back in 2020, um, I announced it as a 400,000 subscriber special. And it was this big thing where I was just like, if we get to 400k, I'm going to do a video about iCarly. And I had no idea how big and how out of control all of this would ultimately get right and how much it would just consume my life in every conceivable way and how much of a success it would ultimately end up becoming but i i just want to say that to me sam and cat has always been the end to an era there was an era of nickelodeon shows to me that started with Zoe 101 and Drake and Josh and continued on through iCarly and Victorious and Sam and Cat is the bookend to that because it, it really is the end to this massive story that happened with all these shows. And because Sam and Cat is kind of an end to me, uh, when this is done and through, I would like to stop. I'm not trying to be a bitch, you know, I've just got this vibe from some of you guys recently where you expect that after I'm done with Sam and Cat, I'm gonna go back and review literally every single show in the NSU Expanded Universe, and it's like, mm, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I don't want to do. I don't want to review Henry Danger and Danger Force. That's that seems awful. Um, but uh, you know, I'm saying all this because I have other videos I want to do after this, which do fit the theme of what we're doing here. It's just they're not necessarily going to be like teen sitcom reviews, and I'm hoping you guys will stick around to see all the creative things um, that I'm going to do there. But more importantly, I am willing to make a deal with you guys. And here's the deal, okay? Here's the promise I'm willing to make with you guys. If we get to 1 million subscribers by the end of this year, 2022, then I will go back next year and review Drake and Josh and Zoe 101, okay? So that's my promise. That's two, sh two shows, two reviews for the price of one subscriber goal. And I don't, I don't know if we're going to organically hit that number this year, but I think if we start pushing for it now, anything is possible. And I want to set this up here and now so that we can start, you know, pulling for it. 
and so that we can just have the expectation that you know, you know, this isn't the last video in the mini series, but this is uh, sort of the beginning of me wrapping it up. And there's still gonna be a bunch of fun videos, so don't think I'm quitting YouTube or anything. I'm just telling you uh, that uh, Drake and Josh and Zoe 101 will come next year if we get to a million subscribers by the end of December. But for now, we finished iCarly, we finished Victorious, and yes, we have finished Gibby, which means there is only one show that we have left to review. This is season one, episode one of Sam and Cat. Don't know why I winked there, but I'm pretty tired, so that's the take we're using. So a quick recap of important details. In the final episode of iCarly, Carly Shay is reunited with her rarely seen military father, who is either in the Navy or the Air Force depending on what episode you're watching. Mr. Shay can't stay for long, but tells Carly that she can come with him to Italy to live the rest of her teenage years abroad. This will mean putting her internet career on hold, but all of Carly's friends tell her to do it. Meanwhile, in the Gibby plot, Gibby gets a weasel. In the C plot, Sam helps Spencer rebuild a motorcycle, and as thanks for this, Spencer gives her the bike at the end of the episode. The last we see of her, she is riding off in the night, leaving everything behind. Now, Victorious doesn't have a proper finale, but does have an equivalent episode clearly setting up a spin-off. In the penultimate broadcast of the show, Cat Valentine is revealed to be homeless after her parents moved away and left her alone. She has been living at Hollywood Arts and laments that she would live with her Nona, because she's Italian, not Latina. She would live with her Nona, but she recently moved to Venice, Italy, because Nona's dad is in the Air Navy too. But it turns out that her grandma has actually moved to Venice, California, and she announces that she can now live with her Nona. These two episodes are the basic foundation for what is about to unfold. At the start of the Sam and Cat pilot, Sam is seen pulling up to a food truck on her motorcycle. The employee at the window recognizes her as Sam from iCarly and asks what she's doing in LA. She responds, looking for fun, just as we see Ariana ride by in the background. Cat runs into two children who are looking for their own missing cat, and Cat joins in the search after loudly declaring that Cat is her name as well. Miss Valentine soon hears mewing coming from a garbage can and leaps in head first. Really a good metaphor for how we're starting this one. She saves the kitten and the kids run off, as Cat realizes that her gum fell out of her mouth and she hunts to retrieve it from the trash. But what do you know, a garbage truck comes down the line and throws Cat in without checking. I find this writing insulting. Sanitation departments rely on only partial automation to ensure the safety of all citizens. Garbage men and women are the thin sludge line that protects all of America from its own filth, and I will not let children's sitcoms slander the industry like this. Sam throws her burrito to the ground, once again showing disrespect to the Institute of LA Sanitation through public littering, and runs after the garbage truck, jumping the ladder, hanging from the back, leaping in head first, still a good metaphor. Cat gleefully identifies that she is Sam from my Carly as the garbage truck begins to compress the trash inside. Cat faints from fear, and Sam has to save both of them. One thing of note that you've probably caught on to already is that it's implied in this pilot that the original iCarly Victorious crossover, I Party with Victorious, is in fact not canon. Because the plot to this show heavily relies on the fact that the worlds of iCarly and Victorious have never collided before, and that this is a new thing for everyone. Now, to many of you, this might seem like a massive plot hole, as the 2011 crossover is pretty important to the timelines of both shows. But I actually think this makes a little sense in the grand scheme of things. Allow me to introduce a theory about the Nickelodeon sitcom universe, one which I have hinted at before, yet never explicitly stated. I call it the meta superposition theory. A superposition is a big sciencey term that means a particle that both does and does not exist in a select position until observed. I think anyways, I, I, I didn't go to college. I review shows meant for children. But what does a superposition have to do with Sam and Cat? Well, here's the infamous discrepancy. 
Every show in the so-called Nickelodeon sitcom universe, or NSU, exists in two consecutive states. The first state is a real series of events which actually take place in the universe, and the second state is an in-universe TV show, a piece of fiction typically said to be watched by the lead characters of other NSU sitcoms. For instance, a Zoe 101 character appears in iCarly Season 4, yet Zoe 101 is a TV show in iCarly Season 6. A prominent Drake and Josh character appears in Victorious Season 2, and yet the characters are seen discussing Drake and Josh as a TV show mere episodes later. The same can be said of iCarly, where Drake and Josh characters appear in Seasons 3 and 4, yet it is explicitly a TV show in Seasons 5 and 6. A character introduced in Sam and Cat is featured extensively in Henry Danger, and another is all but confirmed to be Cat Valentine's brother. Yet, in the animated Henry Danger series, Sam and Cat is confirmed to be a TV show that the main characters are aware of, as Ariana is canonized as an in-universe performer. And most confusingly of all, in the iCarly finale, Carly is briefly seen browsing Twitter, reading tweets about the Nickelodeon sitcom iCarly coming to an end, meaning that iCarly is a TV show inside the iCarly universe. Many people have posited fan theories explaining these discrepancies, such as the idea that Drake and Josh is a reality show in the iCarly universe, or that one of the girls from Zoe 101 turned their life story into a sitcom later on, or that kind of thing, but the consistent inconsistency of all of these cameos and easter eggs can only imply one ultimate conclusion. The NSU doesn't make any sense. To put it simply, it seems to me that there are constants in this universe which are so polarizing that the only ways that these characters have managed to deal with them is to develop a kind of selective amnesia about huge portions of their lives. It might be the case that Drake and Josh was one of your favorite shows as a kid, but if you are placed in the vicinity of a character from Drake and Josh, you lose all memories of that portion of your youth, just as a random example. There are clearly bound boundaries between these different sub-pockets in the NSU reality, with an emphasis on certain things not being retained. A character from iCarly cannot just suddenly remember that their lives are identical to a teen series airing at the same time that they're in school. Craig and Eric cannot positively identify that Carly Shea looks exactly like the sister of one of their classmates, and the cast of Henry Danger cannot come to realize that one of the bad guys they face every year is also a character from a show that they they all seem to be aware of. Generally, it seems that the memories of these cast members are designed to be warped at any small or large shift in the superposition. So it's not that I Party with Victorious didn't happen, it's merely that said sub-reality romp is very faint in the minds of these characters, because it does not suit the universe at this given moment. Or maybe it's, uh... TV show for babies. After the title sequence, Sam wakes Cat up with a leaf blower and the two properly meet. After noting that they're both pretty gross because of their garbage adventure, Cat says that Sam can shower at her Nona's apartment. Sam says she doesn't want to muck up her motorcycle getting there, so she decides to trick a limo driver to chauffeur them around for free. The driver says he is waiting on a Dr. Williams, so Sam says that they are his daughters, and when the driver questions this, they loudly declare that he is attempting to assault them. And and he sheepishly relents and agrees to drive them around. We jump cut to the pair in the Valentine household, where they are soon joined by Dice. Dice is, uh, a character? I've been dreading him from the moment I found out he exists. Dice lives in an apartment in the same building and announces that he has made some investments which he is selling. Hair. Specifically, celebrity hair. Cat insists on buying the Bieber hair that he has brought and begins sniffing it and moaning. Wow, what a totally normal thing to put into this show for babies, and not the writer's poorly disguised fetish. Dice notices that Cat's new friend is Sam from iCarly, and Sam offers to sell him some of her hair. He runs off, saying he'll be back soon with bags and scissors. Quit sniffing the Biebs. I can't help it. He smells so talented! Nona then bursts into the room, wearing a sack and being pushed by children in a shopping cart. We learn that Nona babysits for a living, but has decided she can't put up with these little demons anymore, and she is going to quit. She then announces that she is moving into a retirement home. It's time for me to move to Elderly Acres. No! Is this a thing? 
do old people do this? They're like, well, I'm too old to have a job. Put me in a home. Not gonna travel the world or live on a beach. Nope, nope, nope. I'm 65, put me in a wheelchair and throw me in a closet. Kat says that if Nona moves away, she'll have no one to help if she gets stuck on a toilet. Nona says that she will only be five miles away, and Sam says that if Kat does get stuck on the toilet, will Nona please text her a photo? That night, Nona sleepwalks and comes upon Sam in the living room on the fold-out couch. She promptly folds in the couch, trapping Sam inside. Ariana comes to the living room, and antics ensue. Ghost couch! <laughs> Kat gets Sam out and invites herself to sleep in the same bed as her, and things get mildly subtextual. The two have a conversation about how Kat is lonely and wants to know how long Sam will be there, and Sam says that she's in no rush to go back home now that Carly is gone, and that it's her plan to get on her bike and go wherever it takes her. Then Nona comes back and folds in the couch again, scene. Later, Kat gets home from school, we'll cover this later, I know it's weird, and Sam is there to greet her. They initially get up to some banter before Sam casually states that she admitted Kat's grandma to elderly acres without her consent. Sam was on the same page as Nona, she was like, this bitch sleepwalks, lock her in jail, throw away the key, she's a menace to society, I was in a couch! Look, all I'm saying is, I'm pretty sure Kat is supposed to be like 16, 17 in this show. So like entering her life and within 24 hours, murking her only parental guardian is a deranged thing to do. Kat runs off to the elderly home and they run into a group of kids who Nona was supposed to babysit, who they end up bringing along. However, Sam doesn't want them in this part of the episode, so she puts them on an old person bike and straps the baby to the little metal basket and lets them just drive around LA. The kids ride off and we exchange baby antics for elderly antics. Nona is found playing Twister with other old people and they all laugh as they fall over. Quick question, is Twister like a swinger thing? I've never played Twister or seen another adult play Twister. It just seems like it exists exclusively in sitcoms and stories about swingers. Kat realizes that Nona likes living among the elderly, and Sam gives a group of old people tattoos. I told you I wanted a tattoo of Abraham Lincoln. Well, too bad, you got a chicken leg. Ah! <laughs> Whoever said this era of Nickelodeon was a downgrade is crazy. I'm having a great time. The girls run home, and Dice shows up with scissors and a bag all nonchalant, and it's like, bitch, I thought you were gonna be gone five minutes. It's been a whole day. Cat went to school, had an identity crisis, and a change of character, and it took you that long to find scissors? Dai showing up causes Cat to remember that they abandoned a group of kids who are currently getting in trouble at Inside Out Burger for ordering food without any money. The three kids get chased around by a heavy guy, and after a several minute interlude, we cut back. Haha, the joke is that he's slow because he's fat. He passes out, and Cat says that they have to save him, so Sam pumps on his legs while Cat hops on his chest. They then switch. There are people watching this video who are discovering right now that they are somehow into this thing that the show just made up. The man, who is the manager of this specific Inside Out Burger location, declares that Sam and Kat will have free burgers for as long as they both live. Back at the Valentine pad, the kid's mom picks them up and pays the girls $150. Sam briefly jokes about giving Kat an unfair cut before giving her all of the money. Sam says she has to be off before Kat says she wishes she could stay. We sort of have this whole fun odd couple dynamic, built-in conflict, lots of potential for more adventures. Sam ultimately ends up conceding, saying that Kat needs a new roommate, and since Sam doesn't have anywhere to be, she will be Kat's new roommate. Oh my God! The two then decide to go get free dinner at Inside Out Burger, and they pose on a motorcycle sitting on a really phony green screen. Kat is a little too flirty in an obnoxious way, and Sam says it's gonna be a long ride. Okay, let's go ahead and break the ice here by... Okay, let's go ahead and break the ice here by discussing some general hot takes about this pilot episode. Once again, we are approaching this from the guise of, we are executives at Nickelodeon in late 2012. Is this pilot good enough to make into a full show? Well, first of all, let's go ahead and point this out. There are a lot of sitcoms out there which are spin-offs without their core defining trait being 
that they are spin-offs. Frasier is a spin-off of Cheers. Mork and Mindy is a spin-off of Happy Days. Daria is a spin-off of Beavis and Butthead. And even some shows which are more known for being spin-offs, like, God forbid, Young Sheldon, still maintain some independent charm in such a way that if you are in a specific demographic, you can enjoy Young Sheldon in a standalone basis without watching The Big Bang Theory. So it's kind of a red flag to me that this pilot episode that is supposed to be ushering in a brand new age of Nickelodeon history is so dependent on you already finding charm in the source material. Because every single moment in this episode that made me smile even a little bit was in some way a throwback to some element of iCarly or Victorious. From minor things like Sam saying that she feels directionless now that Carly is missing from her life, to more direct things like the fact that Kat is apparently still attending Hollywood Arts in the background of this pilot. And when you take all of that out, what is left? Like, what is the new material? Because I'll tell you one thing, I am not pacing around my living room on a general day making up headcanon fan theories about Dice and Nona. It really kind of feels like to me that all Sam and Cat is at this point is someone taking these two characters from these two different shows and plucking them out of time at the exact moment we saw them last and then just thrusting them forward on that exact same trajectory to see where they go. And that's all good and fine for like a 22 minute short, but I have this gut feeling that there that there is no game plan on how to generate any kind of new energy with this show or with these characters. And I think by the end, things are gonna be either really bad or really weird or both. But you know, just to get back on track here, if I'm an executive in the year 2012, I'm noticing the cracks in the foundation and I'm throwing this shit on the air because this is money printing itself. Now a significant amount of you guys have probably noticed by now that I'm currently standing in front of my pinboard set. I've had this pinboard for about 10 years, it was a gift from my grandmother's husband, he found it in a dumpster, and I've been using it in my videos for about 7 years. However, most of you probably know this set from my last two videos about Victorious, where I used it excessively. Now in this video I'd like to kind of rein it in a little bit, but I would like to very quickly talk about some general hot takes I have about this specific spin-off. So from my experience, it is not an uncommon opinion from people relatively my age that Sam and Cat was a noticeable downgrade from the shows that came directly before it. But there is kind of like a bias you have to take into account there, because like, former Nickelodeon kids have this really weird quirk I've caught on to where no matter how old they are, no matter what era they watched when they were kids, whatever show came out on Nickelodeon right after they were too old to watch it, that is the show that they will consider not only to be a bad program, but to be the program that single-handedly ruined Nickelodeon. So like if you were a Ren and Stimpy kid, and you were like a Rocco's Modern Life kid, and by the time Spongebob came out you were like too old for it, you think Spongebob single-handedly ruined Nickelodeon. And if you were like a Zoe 101 Drake and Josh teenager and you stopped watching by the time iCarly came out, you think iCarly fucking ruined Nickelodeon. And so I'm trying to like, you know, uh, approach this with a sane mindset because Sam and Cat did not ruin Nickelodeon, I just stopped being 10 years old. However, even with an unbiased open mind, I think it is extremely obvious that Nickelodeon branding, just the branding, took an obvious downgrade in between the mid-2000s and the 2010s. And right now, I would just like to highlight a couple really obvious examples of that. Starting off with the logos. This is not a joke, this is not a meme, this is an actual conspiracy theory I believe in. I think that in between 2007 and 2010, Nickelodeon fired whoever was making their logos, because the dropping quality is that obvious. Okay, so let's go ahead and throw up an example. These are the logos for Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, and iCarly. I decided to do this on the pinboard because I know that sometimes the visuals of the pinboard 
do not come through like I want them to. Sometimes I print the images too small. Sometimes my camera quality sucks. Sometimes my printer doesn't understand the nuances of the color. Sometimes the paper that I print out gets wet somehow. But despite the fact that kind of all of that is happening at once right now, you can look at these three logos and you can identify what they are just at a glance, at a thumbnail level. If you are across the room right now, doing some kind of chore while you have this video on and you glance up at the screen, you can easily identify that this is the logo for Drake and Josh, this is the logo for Zoe 101, and this is the logo for iCarly because they're good logos. That's what they're supposed to do. And then you got the logo for Victorious. What is going on here? The catalyst for me realizing that this is a bad logo is that I was working on those last two videos and I had to put the Victorious logo in my thumbnail and it was only when I went and did that that I realized that the Victorious logo is not identifiable at a thumbnail level because it looks bad, it just fades into the background. I mean, some of the letters are too thick, some of the letters are too thin, it has this like weird glossy stroking effect where there's not a consistent border on all of the letters. So like the V, for instance, I'm looking at the V right now, the right side of the lettering on the V is very, you know, st it stands out, it's recognizable. The left side of the V is just gone. And so if you look at those old thumbnails again, if you pull them up, I tinted the whole logo blue because it's all I could do to turn the Victorious logo into something that's actually recognizable from a distance. And then we get to Sam and Cat and all bets are off. Who made this logo? Who designed this logo? Because I'll be honest right now, I'm looking at it right now, this ain't going in my thumbnail. Because like, is this show called Sam? Is it a show called Sam? Hey, did you hear about that new show, Sam? On the left side of the logo, big font, bold letters, gold shimmering color, the word Sam. On the right side of the logo is some kind of like neon light font with no filling, just the stroke, and it says cat, so thin that you would just not see this word if you were walking by it. And then in the middle, you've got perhaps the weakest ampersand I've ever seen in my entire life. What do we have to do to get Nickelodeon to understand you don't put dark blue on black? And furthermore, if I'm just walking by this, I'm thinking that's an E. I'm thinking this show is called Sam E and I can't read the rest. I mean, I'm honestly curious. If there's people out there watching this video who were very little when Sam and Cat came out, the show is almost a decade old. If you were to walk by <laughs> this logo, would you recognize it? If, if I were to take this logo and I were to change the words in the logo, would you get the joke? Because I feel like that is the case with all these logos but not with this logo, because it looks like dog shit. The second thing I want to talk about when it comes to Nickelodeon branding is theme songs. This is a very important detail people don't talk about enough. Um, Nickelodeon theme songs used to be so good that they were almost too good. They were Nickelodeon shows that, that had theme songs that set the standards too high for the rest of the show. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I'm gonna be the one, unforgettable, it's better, unfabulous. There are a significant amount of people in my audience right now who are now thinking about a TV show which has literally not crossed their minds in 15 years. A show that has no memorable aspects, no episodes that immediately stand out in your mind, and yet, when I sang that theme song, you immediately knew what I was talking about, right? After iCarly, something <laughs> happened. <laughs> because iCarly has easily, well not easily, but perhaps like one of the greatest Nickelodeon theme songs ever. And then after that, like 
like stuff just started going downhill and Sam and Cat is maybe one of the lowest points in my opinion. A little bit earlier in this video, I did like a fake little pseudo credit sequence for the Gibby pilot and I actually hired a guy to go ahead and like make a fake sitcom outro riff for that sequence and I really wanted it to sound authentic so I was trying to explain to him like you need to make it sound like a back house mic song and he had no idea what that meant. He was like I don't know who that is and so I was trying to explain to him like like who backhouse mike is and what his vibe is and i said to him imagine the worst randy newman song you've ever heard on a really bumpy road and then after i went through all that i actually sat down and watched the salmon cat pilot for the first time and i heard the salmon cat theme song and i was like Shit, I nailed it, because that's exactly what the Sam and Cat theme song is. Look, I, I know that there's gonna be people watching this video who have nostalgia for this show, probably have nostalgia, you know, for every aspect of it. This is one of the worst songs I've ever heard in my entire life. So much of this show literally feels like it was rushed together at the last minute. I mean, down to that theme song, which to me sounds like it was done as a favor, like over a weekend, like they had 48 hours to make a sitcom theme song and that's what they came up with and they had to stick with it. That's what everything in this show feels like to me. This segment has been all over the place at this stage, basically just a bunch of mini rants, but here's something that I wanted to address at this point in time. If Sam and Cat is a spinoff of two shows, what does it fundamentally pull from each of the two shows? To me, it certainly seems like Sam and Cat is leaning a little more towards the victorious side of the universe at this point in time. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the pitch of this show is basically, what does Cat from Victorious get up to when she's not at Hollywood Arts. And based on what I've read online, it's going to become a lot more common for us to see settings from the California side of the universe rather than the Seattle side, because... Duh. However, one interesting detail which did not carry over is that Victorious is, obviously, a musical show, and Sam and Cat isn't. Which is incredibly ironic for us, because I spent so much of the Victorious review bitching that Kat didn't get the spotlight, that Ariana wasn't allowed to sing, and now she has the spotlight, she has creative control, and Ariana basically decided that she didn't want to sing on this show. We didn't want to sing on the show. We had the option. I think we just wanted to do like a TV show because I feel like since Hannah Montana, it's been so cool for kid shows to be musically driven. I don't think there's a show for kids out there now that doesn't have music. On the iCarly side of things, it seems to me the biggest thing that show contributes is the meta, which terrifies me. For those of you who never watched my two videos on iCarly, one of my biggest hot takes and takeaways about that show is that iCarly was one of the greatest live action Nickelodeon shows to ever exist when it was about something. When it had a pitch and a plot and a storyline, it was one of the greats. But as soon as iCarly became a metaphor for its own success, it became borderline unwatchable. Characters lost motivation, fourth wall jokes became constant and unbearable, and huge chunks of the lore simply vanished into thin air because they didn't serve any purpose in the show's own self-flagellation. Sam and Cat is going to inherit a lot of this energy because their babysitting service is going to end up being called, get this, Sam and Cat, so expect a lot of like edgy meta jokes where like, whoa, they're describing the plot, but also the show, so challenging. Sam and Cat also inherits the episode title gimmick from iCarly. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, on iCarly, every single episode title begins with I something, you know, uh, I go to Japan, I stage an intervention, I pie, I kiss, etc. 
Well, with Sam and Cat, every episode is a hashtag. This episode was hashtag pilot. The next episode is hashtag favorite show. And the one after that is hashtag the Brit Brats. This was a pretty clear attempt to use social media to the show's advantage. You name an episode title hashtag something, that ends up trending on Twitter. People look at that hashtag on the trending tab and they're like, hey, what's that about? They click on it and then they're like, oh, iCarly is a spinoff. I didn't know that. But it reads as particularly hollow because this show really doesn't have anything to do with social media as a storyline, so it literally only exists that way to get the word out on Twitter. The reason I'm stopping to say all of this is that it's very clear that Sam and Cat is trying extremely hard to be an authentic continuation of both of these shows. And so that is exactly how I am going to treat it. In my iCarly videos, I kept a dedicated list of all of the crimes committed by the main characters in that show. And it is now my prerogative that I am going to continue that tally as if this is iCarly Season 7. Now, controversially, that means I'm going to consider every main character in this show to be an iCarly character as long as they're on this specific show. So Cat is not retroactively an iCarly character. We're not going to go back and add the three people she killed in Victorious to this list. And Goomer, who was introduced in this show, will not have his Crimes Against Humanity from Henry Danger added to the list because those two characters are only iCarly characters when they are in Sam and Cat and no other shows. This is a contained environment where, for a brief time, every single character on this show is both an iCarly character and a Victorious character at the exact same time. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, to stay consistent with the branding of this show, we are going to stop calling these iCrimes and start calling them hashtag crimes. And then when we do the iCarly reboot, we're going to switch back to iCrime. So this is hashtag crime number 71. That looks more confusing than I thought it would. Whatever. Hashtag crime number 71 is blackmailing the limo driver into getting free service by threatening false assault. Hashtag crime number 72 is obviously child endangerment. We're gonna be covering this one a lot in this video. Sticking a baby into a motorized vehicle's metal basket and then allowing two other children to drive that around LA without supervision is not good. Also, they stole the motorist vehicle, so at some point, some crime happened here. I don't know why, but I thought that maybe Sam and Cat would end up being good babysitters, and that's like the twist of the pilot. That's why they decide to do it, because they're enthusiastic for the, for the craft, for their passion. But no, they're gonna kill one of these kids someday. I was gonna throw in Sam doing tattoo work without registering properly, but then I was like, they built a nuke once on iCarly. Let's not kick this back off with small potatoes. Also, I realized while working on this bit that the Inside Out Burger set is very clearly the Asphalt Cafe, and that makes me a little bit sad. I think I've decided I'm gonna throw in the hashtag crimes analysis whenever they come up in the episodes, because saving this stuff for the end of the season becomes a little bit messy when no one can really agree when the seasons stop and start when it comes to Sam and Cat. In fact, you know what, let's just stop here for a moment and discuss a little bit of the confusion and the chaos, and then we can finally get into episode two. Okay, so as we've established, Sam and Cat's hashtag pilot was pitched to Nickelodeon in very late 2012, and they immediately approved it and greenlit the show for one season of 20 episodes, meaning that they now had 19 episodes left to make in order to finish season one. It was the will of the showrunners that the show would premiere in spring 2013, directly after the Kids' Choice Awards. However, Nickelodeon ultimately rejected this, and this makes sense when you consider the politics of the time. That year, Victorious won the award for Favorite TV Show, and during the acceptance speech, it was casually mentioned that Victorious would not be coming back for another season. For many kids in the audience, that was how they found out that Victorious was cancelled. So to then follow that award ceremony up with a show that many people presumed was the reason Victorious was cancelled, it would have just been bad for branding. 
Finally, in June 2013, Hashtag Pilot was broadcast to the masses. Now, according to my research, according to a couple articles I read, they pushed this pilot back so far that by the time it actually went to air, they were done with that season order. So those 20 episodes they were supposed to have finished, they had stopped filming because they completed the season order. The Salmon Cat pilot was immediately recognized as a massive success, as it pulled in more than 4 million viewers. Now I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to keep in mind, that was the highest rated Nickelodeon show premiere in three years, basically since Victorious. Because if you didn't know this, Victorious pulled in 5.7 million viewers, in its first episode, and no other Nickelodeon show has accomplished that since then. So 4.4, three years later, was really, really good for Nickelodeon at the time. And so within just a few weeks of Hashtag Pilot making it to air, it was formally announced that Sam and Cat's season order would be doubled, and that 20 more episodes would be immediately greenlit, meaning that Sam and Cat's first season order would be a total of 40 episodes. And so, on September the 26th, 2013, the cast and crew got back together to finish those 20 episodes, and presumably to prepare for a third batch of episodes to get the show across the 60 episode minimum that the network typically strived for. This would not come to pass. Because Sam and Cat has only 35 episodes. 35 too many, if you ask me. Now, obviously, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here, but I just wanted to set all this up because with Sam and Cat, it is very important that you're keeping in mind not only a timeline of broadcast, but also a timeline of production because eventually everything is going to fall apart. By the way, this is my Sam and Cat set. I thought I'd introduce it. I think this is the first time I've shown it in the video. Um, I know all my sets kind of look the same probably, but I try and have some fun, be creative with them. Specifically this part, I, I was trying really hard to make this part cool. So what we have here is we have the iCarly, the iCarly playset facing out. And on the left side, we have, we have the Sam toy from the iCarly playsets. And on the right side, we have Cat Valentine from those victorious Barbie dolls. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're looking over at this and you're thinking to yourselves, Quinn, those two things don't go together. Correct. Do you know what's funny? Like, like, do you know what's really, really funny? The whole time I've been working on this miniseries, like, the whole time, people have been saying to me, like, well, look on the bright side. Sam and Cat is just one season. There's, there can't be that much to say about the show. So you're going to work hard on all these other videos, and then you're going to get to Sam and Cat, and it's going to be, like, two hours long, because how could anyone find anything to say about this show? And now we're, what, like an hour 15, hour 20 into this video? And how many episodes of the show have I reviewed? One. <laughs> it's pretty funny, right? So uh, let's try and correct that a little bit. Let's try and, uh, you know, balance out the scales. Uh, this is hashtag favorite show, originally aired on June the 15th, 2013. So at the start of episode 2, Sam is sleeping on the pull-out couch in the living room, and Cat wakes her up with a scream, causing Sam to react with violence. Sam asks how many times she's told Cat not to wake her up like that, and Cat says they've been living together for two days, so... Twice. Sam's alarm goes off as it turns to 7 a.m., and she comments that Cat should probably be running to school on her stupid pink bike. But Cat says she still has some time. I presume that Hollywood Arts starts their classes at 9 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. because, logistically speaking here, Sam and Cat live in Venice, California. Hollywood Arts is on Sunset Boulevard. That's an hour long bike ride on a good day? At some point, that's just not worth it anymore. Like, just go to a different school. Besides, as Cat explains, she wants to spend the morning watching her favorite TV show. A 
sitcom called That's a Drag. Sam notes that this is one of her favorite shows as well, and they cautiously agree to watch it together. When Sam turns the TV on, we catch a few Easter eggs for just a few frames. Up at the top, you can see the Dingo channel from iCarly, then Drake and Josh and Zoe 101 airing on apparently competing networks, and finally D Versatismo from the Victorious finale. And yep, uh, that's all the easter eggs. Shockingly, one thing missing here is That's a Drag itself, but Sam somehow finds it anyways and turns to that channel. Here we find out that the sitcom is about a household of characters who, you guessed it, dress in drag. The boys wear dresses and the girls wear suits, that's the joke. Sam points out that the showrunners legally aren't allowed to use pear products in their shows, so they instead show a laptop with a banana. <gasps> That's so clever! After this, a man from the apartment complex stops by, saying that he's looking for a babysitter for his kids after school that day, and the girls accept. Hope he doesn't mind waiting so Kat can finish her hour-long commute home! We find out that Sam is also attempting to finish her high school career, because this show is a tiny bit more time loopy than I anticipated, and that she's taking classes online. However, she bails on schoolwork to go back to binging That's a Drag all day. After the ever-disorienting opening titles, we cut to Sam passing the time by turning two rib bones into nunchucks. Kat comes in crying and reveals some terrible news. That's a drag has been cancelled. Why? The show's a big hit! It's insane! They're not even gonna do a big final episode! What? Do you see what I mean when I say that late stage iCarly meta is super annoying? This is episode two of Sam and Cat. Episode two! And it's already a self-referential in-universe parody somehow. Like, yeah, the joke is that this episode is a parody of how Victorious was cancelled without a finale. Okay. But you haven't even sold me on the pitch yet. I don't get why this show exists. Like, what's your angle? Why do they run a babysitting service if the kids in the storylines always get sidelined? And just imagine for a moment all of the early 2010s Nickelodeon kids at home who were obsessed with Victorious and were heartbroken that it had ended tuning into Sam and Cat to give it a chance, and it's like a high-concept pastiche making fun of them for missing their favorite show. It's like really weird, right? Oh, and the two kids they're supposed to be babysitting are dropped off during this sequence. Did you hear they canceled that to drag? Yes! <laughs> Sam and Cat find the name of the producer who runs the show and the address where it's being filmed, and oh my god, That's a Drag has a better logo than Sam and Cat. That's sad. Anyways, they take the two kids in with them so they can go and harass the showrunner. The showrunner explains that he doesn't control if the show is cancelled or not, and then bails to go play tennis while one of the kids, Bob, gets stuck in a light fixture somehow. Cat vamps a minute of material out of trying to stop the showrunner, jumping on his car to try and stop him from leaving. Sam can't figure out how to get Bob down from the light, so she cuts the light down with an axe. <laughs> Bob is dead. Sam and Cat should not have a babysitting service. The only reason Bob is alive is because this is a fucking Looney Tunes universe now. Cat shows up to the apartment hours later than everyone else, revealing that she managed to stay on the producer's car for 17 miles, before she finally fell off thanks to a speed bump in Santa Monica. Cat is still broken up about losing the show, but Sam comes up with a special way to cheer her up, and recruits Dice to help her out. Sam wants to steal some random random prop from the show, so Cat has some way to remember it. Dice says that this is sweet, and Sam threatens him with violence over this. The plan goes awry and Dice is nearly caught, but Sam acts like she's in charge and convinces all of the people on set to let Dice go and send all of the props from That's a Drag to her apartment instead of the storage warehouse that's supposed to go to. Meanwhile, Cat unloads the two kids at the retirement home, and then apparently forgets about them and goes home. Cat comes home and discovers that her living room is decked out with the furniture of her favorite show. Cat says that Sam is sweet, and Sam decides to allow it, apparently not minding as much when it's coming from Cat. Gay! Nona barges in, drops the kids off, says something feels off about her living room, and leaves. And then we learn that Bob has become addicted to cheap thrills. Can I jump off the roof? 
Yes. yes! Hey, where in the hell is the dad of these kids? Like, they get dropped off at 4 p.m., then all four of them go to a soundstage in West Hollywood. I guess they Uber there because Sam has a motorcycle and Kat has a bicycle, so I don't know how they got four people there at the same time otherwise. Venice Beach to West Hollywood is easily a 30-minute drive. They all go there, spend a bunch of time at the soundstage, and then Sam and the kids go home. Meanwhile, Kat stays on a moving car for 17 miles. That's an hour-long drive, by the way. Then she has to walk from Santa Monica to Venice Beach, which also takes an hour. At this point, it's like 7 p.m. Then Sam goes back to West Hollywood, coordinates a massive drop-off of tons of furniture and props in Venice, then coordinates all of Nona's furniture being delivered to the storage facility in West Hollywood where all the props were supposed to go. Then Sam has to set up the entire living room by the time Kat gets home. At this point, it's like, what? 2 a.m.? Where did that guy go? Costa Rica? Also, I know I said earlier I was gonna count crimes as they happen, but I found out it's just too distracting to do that joke every time they go into a building without permission, so I'm gonna try and compile those every 10 episodes or so. For now, let's move on. At the start of episode 3, Cat comes home from school and falls, causing a commotion. When she gets inside, we learn that Sam is working on her own schoolwork. Her assignment is to prove to her online school that she has done 4 hours of community service, which, okay, that's weird. Sam attempts to upload photos of her feeding homeless animals, but it's all very clearly photoshopped. Or actually, gimp-shopped. I know gimp when I see it, and that's gimp. After Kat notes that there is a dinosaur in one of Sam's photos, the blonde teen admits she needs some other plan to do community service. Just as she sees that Kat has brought home a British fruit called a Plum Diggles. Baby girl, that's a dragon fruit. We have those in the real world. Kat explains that they're going to be babysitting two British children, so she wants to be prepared. Sam attempts to help out by bringing up another British food stuff, Bibble. It's, it's sort of like a candy popcorn that like- I know what it is! Sam says they could go to the Bibble store down the street, and Kat protests that some people are banned from ever going back there. Yeah, so British kids come in and act very formal in front of the titular teens before their uncle heads off. Cheers! Seinfeld friends! Now, these two are played by Sophia Grace Brownlee and Rosie McClelland. These two are cousins in real life and were apparently an internet sensation in the early 2010s, doing music covers, appearing on TV shows, they were on Ellen, which was cool back then. I'm saying apparently because I'm led to believe that these two are much more recognizable if you're, like, younger than me by quite a bit, I have no idea who these people are. Kat's Nona texts her from the elderly home and says she needs help setting up a bingo game. Sam jumps at the opportunity, saying this is the perfect chance for her to get her community service in. There's the open again, gives me a migraine every time! At the elderly center, we find out that Nona is setting up a bingo game, but that no one else wants to play. And she says that she won't sign Sam's community service form until she actually does community service and helps her out. So Sam and Nona have to convince everyone to play Bingo. At the apartment, Kat is bored because the two British kids are extremely well behaved, but she gets some relief when Dice comes in for his daily attempt to sell something stupid to her. This time, it's the Spife. Half spoon, half knife. You wanna buy one? Yes, yes, just shut up and take my money! Man, isn't this the most riveting thing you've ever seen in your entire life? A plot, bingo, B plot. British children. C plot. Dice has a fucking spoon. Dice notices one of the girls has a Pairphone 6, which is state of the art and not even out in America yet. Wow, this episode is old. The girls explain that their dad works for the pair company, so they get their phones for free with early access. He begs them to sell him $500 worth of phones, saying he'll be able to flip them at a steep profit. Dice does the exchange, but after the girls are gone, he discovers that the box is filled with rocks. He's been bamboozled, Charlie Brown style, and is out $500. Wow, they really changed the design. In the A-plot, Sam's bingo game is too loud and is hip-hop themed, and the old people do not like it. All while Dice tries to channel his best Josh Peck. 
and they sold me rocks! Rocks! Sam gets home and laughs at Dice's pain, saying he fell for the oldest trick in the book, before announcing that she's going to take a frying pan and bash some heads until she gets the money back. Babysitter of the year. But Kat says that Sam shouldn't murder children, so they have to think of a new plan. Kat goes on her own to get the money back, trying to just be polite, but is distracted by one of the children eating Bibble. Is she eating... Bibble? Alright, normal show. Kat barges back into the apartment and announces that she has Bibble, as she screams and runs around. She says that she paid for the Bibble with all of Dice's money and her bike. But at least she has the British popcorn and da 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 da, it's all ear cleaners. Sorry, I guess the politically correct term is cotton swabs. Kat goes back to get her Bibble and is sprayed with a water hose. How late is it right now? Does Dice have parents? Is he an Aladdin-style huckster of circumstance? Sam says the only way they can get the Brit Bats back is to out-Brit the Brit Brats with a brilliant Bunko Battle Strat. So they wait for the girls to walk by their apartment and then loudly announce that the bingo game at Elderly Acres is rigged, and whoever gets card number 54 will win a brand new flat screen TV worth three grand. The next day, the kids come skipping in and announce that they're going to win. Kat then attempts to buy card number 54 for $5 before the girls outbid her by asking for $500. The girls do win the TV, which means Sam did rig the game somehow, but the police bust in. They say it's illegal to hold a bingo game with a price worth over three grand without authority, so they're shutting everything down. The girls begin crying and one of the cops takes them out to a back alley. He then returns and announces that the British girls are gone. Everyone celebrates, cheering at the idea of two nine-year-olds olds left out in the freezing cold by a dumpster. Cat gets her bike back, Dice gets his money back, Dice gives all the elderly spifes, and the credits roll on the two children, terrified and alone as a fire in the background grows ever stronger. This one is weird. Season 1 episode 4 opens with Sam doing a series of prank calls with kids she's supposed to be babysitting. They scream into the phone, startling Cat, who passes out. Oh no! When they finally wake Kat back up, she says that she's prone to passing out when under stress, something very consistent with the continuity of this character. The next morning, Sam makes a smoothie with two slices of pizza and root beer. Okay. Dice comes in and he has a goat. Okay. That's right, it's the goat episode. Prepare for goat hijinks. In a flashback, we learn that Dice paid a shady guy in an alley for a coat and was given a goat before the man ran off. The rushed production of these episodes is evident when you notice that the shady alley from this episode and the shady alley from the last episode are very clearly the same place. Dice begs Sam to babysit his goat while he's at school and Sam agrees. Pay off to a segment in my last video in three, two, one. Come in. Large. Ladies, gentlemen, and NBs, may I proudly introduce Goomer. Nah, nah, this is Goomer. I'm Goomer. Goomer is an MMA fighter in the SoCal area who Dice has become the official manager of. And you know what? I wasn't sold the first time I saw this character, but Goomer is a breath of fresh air to this stale-ass show. There's a reason that this is the only thing that carried over when Sam and Cat ended. Although I do think he tends to be a little bit more fun in these early episodes, because he's not too much of a cartoon character at this point, but he still gets all the funny lines. Oh yeah, you gotta feed the goat. I'll feed the goat. Look at that dog! Later in the day, Sam is visited by none other than Ben Shapiro. Ben tells Sam that she's not allowed to have animals in the apartment complex. She mocks his stupid attire and flowing cape and eventually gets fed up with him, as she rips his clothes off, putting his shirt around his legs and his pants around his neck. She throws him out and says that she'll keep the cape for his sake. I know you're probably wondering why this kid is out and about while Dice and Cat are at school, uh, but that plot hole doesn't bother bother me because I'm actually convinced this is Ben Shapiro. Later at the gym, we see that Goomer is in fact a very skilled fighter, but Kat breaks up his sparring because she says that fighting is never the answer. We find out here that the little kid Sam bullied earlier is Dilbin, the son of the owner of the building that they all live in. If you haven't noticed this yet, there's the slightest chance that you might actually recognize Dilbin from somewhere else because this actor was actually one of the four kids in the original Gibby pilot. Later on, Dilbin stops by the apartment and Kat tries to make things right. Hi Dilbin, come in, would you like a muffin? 
I spit on your muffins. Hey, at least you didn't lick them. Man, if I made this video seven years ago, that would be such a topical riff. Dilbin learns that Nona has moved to Elderly Acres, meaning that there is no legal adult staying with Sam and Cat. This is actually like a normal thing to point out. This is bad, right? Like, if this happened in real life, you'd be worried, right? He says that with the goat and the two of them being underage, he now has two reasons to kick them out of the apartment complex. Then Sam does that thing again where she strips all of his clothes off, puts them on wrong, and throws him outside. They go back to Elderly Acres and convince Nona to pretend to be moving back in whenever the owner comes around. That way they won't get kicked out. However, a maintenance man falls from the ceiling and Nona is out of commission for the night. Which means they have to find a legal adult to to pretend to be staying with them so they won't be thrown out. And their first pick is, of course, Goomer. So they run the whole plan by the Goomster. He will pretend to be their uncle while Dice stays in the back and hides the goat in the shower. However, the goat sneezes in Dice's face and he becomes increasingly disgusted by it. Goomer constantly refers to his uncle Fudge, who he says he wants to play for the evening. Dilbin shows up with his father and the girls say they've sold the goat and that their uncle Fudge is now living with them. Dilbin's dad asks for Goomer's ID just as the goat runs out. Dilbin's father calls them on their bluff, but at that exact moment, Dilbin's bluff is also called as his real father rushes into the room looking for him. We find out Dilbin's other father is a paid actor who sprints out of the room. We're told that Dilbin's father doesn't actually own the building. This is a lie he tells people because he's embarrassed of his father's real job, which is, brace yourselves, a feet thing. I sell wide shoes to wide-footed women. Oh no! Yeah. Dilbin says it's not easy being unlikable and having a father that sells wide shoes to wide-footed women, and his father says it isn't easy having a son that likes wearing capes. Sam realizes neither of these people hold power in their lives, and she completes the rule of three. I've noticed this trend so far that many of these episodes feel not like finished drafts of a piece of media, but more like the raw, unfiltered potential of many, many ideas blindly being jotted down like an empty train of thought. This episode is called Hashtag New Go but when you break down the basic storyline, the goat doesn't do anything. It's barely even a runner, let alone a B-plot. I'm pissed off, I was promised goat antics. Goomer is the best part, but he just kind of stands around and says funny stuff. Like, why do we go to the gym to watch him fight? That doesn't go anywhere. And why is there like a pre-title sequence of Cat carefully setting up the fact that she faints when she's in fear? It comes across as lore we're supposed to know, like there's going to be payoff at the end of the episode, but it doesn't serve any purpose in what is presented to us. Here's my take. Remember when I said that the theme song to this show feels like it was made in one weekend without a second draft? Well, that's also how I've started to feel about the entire show. Sam and Cat was so rushed into production, and it has so many episodes that I truly think most of these did not have the privilege of a second draft. And you can really tell when you watch the show, especially compared to what came before. And for all the years that NSU shows have made fun of their Disney Channel counterparts, this extended franchise has now officially become identical to shows on Disney but worse. Because at least Disney Channel shows, as cheesy and boring as they can be, have some sense to have basic stability. They don't have revolving door supporting cast, for instance, and they don't get caught in this centrifugal loop where every other episode feels like a brand new pilot episode for a completely different take on the show. Anyways, best episode so far, let's move on. Season 1 episode 5 starts with Sam and Cat babysitting a kid whose mother is asking him to text her everything that people say around her. Cat celebrates how exciting she finds this before they end up asking why he's doing this. He explains that there's a texting competition coming up and his mother wants him to practice. We find out that Sam is a fast texter herself and that the competition has a prize, a speedboat, meaning that Cat insists upon Sam entering. I got the kid's mom comes by and she's like a soccer mom, but with texting. It is kind of a funny gag that the mom is the one who wants her kid on his phone texting all the time, but he just wants to be free to play basketball or whatever the trope usually is. Worth a light chuckle, I suppose. One of the jokes with this mom is that she keeps saying out loud that she has no life without her son and she's pushing him to be successful because it allows her to live vicariously through him. So again, it's like she's a pageant mom, but she says the quiet part out loud. Sam 
Cat and Dice go to the texting competition, but Dice sees an old friend he used to know in second grade, who he desperately is trying to avoid because he's always found him loud and annoying. Sam shouts for the kid to come over, and we find out one reason Dice hates this kid is that he has a tendency to repeat everything that is said to him, like an echo. This is, uh, a real medical thing? It's called echolalia. It is very common in children with autism and Tourette's. I won't show many clips, but like with Mandy from iCarly, I think this character is pretty clearly supposed to be neurodivergent coded, with the joke being that Dice finds him annoying because he isn't sociable in a traditional way. Here. The texting kid's mom finds out that Sam has entered the competition entirely to spite her, and we find out that the mom isn't interested in the speedboat, as her main priority is that the winner of this competition will also get to meet Joe Biden. Boy, I'm jealous. I'd like to meet Joe Biden. That motherfucker owes me money. So everyone competes in this texting thing, but the kid and Sam end up at the top. We find out the cat thinks Sam's last name is Puckle, because that's how it's written down in her phone. Sam corrects her, but Kat refuses to change it or her understanding of Sam's last name. As I said, the kid and Sam are the semi-finalists, so they will have another competition later in the day. Kat and Sam get some corn dogs and take a power nap, during which time the diva mom glues Sam's hand to Kat's foot. The judge says Sam will need to have her hand loose to compete, but Sam says there's no rule in texting that you can't text one-handed, and the competition goes on. On. The little kid thinks everything here is unfair, so he drops the phone on purpose, giving it all to Sam. They win the speedboat, but it's really tiny, and Cat quotes a movie. What is this? A speedboat for ants? They keep playing with their speedboat in their living room, and Joe Biden keeps calling Ariana Grande, but she doesn't want to talk to him, so she continuously hangs up. During the credits scene in the bonus feature, Jerry Trainer, yes, the actor, not the character he plays, also calls the girls, and they hang up on him as well. At the start of episode 6, Sam is struggling to fall asleep, as she discovers that couches built for gender-challenging sitcoms aren't always the best thing to sleep on. However, very suddenly, Suddenly, a dog opens the door and walks in. Sam thinks this is Cat because she is stupid now. The dog's owner runs in and apologizes, and Sam indicates that this has happened before and she's tired of it. They both run off. Sam comes into Cat's room and pours her out of the bed, settling in herself. The two get into a fight over why Cat gets a big room and Sam doesn't, and Sam confuses Cat enough to get her to sleep on the couch for the night. After the opening sequence, Sam, Cat, and some kid are performing with a rap themed karaoke machine. Thank the lord the copyright stops me from showing you much of this, it's really embarrassing. As the kid leaves, he says, quote, You are the best babysitter ever. The girls naturally get into a fight over which of them he was talking to. Who is the superior sitter of babies? Eventually, they come up with an idea. They'll be babysitting three kids the next day, so when their shift is over, they'll ask the kids which babysitter they like more. To make things interesting, Sam also wagers a bet. Whoever wins this challenge gets to have the master bedroom. Kat says, it's on, Puckle, and Sam once again corrects her. This is a totally random thought, completely off the cuff. Do you think Sam and Kat pay taxes? Like, do you think Sam gets on TurboTax and reports all their income? Or do you think that, like, them always being paid in cash is sort of part of the scheme to make thousands of dollars a week without reporting any of it to the IRS? When you work freelance for seven years, this is the kind of shit you catch yourself thinking about. So the kids come over and Sam and Cat compete for their affection. Cat makes everyone cookie necklaces, surely a throwback to the canon of the victorious Flash games, and Sam gets a massive fireworks machine, which she sets to launch as the sky fills with fireworks. Fireworks are heavily illegal in Southern California, especially in Venice. Remember this, I'll bitch about it later. Cat desperately wants to beat Sam, so she asks Dice for an idea, and he suggests taking the kids out to the new restaurant on the beach, known only as Bots. Bots, we learn, is a restaurant where the human staff has been replaced by automation. Literally, as the servers are robots. This is handled with little gravitas, but it's actually a very transformative moment in this universe, because from this point forwards, it will be a consistent motif that robots are an accepted facet of upper-class society. I'm going to go ahead and get back out that list as I write down robots in the present. As I do this, you'll note a very interesting detail, because we have now written down future robot apocalypse and robots in present day 
basically right next to each other? This would certainly seem to imply that the events we're seeing play out in front of us are the same events which will eventually lead to the certain destruction of the planet Earth. Cat runs in late having come to the restaurant on foot while everyone else rode on Sam's motorcycle. And Sam and her get into a wacky argument over if they're playing fair in the competition. They eventually get back to the apartment where Cat has convinced Dice to bring over a giant cannon for the kids to play with, while Sam has hired a Justin Bieber impersonator. Swag. 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 However, Dice's cannon shoots a turkey into Bieber's face, knocking him out cold. I was never here! As the kids are picked up, they're asked who their favorite babysitter is, and while the older girl picks Sam and the older boy picks Cat, the little girl, who has been nonverbal all episode, says she shouldn't have to choose. Sam and Cat are great on their own, but together, they are truly something special. Sure, kid, whatever you say. So Sam and Cat ultimately split the room in half, with half reflecting Sam's personality and half reflecting Cat's. There's a lot of wild Easter eggs in this room, but I think my favorite is that Cat has a framed photograph of Dick Cheney, which is a reference to a throwaway line in one of the final episodes of Victorious? You wanna know my favorite vice president of all time? Easy, Dick Cheney. But now, that's not throwaway, because it's been solidified as one of the defining aspects of Cat's personality. Cat loves Dick Cheney, and in fact, apparently values him more than her theater teacher because Cheney is one rung higher on her wall than her photo of Psychowitz. Insane shit. Cat asks Sam about the urinal pinned to her wall, and as she turns the light off, she asks if they can use it. Sam mumbles that it'd be hard, but not impossible, teasing many piss-related adventures to come. So at this point, six episodes in, I think the show is officially done setting stuff up. We've seen how Sam and Cat met, how they came to run a babysitting service together, we've met Dice, we've met Goomer, and we've seen how they came to have their iconic bedroom. So with all of the basic building blocks in place, let's continue forwards as we see the next exciting adventure that Sam and Cat get up to. I miss Tori. So at the start of episode 7, we learn that things are not going swimmingly at the babysitting service. Sam and Cat have booked five kids in one night, all of whom are up to their own loud, unique, mischievous behavior. With one breaking glasses, another revving up Sam's motorcycle, and yet another shooting lasers out of a remote-controlled helicopter. Cat eventually feels overstimulated and goes to hide in their bedroom, where Sam eventually finds her. I'm too frazzled to babysit anymore tonight. I just, I just can't. Sure you can. Cause I'll make you. They both agree that after today, they need a few days off because babysitting is starting to take a toll on them. In the moment, they decide to take a little breather as they wait for the kids to calm down. That is, before they hear two loud crashes and then an explosion as one of the kids walks in, clearly having just been blown up. After the title sequence, we open on Goomer training with Dice before Sam shows up with Cat. Dice has found some ultra rare Ukrainian hot sauce, which is supposed to be the hottest in the world. She puts some on a pizza and the hot sauce burns through the slice and the plate. That's not good. After this, we learn that Goomer is training to fight a boxer known as the Skull Crusher. Goomer apparently isn't aware that this is the boxer's nickname, because Dice believes that Goomer only has a shot at winning against the undefeated champion if he goes in with absolutely no fear. Later, as Sam and Cat are relaxing on their day off, Dice runs in and announces that he has a problem and needs a babysitter. They tell him to scram before he explains himself. His mom booked him a job as a hair model some years ago, and he's been secretly doing this for some time. He has a shoot out of town the morning of Goomer's big fight, so he needs someone to watch over him to make sure he takes his medicine and doesn't get into any trouble, and that sort of thing. I'm just so proud of his hair. Later, after an exposition shot of a location which is 1000% not on the pier, Sam and Cat have Goomer carry them down the stairs leading to bots, saying that it's good exercise. They sit at a table, and after he learns that the servers are robots, Goomer flips his lid. Get under the table! That was a robot, they bring your food here. 
because they probably killed all the people waiters. Goomer begins screaming and running around the restaurant while Sam orders appetizers. Goomer grabs a random child and runs off with her. Later, Goomer runs in after having a nightmare and adds that he needs his medicine. Cat administers the droplets to his eyes before he starts screaming and runs off. We learn that Goomer's drugs are supposed to be applied on his tongue, meaning that Cat has placed dangerous chemicals into his eyes for no reason. What is that? The next morning, we learn that Goomer is nearly completely blind from the incident. Cat reads on the instructions that the cure involves lightly washing the eyeballs out with milk, and so Sam waterboards Goomer. Dice comes running in with very big hair, saying that Goomer can't drink milk, presumably meaning he's lactose intolerant. And he finds out that Goomer has to fight blind. Continuity point, in this episode it's said that Goomer is a member of the CFC, which is the MMA company we see in I Fight Shelby Marks, although it's not the MMA company that we see in I Look Alike. In the fight, Goomer is totally directionless, causing him to accidentally punch the referee out. During the second round, Goomer is hit in the balls and Dice yells that this is a cheap shot. The Skull Crusher taunts Dice, calling his hair big and stupid. Goomer, beginning to regain his sight, stands up for his friend. But you will not make fun of my little friend's beautiful, beautiful hair. Goomer is literally the heart of this show. If you take him out, there is nothing but corporate synergy and cynicism mixed together with the fine texture of corn syrup. Anyways, Goomer beats this guy's ass and wins. He insists upon a rematch, pushing Sam out of the way in the process, and she beats his ass too. Good episode. Season 1 episode 8 is called Hashtag Toddler Climbing, and we start out with Sam and Cat once again babysitting Murph the Goat, who is apparently still around. Sam has melted the face of one of Cat's toys because she is a shitty friend who is allergic to character development. Also, Sam put Cat's bra in the freezer. Okay. Now it's a bra. Sam and Cat are anticipating a new kid that they are supposed to babysit, but when the mother swings by, she says that she's canceling because she found some negative reviews online for their service. I can't imagine why. It's not like the company is run out of an apartment by two unsupervised teenagers who independently have a history of violence and murder, and together have repeatedly injured children either by a lack of proper attention given, or their insistence to drag children along to their completely unrelated adventures fueled by their own obsessive ego complexes. I can't imagine what parent with a formerly not blown up and formerly not dropped from 30 feet child would ever have such disrespect as to leave a negative score for them on fucking Yelp. So they look up reviews online, at which point we find out that their company is named Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service, which is good to know. There they find out they have a bunch of negative reviews, all of which are fake, but honestly sound like real episodes of the show. After Sam and Cat get into a fight over Sam eating too much, Cat, Dice, and Nona go out to bots together. Nona complains that things were better when Eisenhower was in office, being very disapproving of the robots. Humans will die, and robots will rule the Earth. <laughs> Enjoy your meal! Eventually, Sam runs in and announces that she called her friend Freddy in Seattle to have him look into the reviews, and he found that they all came from the same IP address. Why would somebody go on Snort and talk smack about our babysitting service? Oh, pee, poo, smack. It's like Lenny Bruce all over again. No, no. Nobody gets your references! According to Freddy, the IP address in question can be linked to another babysitting service less than a mile from their own. They go to the address where they find three Jersey boys who admit to doing the bad deed. The boys have a mysterious locked door, which they insist the girls stay away from, and one boy says the girls should leave while they can walk. In response to this, Sam tells the boys that when they get to the hospital, the doctors will want to know what they were beat with, and they can say that they were beat with a sock filled with butter. However, Kat says they can't fight in front of the baby that the boys are watching, and the girls agree to leave. But after the boys make a sarcastic comment, Sam still breaks their shit. They want to have a spy on the inside, so they have Dice pretend to be the baby that needs babysat. Dice wears a camera on his hat to be a spy, and after some teenagers come over with a baby, Dice has a hissy fit saying that he wants to see what's behind the closed door. He's allowed past the door, which is the entrance to a basement, where we find out the twist. Baby Fight Club. 
That's basically the bit. It's like cockfighting, but with babies, but they couldn't get away with that. So instead, it's like two babies are doing rock climbing to the ceiling, and whoever gets there first is the winner. And yeah, I guess this is equally unsafe as a baby fight club, but uh, it, it would have been way funnier if they just got away with that. The effect here is also probably really convincing if you're five years old, which is the target demographic of Sam and Cat. Sam and Cat break into the house and physically threaten everyone there, saying they'll show footage of the baby fight club to the the police unless they delete their fake reviews and get out of babysitting. What a happy ending! That fucking goat still didn't do anything! Season 1 episode 9 is an extremely important milestone for us, as it's an example of a rare phenomena I like to call a Ted Danson episode. So there's this sitcom, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Frasier. Now Frasier the character started out in Cheers as a romantic rival to Sam Malone in the Sam Diane story arc, but he was so popular that he remained a bar regular even after Diane left. There the character went through many tribulations, falling in love, having a son, having his wife abandon him and their child for another man before he nearly commits suicide, with the only thing stopping him being the thought of his child. So when Cheers ended, it seemed viewers at home didn't want the character's story to end there, and so he received his own spin-off, Frasier. In Frasier, the character has moved back to his hometown of Seattle, where he becomes a radio psychiatrist. Frasier has a poor relationship with his emotionally distant father, who he is tasked with taking care of. He hopes that the situation, as unfortunate as it is, will allow them to grow close in a way that they never had before. Also involved in the math here is Niles, his unhappily married younger brother, and his father's live-in physical therapist, Daphne. Niles and Daphne begin a tourid will-they-won't-they -they tango, each wanting the other, but rarely at the same time. The point I'm trying to make here is that you can easily watch Frasier without knowing it's a spin-off of Cheers, and you can easily have watched Cheers without knowing the story is continued in another show. So to bridge the gap between the two and to build up press, the writers would sometimes do what I have taken to call Ted Danson episodes. Oh hey look, it's a person from Cheers who you haven't seen in a good number of years. They're visiting Seattle and are gonna stop by to see Frasier, and now you'll be able to see what they've been up to. With the exception of Lilith and Frederick episodes, these stories are rarely the favorites of the viewers or writers. No one thinks the best episode of Frasier is the one where Woody Harrelson shows up. But contextually, these episodes serve an important role for a particular niche audience. People who aren't watching. You're someone who watched this old sitcom in your developmental years, and you don't really watch a lot of TV like that anymore, but suddenly you hear, Hey, Ted Danson's gonna be on Frasier. I might watch that. Then during the episode, you catch yourself thinking, Hey, this Frasier show is alright. And then you watch it every week until you die. Anyways, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Sam and Cat is a little less independent in this metaphor than Frasier, but it still exercised some of the same gimmicks to get people watching. And as far as I know, there are four special event Ted Danson episodes in the show's run. Season 1, Episode 9 is the first. At the start of the episode, Sam and Cat are babysitting two kids, whom they start a game of hide-and-seek with. As the kids scamper off, Sam reveals that she isn't going to look for them, and this was mainly just her plan to get them out of her hair. Just as she relaxes on the couch, Dice runs in and announces that he has a problem. Goomer's mom is going to be visiting LA, and we find out that Mama Goom doesn't like fighting, and has no idea that her son is an MMA fighter. Dice fears that if she finds out, she'll force him to move back to Louisiana to work in a crawdad factory. And if he does, Dice will be out of a lot of money. The girls suspect there's a more sentimental reason Dice doesn't want Goomer to move away, but they don't pry, and they promise to help out. After the heavily cut down opening sequence, the trio meet with Goomer and attempt to solve the issue. Goomer says he's always told his mother that he has a different job than his real one, and Sam reasons that all they need to do is fake Goomer doing whatever job that is. The job in question is that of a high school history teacher, you can probably guess where this is gonna go. Dice plans to meet his mother the next day at BOTS, and the girls suggest they go there and pretend to be his students. Dice sadly can't make it as he has to help his disgusting aunt, but Cat says that he can trust the incredible team of Valentine and Puckle. When Sam corrects her, Goomer adds that he always thought her name was Pickle. 
At bot, things get set into motion, and we find out, curiously, that Goomer's last name is Murr, with his first name being Gyu because his father was French. Goomer's mom shows up, and they play up a bit about how she doesn't look the way the audience anticipated. As Sam and Cat sit with their teacher, Mr. Murr, and his mother, we learn that she adopted him when he was a baby, with it being stated that he was actually her third pick, with the second being a literal dog. I bet I was a cute baby, huh? <laughs> I wish. Mrs. Murr asks Goomer what he's teaching in school that week, but he's stupid, so he passes it to Cat. Cat is also stupid, and she passes it to Sam. Sam is well documented to be a borderline dropout who is barely taking online classes, and together they give an answer that makes no sense. Mrs. Murr says she's very proud of her son, and asks one favor, that Sam and Cat send her a video of her son teaching, as it's something she's never had the chance to see. Cat interjects that since she's in town, she can just come watch him teach class in person, before she realizes what she's just said. Later in the apartment, Goomer cries over ice cream as he's sure he'll be forced to move back to Louisiana and work in a crawdad factory. They tell Sam to think of something, and she says that she has, as she has invented, peanut butter on a hot dog. Fifty bucks says this becomes some lame running joke somehow. Suddenly, Cat has an idea that can fix everything. All they have to do is find a teacher at high school that is willing to lend them their classroom for just long enough to make this work. Sam says this is a bust, as no teacher would allow them to do something like that. Cat responds, no sane teacher, before she begins laughing hysterically. We jump cut to Hollywood arts, where Erwin Sykowitz is teaching his theater class a new acting style called backwards acting, where the performers have to emote while facing a wall. This is a very quick gag, clearly done so that the rest of the Victorious characters are still present in the room, without it being revealed that they are all very clearly body doubles. If you look closely, you can actually see that Robbie is even holding Rex, so that must be a look-alike puppet as well. Sam, Cat, and Goomer barge in, and Psychowitz tells Cat that she's very late, as class is nearly over. The bell then rings, and Psychowitz dismisses everyone, and we hear Rex shout Back. in the background, as as Tori, Jade, Beck, Andre, Ravi, and Rex leave while off camera. This whole sequence is brilliant and is also a hilarious kind of purgatory for these characters, if you think about it for a moment. Because imagine what this literally and metaphorically means for their lives. These pompous bastards spent four seasons of their show slagging off the, quote, shruggers in the background of their school, who just stood around and reacted without the ability to actually talk and interact, and now they have become the Shruggers. Characters so irrelevant to the stories being told, so far off in the background that they don't even have faces. Sam says they need to borrow Psychowitz's classroom and that they're using it for charity, specifically the Salvation Goomers. Psychowitz asks what this charity does, and Sam says it helps teachers regrow hair. Psychowitz accepts these terms and scampers off. So they bring in Goomer and give him notes to teach a class, and they also bring in Dice, and Sam tries to dress him up like a teenager, complete with fake armpit hair. Then Cat shouts, Oh look, the Shruggers are here! Sam instructs the Shruggers to only react and not say anything or ask questions, clearly not understanding that at Hollywood Arts, Shruggers are literally incapable of doing those things. Are all his classes like this? <laughs> oh, you just gonna try? <laughs> Goomer tries to teach but struggles to even read the cards, and eventually Psychowitz bursts in and says that he looked the charity up and he couldn't find anything like that online. Goomer can't keep the lie up anymore and tells his mother that he's a mixed martial artist and that he's good at it. Mrs. Murr is enraged that not only he's a fighter, but also that he lied to her. And she retorts, When I adopted you, I should have kept the receipt. Goomer begins crying as Psychowitz shaves Dice's armpits. Too much too soon! Later, Sam, Cat, Dice, Goomer, and Goomer's mom all go to the only back alley in California, which is apparently just around the corner from Goomer's apartment. Mrs. Murr that she's going there to pat Goomer's things and take him back to Louisiana, where he will work in a crawdad factory. At that moment, the group is approached by three shady characters who try to rob Goomer's mom. Goomer whips all of their asses, beating the three of them up single-handedly. Goomer's mom decides that she's proud of her son and goes to fuck one of the cops that showed up to help them. Because at the end of the day, all important things in life are resolved not by compromise, but by horny... <laughs> being horny. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I know this episode wasn't the best Ted Danson episode to select as an example, since Psychowitz is barely in the damn thing despite being the most entertaining part, but don't worry. All the others are just as bad. So in a few minutes, I plan on doing a segment where I analyze some of the bigger faults of this show so far. But in short, the reason episodes like this are so underwhelming is that legacy character cameos are not events like they should be. They're fundamental world building. So they're not as important to the characters as they are to us. And that's pretty lame writing. With that, let's review one last episode before we take a little break. At the start of episode 10, Sam and Kat gather with Dice and Nona to watch their new babysitting commercial, which is airing at 2 a.m. on the Shameless channel during Toilet Wars. The commercial airs, it's whatever, but in the commercial they show a dog that's Dice's dog, this is the only important thing. They get no response from anyone who saw the commercial until the next day when a teenage girl and her parents swing by, saying that they saw their stupid commercial and that their missing dog was in it. Kat speculates that stupid is street slang for cool, but the family notes, We are not from the streets. We live in a gated community. We find out that this dog, once named Cornelius, went missing six months ago from the family's home. And shortly thereafter, Dice found the dog hunting for food in an alley and adopted it, naming him Opie. One flipped letter away from being the perfect dog name. The family shows them a video of Cornelius from when he was a show dog, taking part in a dancing routine with the teenage girl, an act which led to them winning the competition three years in a row. Well, no wonder he ran away! They do the usual thing where they set the dog in the middle of the room and see who he runs to and he rushes over to Dice. The parents say this is irrelevant as they're going to get a court order and come back in 24 hours with a policeman who will force the group to give Cornelius back. Kat says that in Bible study, she learned about a solo man who solved a dispute like this by cutting a baby in half, and she suggests they do the same thing. Everyone ignores her, and the teenager and her parents leave. <laughs> I'll deal with you later. There's something really distracting whenever these shows cast an actual 16-year-old to play a 16-year-old, and then she stands next to Ariana and Jeanette, who have to be like, Oh, you're the same age as us! Ha 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 ha! Dice brings his dog to Bot, saying that this is probably his last day with him, and he wants them to spend every moment together. Kat says to make sure he doesn't eat a hot dog, because that would be carnibalism. Sam corrects her, saying that the word is cannibalism, which means when humans eat other humans. Dice, who has never heard of this before, says that's disgusting, but Sam disagrees. She says that she once got stuck in an elevator with a kid named Gibby, and after 45 minutes, she strongly contemplated killing and eating him. Okay. Sam comes up with a plan and they go hunting at animal shelters for a dog that looks exactly like Opie. They go to one shelter where the man at the counter takes his shirt off and they find a perfect lookalike, despite the dog's cage reading Danger. They learn the dog is absolutely vicious if picked up, but he's fine if you leave him alone. Dice makes Opie his last meal, lasagna, a food that dogs and only dogs are famous for eating. But Sam and Cat go forward with their plan and they dress the doggy double up as Opie. When the bratty kid comes by to get the dog, they ask why she's dressed up all stupid. And she says that the dog dancing competition she's won for three years straight is that night, and she's going to win again. Dice points out that the only reason the girl went looking for this dog was so she could win the competition again. She says it doesn't matter either way, and as they leave with Shampopi, her father invites them to watch the show. But you can watch it on television. If you can afford cable. <laughs> <laughs> Dice and Cat go to get Opie so he can finish the lasagna he was eating, and once they're out of earshot, Sam rushes to where the dog was sitting, scarfing down canine saliva-soaked pasta because she has an eating disorder which is very serious and not funny at all. The trio do indeed to watch the dog competition live, and predictably the dog does not dance. But she has a chance to redeem this, as in the next part, she'll pick the dog up and dance with it in her arms. The dog goes predictably wild, and according to the commentators, begins mauling her and attempting to eat her foot. The trio decide they can't watch this, and instead tune into Toilet Wars, as Dice gives his dog a big kiss. Opie shows his blissfulness as Sam and Cat maintain their ambivalence. In the bonus credits scene, we see the judges continue to react to the teenager being violently mauled in front of them. One of the judges tries to call an ambulance, but he has no signal, and they decide there's nothing they can do but keep watching. 
Okay, so as of this moment, we have finished the first 10 episodes of Sam and Cat. So I would like to stop here for a second to kind of gather our thoughts before we move on to the rest of Season 1. Speaking of which, that is the very first thing I would like to talk about here. That being the question, how many seasons does Sam and Cat actually have? I touched upon this a little bit earlier in the video, but I thought it would be a good idea to kind of go over it all again with some added commentary and extra details that I haven't mentioned yet. Sam and Cat was originally only greenlit for 20 episodes, and by the time the show premiered, those 20 episodes were completely finished filming. Nickelodeon then responded to the show's explosive success by retroactively doubling that season order, meaning that the show now owed 40 episodes instead of 20. Now, as we've learned throughout the course of this miniseries, this was a very common thing for Nickelodeon to do. And the question is, why? Why go back and double a previous season order instead of just making a new order for a new batch of episodes? And the answer is... Money! If you make a new season order, you probably have to, like, pay people more because the show is popular enough to get a new season and they're gonna be able to barter for a better, you know, a better deal. But if you just double a previous contract, you can just keep paying these people what they agreed to when they originally pitched the project. Now, this exact same thing actually happened with both iCarly and Victorious. Both of these shows had one production block, one production season that was doubled later on, resulting in one really long string of produced episodes. And in both of those shows, that season was later cut in half by the network and broadcast as two distinct seasons. So iCarly seasons two and three is one production block, and Victorious seasons three and four also one production block, but Sam and Cat is a little bit different because pretty much consistently, Nickelodeon has always referred to this show as having one season. And, uh, you know, I'm just speculating here, but I think the reason they did this is that the show never finished filming. And I'm sure Nickelodeon is embarrassed about that. And my perspective is, you know, it's a little bit cleaner to bundle it all as one season, because it, it, it looks better on paper. Because if you have one season that's 20 episodes and one season is 15 episodes, that's a little sus. But if you just have one complete season that's 35 episodes, people are just like, oh, well, this one's just a little bit long. As I've been working on this miniseries, I've always found that there's this disparity between, like, the production numbering and the broadcast numbering, and that all the different places online tend to take a side pretty consistently. You know, so, that, so the main places I end up looking are Wikipedia, paywall streaming sites like Netflix and Hulu. You know, you pay one fee and you get it all. Paywall streaming sites, and then you got pay-per-view streaming sites. So this is like Amazon Prime, YouTube, you know, uh, websites where you can buy like one episode for $1.99, that kind of thing. So these three websites tend to consistently pick different sides on this debate. Wikipedia always does broadcast order and broadcast ranking. Paywall streaming sites consistently do production code sorting. So, you know, they'll sort by production code. Pay-per-view streaming sites consistently do the broadcast numbering like Wikipedia. So if you look up iCarly on Paramount Plus, it has five seasons. If you look up iCarly on Amazon Prime, it has six seasons. And people are gonna disagree with me, but I've always thought that the ranking on Amazon Prime, YouTube, and Wikipedia is the superior ranking of episodes in that it's most accurate to how it was perceived when broadcast and it's always the ranking of episodes that i've tended to base my personal judgment on but when it comes to sam and cat and how these websites deal with them it's just it's just weird okay it's just weird because on wikipedia and paramount plus sam and cat has one season but on netflix sam and cat has a season one and a season 1B. And on Amazon Prime, Sam and Cat has four seasons. Yeah, I don't really know why this is, but pay-per-view streaming services consistently say that Sam and Cat has four seasons, 10 episodes per season, with the last season having only five episodes. So to avoid any confusion moving forwards from here, I'm going to be referring to this entire show as having just one season. 
So there's not going to be any nonsense about Season 1B, Episode 1, or Season 2, Episode 1, or Season 4, Episode 1. It's just all going to be one season. But in terms of the structure of this video and how I'm producing it, I'm going to be basing it on the hypothesis that the show has four seasons, because I really like the idea of just reviewing four episodes at a time. I'm doing this segment not just because I love ranting about things that are bureaucratic and confusing, but also because I want to put to rest one of the biggest talking points about Sam and Cat. That being, oh, well, Sam and Cat doesn't have that many episodes. Oh, this video won't take that long for you to make because Sam and Cat barely has any episodes. It's such a shame that so few episodes of Sam and Cat were made. What the fuck are you talking about? Look, I understand, okay, I get it. If you're describing Sam and Cat to someone who has never heard of it, and you're trying to get across to them as quickly as possible, that it was, by some definition, a failure, the easiest way to go about that is just to say, well, it was an iCarly spinoff that only had one season. Or even better, it was an iCarly spinoff that had less than one season. Both of those statements are technically truths, but they also deliver to the listener two subtle non-truths. A, that Sam and Cat was canceled due to a lack of viewership, and B, that Sam and Cat doesn't have that many episodes. The first thing we've easily debunked by this point, but as for the second, Yes, it is technically true that Sam and Cat did not reach the typical 60 episode minimum that these shows strive for. However, it did get 60% of the way there. In fact, I looked this up. Do you remember the episode of Victorious where Jade and Beck break up? You know, for the second time, for real this time? You know, they go on a game show, they have this big fight, Jade injures Sinjin, Cat passes out, they break up at the end of the episode, it sets off this whole season-wide story arc. Do you remember that episode? That is episode 35 of Victorious. That's season three, people. Okay, season three of Victorious is when they hit 35. I was like six hours into my analysis by that point. So I think the big, widely held hot take about Sam and Cat shouldn't be that it has so few episodes, but that it has so many episodes. Because 35 episodes for one season? That's a lot. For comparison, do you know how many episodes the first season of Drake and Josh has? Six. They came up with this new show, they said, let's test the waters, let's make a season to test it out, and then they made six episodes like a normal person would. As I stand here recording this, I'm pretty confident this video is going to be longer than the runtime of the first season of Drake and Josh. So don't come in here fucking tell me Sam and Cat has so few episodes. In my opinion, the production of Sam and Cat fell apart due to a myriad of issues. It wasn't just one thing that happened, it was three or four or five, and it all just kind of ended in chaos. And throughout this video, you're going to occasionally catch on to what some of those issues were. But I definitely think this is one of the bigger ones. The production on this show was so rushed, and they did so many episodes in such a short amount of time, that by the end, pretty much everybody was burnt out. Anyways, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and do my typical end-of-season analysis as we go through what we've learned in the past 10 episodes. Now, as we've said, this video is a continuation of both my iCarly mini-mini-series and my Victorious mini-mini-series, so I'm going to continue the traditions of both videos in this one. So let's start things off here by going over the hashtag crimes of this hashtag season. Hashtag crime number 73 is trespassing onto the soundstage where they film That's a Drag. Hashtag crime number 74 is Sam nearly killing Bob by recklessly dropping him from 30 feet. Hashtag crime number 75 is Cat jumping onto the hood of a moving vehicle and causing imminent threat to said vehicle, not to mention the person inside, while refusing to get off for over an hour. Hashtag crime number 76 is Sam trespassing at the soundstage for a second time. Hashtag crime number 77 is Sam threatening the life of a middle schooler because he gave her a compliment. Hashtag crime number 78 is Sam stealing 
all of the furniture from the sitcom That's a Drag. Hashtag crime number 79 is Sam Cat Dice and all of Elderly Acres abandoning the Brit Brats in an alley in the middle of the night. Hashtag crime number 80 is Sam ripping the clothes off of a child and then putting them back on in the incorrect manner. Hashtag crime number 81 is, uh, the same thing. Hashtag crime number 82 is uh, is uh, that again for a third time. And also hashtag crime number 83 is there her doing that to his dad as well. I figure like two people, that's two crimes. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Fuck me. Hashtag crime number 84 is an interesting one. In California, it's illegal to have a pet goat if it isn't vaccinated or doesn't have a tag. This goat doesn't seem to have a tag, so keeping it around is patently illegal. Given that we've seen this goat since the original episode, we can infer that it probably is Dice's pet. And if it's still around, this is indeed a minor crime. Now, to cover hashtag crime number 85, we have to understand something about California culture. Southern California is prone to extreme droughts and hot weather, which is why there's so many fires in that part of the country. Because of this, fireworks more common in the Midwest are heavily illegal in huge chunks of California. This includes Venice Beach. So, Sam acquiring a massive fireworks machine and then shooting fireworks into the sky is very clearly our hashtag crime number 85. Now, there's a minor scene in that episode that I didn't mention earlier, which is relevant to this section. After Kat thinks of the idea of taking those three kids out to the bots restaurant, Sam says that she'll take the kids on her motorcycle. It's very explicit in the next scene that she took all three kids in one trip. This means that four individuals, one teenager, and three children were on one motorcycle at the same time. California law specifically dictates that no more than one passenger and one driver is allowed on any motorcycle at any specific time. And since Sam is not known to have any extra passenger vehicles, this is hashtag crime number 86. Hashtag crime number 87 is Goomer causing a public disturbance by screaming at all of the robots. Hashtag crime number 88 is Goomer running out of the restaurant with a random child. Hashtag crime number 89 is Sam waterboarding Goomer with milk. In episode 8, Sam breaks a table owned by the rival babysitters and later breaks into their basement at the end of the episode. Crimes committed against people from Jersey don't count. Now, Hashtag 90 is a doozy and the biggest one of this segment. It is specifically stated in the 10th episode of Sam and Cat that Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service operates without a license. Now, this varies by state, but California is known to have very strict babysitting regulations, and you cannot legally operate a babysitting service without a license. According to this article from ABC10.com, A person wanting to open a child care business in their home would have to apply for a license and attend orientations. Their homes would have to meet state regulations and be inspected for safety features, such as ensuring pools and outdoor play areas are fenced off and making sure the home is free from fire or poisoning hazards. Additionally, there are strict laws on who can operate at-home child care businesses. The person applying for the license must be at least 18 years old and must pass a criminal background check, as well as be cleared of any history of child or sex abuse. All adults living in the home would also have to submit fingerprints and pass criminal background checks. Based on this quote, it's very easy to infer that the reason these two haven't applied for a license is that they violated these rules in two separate ways. Because neither of them are over 18, according to the show at least, and Sam has a criminal record. According to this same article, operating a babysitting service in California without having a license can result in a fine of $200 for every day the business is in operation. Meaning that if caught, Sam and Cat could be fined thousands thousands of dollars just for the events of these first 10 episodes. So with that, we're up to hashtag 90, hashtag crimes, with the realization that the entire show, without exaggeration, is a crime itself. Things are stacking up fast. Will we outpace iCarly? At this rate, maybe. Anyways, as you can see, we have now returned to the pinboard set, which we last visited to talk about logos and Randy Newman or something. However, we are now here to continue an ongoing tradition of the Victoria Saga, specifically the segment I did discussing all of the characters and how they feature into the show itself. 
Now, the pinboard segments in my Victorious video all kind of covered topics like which of these characters are the coolest, which of these ships are the best, what political opinions do these characters probably have, where will these characters be in 10 years. Well, meanwhile, all of the rants in this video have mainly been about all the ways that this show sucks and doesn't make any sense. So let's do more of that now. So when it comes to sitcoms, there's three basic storylines that a typical episode is expected to do. You got your A plot, you got your B plot, and you got your runner. At this point, you should probably understand what an A plot and a B plot is, but runner is a term that I haven't really used up to this point. Runners are typically elements of an episode that are less storylines and more running jokes that occasionally come up in a specific script. For instance, when Sam found that really big fork in iCarly, or when Andre kept talking about how he'd never been stung by a bee before. As a joke, I've often taken to calling some runners C-plots and D-plots and E-plots and F-plots, uh, partially because I think it's funny, and also partially to emphasize that so many scripts in these shows overuse runners to overcompensate either for having too many characters, or having too short of a script, or both. I think taking all this into consideration really sheds a light on why Sam and Cat feels so unbalanced, because when you look at these characters, they still maintain that origin DNA that served a purpose in their original shows. Sam Puckett, at her core, is a B-plot character. Now that isn't a sin, and indeed she does earn A-plots from time to time, but for the most part, in iCarly, Sam serves the important purpose of having funny antics in the second half of the episode, which do not take away from the main strife of the A-plot. Cat Valentine, meanwhile, is a runner character. At least by the end of Victorious, her job full-time is to set up some kind of weird gag early into the story, and to then continuously bring that gag up until the episode ends. For instance, Cat jumping around on moon boots, that's a runner. Cat being really into tap dancing, that's a runner. Cat murdering two people, that's essentially a runner. Hell, even Cat's brother occasionally being mentioned is something of like a series long runner. And so when you put these two characters in a room and you wind them up and you just let them go, what you end up with is a show that has B plots and runners but no A-plots. Another additional detail is that Sam Puck was designed as a character to become more complex as the show went on. Her emotions became more multifaceted, and she became a better person, and the more time she spent with other people, the more we saw that reflected. Cat Valentine is literally the opposite of this. Because as the show went on and it continued to use her less and less and in more cartoonish ways, she became less complex. Anything the writers found about her to be even slightly amusing, they ramped up to a thousand percent and overnight she became one of the most simple characters in the NSU expanded universe. To make matters worse, she's also really fucking annoying because like the voice that Ariana puts on by the end of Victorious and the start of Sam and Cat is the most obnoxious like shrill baby voice and what it reminds me of and I, this might not be a decent thing to just throw out there but what it reminds me of is that old meme that's like ha 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 Step brother, I'm stuck in the dryer again. Ha 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 ha. I hope no one comes and does anything. Ha ha ha. And it's like that all the time and it's so fucking annoying. Anyways, the point I'm trying to make is that Sam and Cat are a fundamentally bad pairing because they do not play to each other's strengths. Sam doesn't feed into Cat's antics very much, and Cat isn't a real enough person for Sam to show any kind of complexity towards. They are two characters doing entirely detached bits from one another and just standing in the same room. And so with the show being so poorly plastered together, they end up needing a few more characters to keep the gears running. And we find those in Dice, Goomer, and Nona. These characters are weird because I feel like they're all introduced as supporting characters, but really by the end of the first 10 episodes, they become more part-time main characters. Dice is a weird character by himself because I get the feeling, like I, like I pick up on this vibe, that when the show first started, 
he was supposed to be the runner, right? Like his whole deal at the start of the show was he would run in at the start of an episode and he'd be selling something funny. And it wouldn't be a B plot, it would be just a joke that shows up a couple times in the episode. Like maybe he'd show up twice and there'd be some joke about this thing he's selling. Like, like he was the runner. But at this point, Dice is working overtime because you could argue that he is now almost consistently the A plot. Because now, almost every episode of this show that I watch is these two characters lounging around doing literally nothing until Dice bursts in and goes, I got a problem, and then the rest of the episode is about that. And it's so confounding to me that so far, every episode of Sam and Cat that is even remotely good is about a rookie MMA fighter being managed by a 12 year old. Just make that the show. This reminds me of how like in iCarly after a couple seasons, they stopped showing the web show because the writers just ran out of things to do with it. So it was just about the antics of these characters that already exist. Except in this case, it seems like the writers have run out of things to do with the babysitting service after like five episodes. The only other element of Sam and Cat that I feel like analyzing here is the setting. And specifically not where, but when. Going into this, it was my expectation and my pre-existing understanding that Sam and Cat was going to be set after a time skip and that these two characters would be freshly out of high school, running a business together and doing adulty things. However, as you guys have caught on to by now, this is not the case, because Sam and Cat is set at the specific moment where these origin shows wrapped up in a loop forever. The theory I actually have right now is that Sam and Cat is actually set during the senior year of the Hollywood 7 from Victorious. This makes sense to me because they were sophomores in seasons 1 and 2, they were juniors in seasons 3 and 4, and now it would kind of line up that they would be seniors in the run of episodes that we see in Sam and Cat. Now, if at any moment in the series, Cat casually mentions that she's still going to school with Trina, this entire theory is just thrown out the window, but it's the one that I have at this exact moment. Regardless, the ongoing implication of Sam and Cat is that in the background of this show, Victorious Season 5 is currently happening. This is the weirdest part of the program. Because, like, remember earlier in the video when I went on that tangent where I listed a bunch of sitcoms that are spin-offs of other sitcoms but are not primarily known for being that? What is the shared element of the pilot episode of every single one of those shows? Oh yeah, the main character moves! Frasier moves from Boston to Seattle, Daria moves from Highland to Lawndale, Mark time travels from the 1950s to the 1970s, the Jeffersons move on up from Queens to Manhattan where they live in a deluxe apartment in the sky. The reason that this is always done is to clean the slate, reboot the narrative, say hey, that old show still exists, but this is a new show and we're going to do our own thing in our own world. And that way, when an old friend stops by, it's going to feel special for all of us. Because it would be weird, it would be weird if Frasier was set in Boston and if in every single episode Frasier walked into his apartment and said, Hey, I just saw Ted Danson at the bar Cheers. I see Ted Danson every day. He is always slightly off camera. And then Ted Danson stops by for what is supposed to be a special event story, but it doesn't come across that way because Frasier is like, Oh, there's Ted Danson. I see him every single day at the bar, which the audience never sees. And the worst part is, I still don't know why the show is like this. Because what is accomplished by having Cat Valentine constantly say that she is still 16 and still goes to Hollywood arts? What does it add to the show? When I first figured out that this was like an ongoing part of the narrative, I joked to my friends that the only reason they could possibly have done this would be if the writers were convinced that this was a temporary situation. Like they were very, very sure 
that Nickelodeon was going to like suddenly change their minds and like cancel Sam and Cat and uncancel iCarly and Victorious. And so they wrote this spinoff specifically so that if they had to do that, it would still make narrative sense. Because Sam can just move back to Seattle and be like, well, let's go back to high school. And, you know, you can just suddenly like cut back to Cat's life at school. Like, like this whole side adventure never mattered. And then later on, I actually came up with this unironic conspiracy theory that the show is like this because the writers had some episode they wanted to do that they never had the chance to do that would only have worked if the characters were still underaged. Like, maybe their plan was that episode 60 of Sam and Cat was going to be a full cast victorious reunion. Or maybe they wanted to do an episode where Sam's mom shows up again and she tries to take custody of Sam. You know, like they had some episode planned, you know, for the latter end of the show that they never got to make because the show ended so soon. But then I realized one day, the only reason the show is written like this is because of the Gibby pilot. Like the Gibby pilot and the Sam and Cat pilot were written around the same time. They thought the shows were going to coexist. So they wrote this show like this so it would make sense with the Gibby spinoff. I don't think it's any more complex than that. But what this ends up doing is giving the show this air of, like, a 20-year-old that peaked in high school, where every single episode of the show is someone in early 2013 going like, <sighs> remember 2012? And it's like, that was, that was too recent <laughs> for you to already be pining for it again. And before we move on, I just want to add as a final note that I'm pretty sure that this element... The fact that Victorious is supposed to still be happening in the background of Sam and Cat, I'm pretty confident this is why Victorious doesn't have a finale. Because the intention of the writers was that basically all of those characters were to be cryogenically frozen. So that if at any point during the events of this show, the writers wanted to bring one of those legacy characters back, it would literally be like no time had passed and nothing significant had happened. And that's one of the reasons why I think every Ted Danson episode in this show is kind of lame. I'm more than a quarter of the way done with Sam and Cat at this point, and I still don't understand any of the most basic choices they've made when writing this. It feels like someone pulling ideas out of a hat and throwing them all at the wall without thought because they have no time whatsoever. Six out of 10, pretty good. So the character analysis segments tend to be a bit bulky and overwhelming. So I think it's about time for us to do the very first Sam and Cat themed intermission. These are segments I do in between seasons where I analyze aspects of these projects which don't necessarily come up in the typical episode structure. For instance, in the first iCarly video, I talked about iCarly toys and merchandise. In the first Victorious video, I did a segment all about the video games that were themed around Victorious. And for this intermission, I have... Nothing. Okay, so strictly speaking, obviously that's not 100% true. A quick glance at the segmented time bar below will tell you that. But it is absolutely true that for so many of these topics where I had a lot to say about iCarly and a lot to say about Victorious, when you look at the Sam and Cat version of those topics, there's not a lot going on because Sam and Cat is a much more simple franchise and a much more short franchise because it didn't stick around for that much time. Here's a funny story. A year or two ago when I was first planning this video, one of the first things I did was I went on eBay and I searched like Sam and Cat merchandise, Sam and Cat memorabilia, hoping that I'd find like a Goomer bobblehead or something. And the very first thing that popped up when I did that was a used bra. So it was an eBay listing for a bra that Ariana Grande supposedly wore on the set of Sam and Cat. And when you see something like that, there's no good vibes. Only bad shit is happening right there. And I found out, like, looking into it, that there is an entire online black market of people who buy and sell used celebrity underwear. And I don't want to go around shaming people, 
But I think in this case, your actions shame themselves. Anyways, the point is that there isn't really one topic of secondary material with Sam and Cat deserving of an entire intermission. So instead, this segment is going to be kind of a mini compilation of all of the different stuff I could find. So let's go ahead and get started. As you'll remember, iCarly and Victorious were heavily defined by a shared gimmick. The use of an in-universe website, which the show encouraged people to visit in real life. iCarly had iCarly.com, an E-Bombs World-style compilation of original skits and posts. While Victorious had The Slap, an in-universe social media website used by the main characters. Sam and Cat is a little bit different in this regard. The show did feature an obscure in-universe domain, as going to Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service.net or Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service.com would lead you to a very simple web page advertising the babysitting service. Testimonials. We had so much fun. We played hide and seek, and Sam actually hid in the mall down the street. She, she's really good at that game. Sam taught me a bunch of new words. One of them got me detention, though. They showed me this new game called Who Can Do The Laundry First and I Won. Sam only let me out of the closet after I promised to give him my fruit snacks. Oh. You're probably expecting more, but that's kind of it. It's the sort of website a YouTuber would make if they had a domain builder as a sponsor, but didn't want to spend more than 40 minutes on it. Now, in 2018, for various reasons, iCarly.com and TheSlap.com were taken down by Viacom. Today, both of these links will redirect you to their respective show pages on Nick.com. Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service.com is actually an exception to this, as Nickelodeon apparently forgot about it, and it currently doesn't go anywhere and just gives you an error message. This oversight was probably caused by Sam and Cat having a second, completely different domain, samandcat.com, which redirected to nick.com slash samandcat from the day that it launched in 2013. So let's talk about the various Sam and Cat content that has been hosted on nick.com over the years. Part 1. The Games iCarly and Victorious both had video games which were released on home console. But by 2013, the gaming industry had shifted in such a way that shovelware was almost exclusive to mobile app stores, giving companies like Viacom less of an incentive to invest their short-term projects into the industry. So sadly, all of the Sam and Cat games that were released were simple browser games which mostly ran on Flash. Starting us off is Sam and Cat, Sam's Arm Wrestling Challenge. It's Dr. Mario. If you do good at Dr. Mario, you win at arm wrestling. If you fuck up, the other person wins. That's it. There is not a single asset in this game that actually looks like it was made for any of these shows. I think the Nickelodeon just had a cheap stock game and slapped some images of Jeanette onto it just to advertise their new show. There's nothing else to say. Then there's Sam and Cat, Awesome Babysitting Coach. It's a matching game where you have to click three images that the game tells you to click on. That's it. That's all the Sam and Cat games I could find. Well, with one exception. Back in the Victorious video, you might recall me discussing a little game called Nickelodeon Block Party. The game was kind of like a Flash version of Mario Party, with the idea being that it was a virtual board game that you could play, with various Nickelodeon franchises being represented in both the boards and the character selection screen. I'm bringing this up because the original Nickelodeon Block Party not only includes content based on iCarly and Victorious, but also Sam and Cat. This means it's entirely possible to start a game, select Cat Valentine as a playable character, then select the Victorious board, where Cat Valentine from Sam and Cat can land in front of Cat Valentine from Victorious. You slip her Fortnite character in there, you got Ariana No Way Home. 
The Sam and Cat board, for the most part, has a very metaphorical art style, with a lot of candy and plushies, things that generally don't relate to the show at all. But in terms of minute details, it's clearly made by someone who, at the very least, has seen the first few episodes. The playthrough is dictated by Dice, who introduces you to the game and leads you around the board. You collect blue coins through trivia, mind games, and dumb luck, and your goal is to reach and collect gold coins along the way, if you have enough blue coins saved up to buy them. You'll never know true shame until Dice from Sam and Cat calls you poor. He's laughing at your pain. Oh my darling Nona, how have you been? I'm suddenly remembering why we put you in a home. Other characters in this game include Murph the Goat, who causes you to lose blue coins, and the Red Welder Among Us robot, who also causes you to lose coins. Oh look, Shane got a gold coin, I wonder what his victory animation is. Okay, that's enough, Shane. I said that's enough. That's enough! Once per round, the three players take part in a randomly selected party game, with each game being based on some Nickelodeon property. And hey, this is the only place in the world you'll ever see Cat Valentine in a lollipop licking competition. There are two Sam and Cat party games in this selection. The first is called Apartment Maze, and is pretty simple. Apartment 22 is somewhere on screen. Each door randomly connects to a different floor, and you have to find the right door combination that gets you to Apartment 22. The second party game is Demanding Goat. In this one, Murph the Goat is hungry and impatient, and insists on being fed. The player to get him the most of his requested food wins the round. Nickelodeon Block Party is weird because it has a lot of controls that feel like they would work really well on the Wii, and it's supposed to be a party game, but as far as I know, there's no way to play the game with more than one person. Players 2 and 3 are always controlled by the AI. So it's not really a party game, it's a party game simulator. But hey, if you've got a Flash emulator and want to pretend you have friends, it's not the worst way to spend 15 minutes. Now that we're briefly on the topic of Sam and Cat and video games, there's, uh, there's something I wanted to bring up that I meant to bring up in the episode analysis, but I never got around to it. It's just something I want to talk about that's been bothering me for a while, and I just want to get it off my chest real quick. One of the things that I think about the most when it comes to Sam and Cat is kind of the what if factor. You know, that element of like Sam and Cat did end earlier than was initially expected. If Sam and Cat had lasted a few more seasons, what would that have been like? What is the show Sam and Cat could have become? And I've recently started privately wishing that Sam and Cat had lasted at least one more year because I had an absolutely brilliant idea for a Sam and Cat episode. Okay, here it is. Here's my pitch. Here, here's my idea. What if there was an episode of Sam and Cat from 2015 where for some reason, like, Sam and Cat need a little extra money? You know, on short notice, they need a little extra dough. So they decide to get second jobs working night guard security at the restaurant bots. We're talking about a potential double bill salmon cat set at Halloween, which is explicitly ripping off Five Nights at Freddy's. That's it. That's all I got. I don't, I don't, I don't have any ideas other than that. I just thought, wouldn't it have been cool if they did that? Anyways, let's finish off our discussion of web exclusive material produced for salmon cat with part two the videos. Once again, both iCarly and Victorious were heavily defined by the video content of their online presence, and you would expect the same to be true of Sam and Cat. And there is one small piece of media that does qualify under this category. Although perhaps small isn't the word I'm looking for, as it's technically more accurate to describe this content as... little. Everyone's soon-to-be favorite teeny-tiny host, Lil 
Little Sam and Little Cat. Ah! Ow! Whew, that was a fun way to start our first show. For you, how come I didn't get a parachute? You know, we could argue about this. Or we could get right to the good stuff. We have Ariana Grande and Jeanette McCurdy standing by to talk to us live from the set of the greatest TV show in the world, Sam and Cat. What? Seriously? We do? This is the Lil Sam and Cat show. The only real example of online exclusive Sam and Cat media made during the show's run. It's bad. And I know you might be thinking, Quentin, this is clearly just a little short made to advertise the pilot episode. Why get bent out of shape about it? Uh, because you're wrong. There are 59 episodes of the Lil Sam and Cat show. That's more episodes than the big Sam and Cat show had. This show is basically like an offshoot tangent to the metaverse where every single episode is built off of like behind the scenes skits and clips, you know, things that make you understand how they made the show and, you know, oddities of the cast members goofing off in between takes. And all of that is bookended by these little animated segments of like this weird parallel universe where every, it, it's Sam and Cat, but everything is little and the little versions of the Sam and Cat characters are obsessed with Sam and Cat as a TV show. Quite distractingly, Lil Sam and Lil Cat are not voiced by Jeanette McCurdy and Ariana Grande, but instead, Megan Strange and Crystal Harwood. Believe it or not, this assigns pointless continuity to the universe of the Lil Sam and Cat show. You might remember that in the penultimate episode of iCarly, the gang watch an animation segment sent to them by Bitty Big Heads, which is like a chibi version of the iCarly universe. In this segment, Bitty Sam was also played by Megan Strange, implying that the Lil Sam and Cat show is actually a spin-off of Bitty Big Heads iCarly, creating something of a pocket-sized NSU. Recasting Sam and Cat also gave the show an unexpected strength later on, because after the production of Sam and Cat fell to pieces and the actors stopped showing up to set, they kept making the Lil Sam and Cat show, with new episodes coming out months after the show was finished. Lil Sam and Cat even did a special bonus episode advertising the release of Henry Danger, the kind of cross-franchise promotion that the main series most likely would have been expected to do if the series hadn't fallen apart under such dubious circumstances. Now, this is going to sound stupid, but I've been trying to avoid spoilers for all of the episodes of Sam and Cat that I haven't seen yet. So we're not actually going to review all of the Lil Sam and Cat show because there's just too many spoilers. It would be a mess. But I have at this point seen enough of the main franchise that I am prepared to review the first 24 episodes of this web series. So let's get started. In Season 1 Episode 1, we see Lil Sam and Lil Cat land into their Lil Studio, where Lil Sam announces that they are about to get live footage of Jeanette McCurdy and Ariana Grande on the set of Sam and Cat. Lil Cat is a massive fan of both girls and gets so excited that she passes out. Lil Sam gets the feed set up, and Jeanette and Ariana appear to tell the girls that they are so excited to see the Lil Sam and Cat show play out, in a tone which does not at all imply a gun pointed at their heads. Yep. We'll be sending lots of fun videos of us hanging out and having fun on set. And we're gonna have all kinds of cool contests where you guys can win in a variety of ways. We then see that Jeanette is having a foot massage done by the kid who plays dice. Hey, hand back on the foot. One of these days, I'm gonna die, and then I'll know peace. Lil Cat wakes up from her excitement coma and learns that she missed the entire segment. We then see a behind the scenes sequence of how they did the couch stunt from the pilot episode. Very carefully. It's a really safe structure. Cause you can never know what's gonna go wrong. Ow! It works flawlessly every time. We see more behind the scenes segments and a few gags and goofs, and then Lil Sam and Lil Cat explode. 
good. At the start of Lil Sam and Cat episode 2, the girls point out that they now have a live audience, which Sam says she found waiting at a bus stop, and she coerced them to come to the studio in exchange for free pizza, which the girls do not have. Then some other stuff happens. I hate being alive. Towards the end of the episode, Ariana appears to explain the concept of a mugshot. Mugshots were an interactive element added to Sam and Cat, where fans could send in photos of themselves, and the showrunners would select one person a week to appear in an episode in some way, typically on the bottom of Sam's mug. I think by the end of the show they gave up on this, but there was a lot of focus put on it early on. When the crowd realizes there is no free pizza, they turn on a little Sam and Cat, and the girls have to flee the studio. In Season 1, Episode 3, Lil Sam comes into the show late because she stopped to buy some meat being sold in the back of a van, causing strife with Little Cat as Sam refuses to dedicate to hosting their show, instead chomping down on the questionable meat. She then gets sick and falls over. Then Lil Cat brings in a bunch of butterflies to the studio, which annoy Sam to no end, so she decides to politely spray them with pesticides. Jeanette and Ariana appear to announce the mugshot winner who appeared in that week's episode, and afterwards, the butterflies return to the Lil set, with Sam noting that they don't look happy. In Season 1, Episode 4, the girls are excited as they have an insider who actually worked on Sam and Cat that they have the chance to interview. Said insider turns out to be Murph the Goat, who they speak to about his performance. What was it like being on a TV show with Ariana and Jeanette? Were you excited? Nervous? <coughs> um, you got any crazy behind the scenes stories to share with us? In a brief live action segment, Jeanette attaches a GoPro to Murph to document what he does throughout the day. This ends with Murph running around the set, sneaking up on people in the show, signing autographs, and then stealing a car. And that's Lil Crime number one. Then we're shown a behind the scenes feature of the stunt fall where a repairman fell on Nona, or rather, Nona stunt actor. I'm nervous, I always get a little shaky before stunts, even if I'm just watching them. Oh wow, I wonder what experience could have inspired that anxiety. <laughs> episode 5 is boring, so I'm skipping it. In Season 1, Episode 6, we learn that Lil Dice has grown tired of being pushed to the sidelines, so he has decided to kick Lil Sam and Lil Cat out of the studio, making himself the lead of the program. But Lil Sam overrules this. Huh? I might have fibbed a little. Uh, gotta go, I'm afraid. Then Sam and Cat get segways and fly through the window again. In episode 7, Lil Cat introduces a new segment which has to do with lollipops, causing Lil Sam to have an episode. You're gonna lick my face, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Normal Lil Show, Normal Lil Show! We then see a segment where Jeanette and Ariana have a lollipop licking competition. Well, I'll be damned. Ariana wins. We come back to the Lil set, and we see that Lil Sam has been replaced by a duplicate. A Robo Lil Sam. But Robo Lil Sam breaks, and Lil Sam expresses that she was trying to get out of work. My life has fallen off the rails. I struggle to get out of bed every time I wake up and I worry that things will never be alright ever again. In episode 8, Lil Sam gets horses for her and Little Cat to ride on the show, but first she places an ice cream cone onto the forehead of one of the horses. She convinces Cat that this is the only known unicorn in the world, which she tracked down as a gift. Lil Cat says she'll do anything to repay Lil Sam for this, and Lil Sam says she anticipated that, as she has an itemized list of 200 things she needs done. We then see a live action segment where Ariana has learned to speak fucking goat so she can speak to the goat from the episode. Great. Good for you. You can do fucking anything. After this, Lil Cat says that she has an embarrassing problem that she doesn't want Lil Sam to laugh at. We learn that she has a gigantic pimple on her arm, and we hear laughing. However, it turns out to be a group of laughing babies who are stuck in the pipes again. Lil Dice gets out a boot because he is going to beat the laughing babies to death, I presume. Then, we find out that the climbing baby wall was a special effect. What? No way, you had me fooled.
In episode 9, they're in a pool or something, crocodiles show up. The only significant thing about this one is that there's a behind the scenes clip where they show us the actual faces of all of the Victoria Shemps, and I just love the energy of this. It's just uncanny in all the right ways. Yeah, I watch Victorious. In episode 10, we find out that Lil Sam and Lil Cat have joined the circus, and they emerge confidently from a tiny car filled with animals. The two do some circus stuff, and Lil Cat says being in the circus is just as fun as Sam promised. And it will keep being fun as long as no clowns show up, because Cat has a clown phobia. Then, Sam sends in a bunch of clowns, and Cat passes out. After this, Sam announces that she has a pet elephant now, but Cat continuously refuses to address the elephant elephant in the room because she'll get to it later. Then we see a live action segment where they force Jeanette to interview a toilet. Give it up everybody. I hate my life and I don't want to do this interview. Then Lil Sam and Lil Cat quit the circus. In episode 11 we're introduced to a long anticipated character, Lil Goomer, who brings in boxes that are supposed to contain Lil Sam and Lil Cat. However, the cat box includes a real cat who attacks Goomer. <laughs> it turns out that Goomer accidentally sent the real cat to China. This might be an incredibly racist joke if they did it on purpose. Lil Cat is terrified because she never learned how to use chopsticks, so now she thinks she'll never eat again. After a pointless thing, Lil Cat comes running back onto set, saying she realized she was in Chinatown, not China country. Guma runs in, saying he thinks he got the right box this time, but a lion pops out. In episode 12, Sam and Cat come out in sumo wrestler outfits, which Lil Sam admits she fished out of a dumpster. I can't believe I found these in the dumpster behind the studio. Wait, you got these out of the trash? You said they were vintage. That's what vintage means, taking someone else's garbage and wearing it like it's cool. Kim Kardashian. The girls introduce a live action segment of the guest stars of the week dancing, and to celebrate this, the girls dance with their own former guest stars. As Cat dances with the suave lion who showed up in the previous episode, Sam dances with one of the crocodiles and puts up a fuss about it. Then Lil Sam and Lil Cat are erased from existence by a merciful god. Episode 13 is not really too exciting, but does include a really fun blooper. You pooped! Oh, oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh. Oh. In episode 14, the Lil Show is facing some issues, as it has been infected by bugs, who attack Lil Dice as the girls start the show. The girls call an exterminator company, but they send their newest hire, Lil Goomer, who is terrified of bugs. Sam gets rid of the bugs by tickling them until they leave. In episode 15, it's Halloween or something, who cares? Episode 16 is a clip show. The Lil Sam and Cat Show has a clip show. They were that convinced of their own self-worth. At the start of episode 17, Lil Sam and Cat say they've run out of money, so they've started taking sponsors. What hacks? This episode is sponsored by trains, with one on set being piloted by Lil Goomer. Lil Goomer drives the train off, but it runs over dice in the process. They then do sponsors for cars, and then planes, which Lil Sam pitches as... A great way to travel and spread disease. In episode 18, we find out that there was a massive Bible-like flood that has enveloped the studio. Dice stays above ground, fighting off a killer shark, while Lil Sam and Cat do a special underwater episode. Are you enjoying this segment? Are you learning things that will improve your day? Will you pass this information along to your descendants? Fill your empty life with my empty words. Do everything you can to fight off the entropy of silence that constantly is moments away from consuming the little you have left. In episode 19, we learn that Lil Sam and Lil Cat have continued their flirtatious relationships with an alligator and a lion. With the joke being that Cat's feline boyfriend is very ideal, while Sam's reptilian boyfriend is a little bit less than that. Sam then begins to go on about the iCarly lore of the real Sam having a twin, which causes Lil Sam to say that unlike her counterpart, she is a quadruplet. After this, three identical Sams come onto the show, and they jump around to confuse cat. Now guess which one of us is the real little Sam. Whoa, her head exploded. Yeah, it always does.
After a random clip shot on the Sam and Cat set, we cut to Lil Sam and Lil Cat being hit with spitballs shot by evil babies. Lil Cat, you invited those terrible toddlers back on the show? I did. I like the smell of babies. But these are evil babies. They still smell good. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good baby. <laughs> I'd take care of this, but I promised I'd never punch a baby again. Cat tries to sing the babies a lullaby, but she's the one who ends up passing out. In the next segment, Lil Sam and Cat prepare to introduce the fan that made it into the TV show, but they are interrupted by me. No, not you. No, oh, I'm such a loser. Yeah, you kind of are. This is the part where you tell me I'm not a loser. Anyway. For the outro, Kat presents something she promises no one will want to miss, a long segment of Nona eating pudding, with extreme close-ups on her mouth as she moans. Mmm. Mmm. Tapioca pudding. <laughs> I don't feel safe. Then Lil Sam and Cat's anthro boyfriends come and take them away. In season one, episode 20, Lil Sam and Cat are now in space. Uh, this is the one where they go to space. There's a security breach and some little green aliens show up. And they're like space paparazzi who are big fans of Lil Sam and Cat, but not big Sam and Cat. Says a lot about media accessibility in that era. Lil Cat gives them an orbograph, which is not a sexual thing. Then we see the greatest segment in all of the Lil Sam and Cat show. Two random men reenact scenes from Sam and Cat. I, mean, I kinda don't have anywhere I need to be, and I kinda need a roommate. <gasps> Are you saying what I think you're saying? Yeah. You're gonna stay here in LA with me for a while and help me find a roommate? I already found you a roommate. Shut up! Who is she? Me! Oh my gosh! This is the best day ever! <laughs> if I could, I would only watch this version of the show. Later, in the vacuum, Sam has Cat open up a bottle of soda, and she goes shooting off. Sam then summons a shooting star, which she rides off into the night. Literally. The next two episodes of the Lil Sam and Cat show are lost media. <laughs> Not much information has been maintained about these episodes, except the titles and thumbnails, which still survive to this day. Episode 21 seems to have featured Cat being decapitated, presumably with her head and body getting up to separate adventures. And episode 22 was a mini-episode focusing on the real dice doing magic tricks. The weird thing is that a lot of episodes of the Lil Sam and Cat show are still on various Nickelodeon websites, fully available to be watched at any time. So the fact that other episodes only exist through low-quality YouTube rips, or don't exist at all, is just really strange to me. Now, episodes 23 and 24 are very unique, as they don't actually tie into any episodes broadcast on TV, as they are instead standalone shorts. They are also both Christmas specials, unique as Sam and Cat never had an official Christmas episode, only an honorary one. Episode 23 features Dice throwing a Sam and Cat super rock and awesome fun time shindig, which starts off poorly as a Christmas tree falls on him. Dice then notes that it's very hot on set, and we see why. Lil Sam is roasting a pig as she is throwing a special Hawaiian Christmas party. Party. We then meet Goomer Claus, who is one of Santa's helpers. Goomer Claus has attempted to make a display for the party, a sleigh with eight cats leading it. He explains that the pet store was all out of deer, and the sickly cats were all they would give him. Around this point, we also see specially shot segments of Jeanette and Ariana. They throw the party, but Cat ultimately is a total no-show. The segment is hilarious because there's a bunch of lore characters we're supposed to know already, but we don't because some fucking idiot at Viacom deleted a bunch of episodes of the greatest little show to ever exist and just never put them back up? Cat shows up and says she was in the bathroom. Episode 24 is essentially a bloopers reel of the previous episode. There, that's it. We're fucking done. So that was the first 24 episodes of the Lil Sam and Cat show. Will I ever review the remaining 35 episodes? I hope not.
So let's end off this intermission compilation with the very thing that I teased at the start of this whole mess. Random Salmon Cat oddities that I found on eBay. The first thing I got was a Salmon Cat poster that I found on Mercari. I lost it. Which leaves us with basically the only thing I ever had on the docket to begin with. Salmon Cat School Folders. These were shockingly hard to get. They took me a few times and a few different bids. Because what I've discovered is that, like, Ariana collectors have developed a completely artificial black market for certain Salmon Cat memorabilia. And for some reason, the folders were a part of that. And I have a theory why. Um, these folders are basically like posters, like little tiny posters. And what I've discovered is a lot of people buy these folders, make pretty good scans of them, upscale them, and then sell them as posters, <laughs> you know, because, uh, I don't know, there's probably like some 12 year old girl in the world who loves the obscure oddities of Ariana history that wouldn't mind like a cat Valentine poster on her wall. So, uh, you have to fend off some, some, uh, some bots and some scalpers to actually get these. But we, let the, we can quickly go through these. Uh, this is the main one, from my perspective. This was like a poster for the series, and it's like this big explosion of Apartment 22, and all of the characters from the first few episodes are just popping out there. Then this is one of the Ariana folders. It's her holding a can of Bibble, and on the back you kind of got Sam dressed up all silly and she's doing a dance. And here is another Cat Valentine folder. For some reason, there's a lot more Cat Valentine folder then uh, Sam Puckett folders, and she's on her bike, and on the back you see that, that Sam is on her motorcycle. You know, they parallel in that way. And uh, then you've got this one, which I know for a fact I scanned and turned into the thumbnail. Uh, uh, I just thought it was a, a very good photo of the two of them. And I wasn't able to Photoshop that flower out of Cat's hair, so if you look at the thumbnail, that's still there. Then this is the only Sam folder I have. I, I presume there's more Sam folders, and it's her hugging this big yellow duck. And then on the back, you got Cat holding a stuffed animal. And, um... That's it. That's all the Sam and Cat merchandise they made. Okay, there is actually one other thing that I just remembered. Uh, I managed to find on, I think, Facebook Marketplace this Sam and Cat t-shirt for a child. And I, I've developed a pretty good eye for telling when a t-shirt is made by a spam bot and when it's official. And based on what I've seen, this one is, you know, Nickelodeon approved. So this is an official shirt from the time. And you know, obviously I have this shirt, I want to do something with it, right? And the sad thing is, because it's made for a child, it like would not fit me at all. But I was thinking, it might be just the perfect size to put on a novelty oversized Garfield. Okay, so when I said that, I'm sure a lot of you guys thought that I was going to put the shirt on that Garfield on my set, but that 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 guy's actually too big. He wears like <laughs> like a 6XL or something like that. So I I went on eBay a while ago and I got this guy. Uh, this is a uh, a new one of my favorites. Uh, he's uh, a big guy, and he's wearing a t-shirt that says, Are we having fun yet? Uh, so these, these are fascinating Garfields, because uh, from uh, from my understanding of it, uh, these were never meant to be sold. These were kind of meant for, like, windows, you know? You, you want to advertise your selling Garfield plushies, put a big one of these at the window. And uh, you can really tell, because the, this line work on his stripes is pathetic, you know? But that's because this wasn't meant to actually be, like, sold to the public. So, um... So, yeah, this is the one I got. And the great thing about these old Garfield plushies is... That all the clothes have, like, Velcro and stuff on them. So, like, I can just take this shirt off. And so this was my idea. Okay, so you, you're you following me so far? I cut the shirt down the back, so all I gotta do is... Just put it on like this, right? Just put it on like that. And there we go, we've completed the tradition. We had an iCarly Garfield, we had a Victorious Garfield, and now we have the Sam and Cat Garfield. And I'm sure at some point I'll get a shot of all of them together, you know, I'll put it in right here. And we've got the whole group, you know, we did it people, we did it. Okay, so that's this intermission dealt with, let's get back into where we left off, with Season 1, Episode 11. Now, this one's going to be an interesting throwback. Now, this one's going to be a throwback 
because this episode is actually a sequel to an earlier episode that we reviewed not too long ago. So let's talk about Season 1, Episode 11, Revenge of the Brit Brats. So at the start of the episode, Sam and Kat have just finished babysitting two kids who asked for makeovers while they were there. Kat, talented in fields of makeup and costume work, made one of them a zombie, while Sam turned the other into a box. The mom pays for their work and then scampers off, leaving the discordant duo alone. The two try to split up pay for the evening, with the joke being that Sam takes all of the money and leaves Kat confused. After this, there is a ring at the door and we see that it's the Brit Brats from way back in episode 3. Kat runs away screaming and Sam tries to get them to leave, even threatening to beat on the Brats with a baseball bat. The girls explain that their school in Britain was shut down due to a lice epidemic, and the Brit Brats have come back to America with presents for their former babysitters. This includes a canister of Bibble. Kat runs out, grabs the Bibble, and flees back to her room. The girls also reveal they've brought a special motorcycle helmet for Sam, with the British flag printed on the side. This was a very popular fashion trend in America in the 2010s. I cannot justify why. Now, if I got this as a gift, my first thought would be, wow, this is gaudy and cheap. And then my second thought would be, wait a minute, didn't these girls just say the phrase, lice epidemic? Maybe I shouldn't use this. Sam's first thought is, oh boy, I better put this on my head. On top of this, the girls also gift a special British plunger, which they claim is called a shovemucker in the UK. They say they're sorry about what happened before, and they want to be friends now. And Sam and Kat accept this. Later in the day, the girls, Dice and Goomer, watch TV. But in the background, the Brit Brats sneak in and try to cause mischief. The girls take crumbs from Kat's bibble and spread it over Sam's bed, as they also find a half-eaten chicken wing. They then steal back their can of bibble and flee through a window. Later, Sam begins preparing dinner for them, a pack of canned ham that she found on the street. Kat says she'll skip the canned ham as she has a bucket of bibble to get to. As she rushes back, we hear her scream through stock audio that is clearly not Ariana Grande, and the accusations begin. You stole my bibble! No, I didn't! Then why are there all these little bibble bits all around your pillow? <laughs> oh god, that was a toenail! Soon enough, it's a full-out brawl, the worst fight they've had so far, much to the joy of the two little girls. The Bird Brats come back in the night, with one of them painting Cat's hand pink, while the other spray paints Sam motorcycle the same shade. When they wake up, Cat tells Sam through cue cards that they are not on speaking terms. Sam says them fighting is stupid until she sees her bright pink bike and goes into a screaming fit directed at Cat. Sam says that when she's this violently angry, her parole officer told her to deal with it in a healthy way, by finding a parking meter and ripping it out of the ground. Later, we see that Sam has gone to Dyson Goomer to vent, and that she's brought the parking meter with her. We're good for an hour. Kat takes Nona to bots to vent as well, but Nona is distracted that Kat even has Bibble at all. She reminds Kat that about a year ago, she bought so much Bibble that she ran out of money and then pawned all of Nona's jewelry to buy more. Kat reminds Nona that she forgave her in group therapy and to let it go. This exchange very subtly sets into established canon that the final run of Victorious episodes, when the characters were meant to be juniors, did indeed happen one year ago, seemingly meaning that Cat should be a senior now. Sam eventually begins wondering why Cat would do this to her motorcycle and who stole her bibble. Goomer offhandedly says that it was probably those two British girls again. Nona then also guesses the plot off the top of her head and then exclaims that her food is so spicy that it feels like her mouth is on fire. The automated staff think she's actually on fire, and they Peter Cushing Daleks exterminate her. The two girls make up, and Sam comes up with a clever way to get back at them. They stage a fight bigger than any they've ever had, with it sounding like Sam is beating Cat to death. They then hear a loud noise and run into the room to see the shovemucker impaled clear through Cat's head. Help me get her out of here before the cops get here. This is your fault, Gwen. No, it isn't. You promised that no one would die this time. One of 
of the girls goes off to tell, and the other begins wrestling her, saying they can't tell anyone about the murder, or they'll be implicated. Sam and Cat realize they should call someone so they don't hurt each other, and walk towards the phone as slow as possible. The most intense episodes of Sam and Cat would be the most tame episodes of iCarly or Victorious, but I did like this one being a little bit extra. I mean, it starts off so boring and typical, just your average Disney Channel schlock, and then you find out the two nine-year-olds have committed manslaughter before. I love it! At the start of episode 12, Sam announces she was able to scrub all of the pink paint off of her motorcycle. But Cat says they have bigger problems, as she needs to feed the baby they're watching, but can't find the nipple. The baby's mom picks him up, but finds he's wearing a trash bag, as Sam says she's been using all of their baby diapers to polish her motorcycle. Don't worry, the box says each bag holds at least 10 gallons, so you probably won't have to change them for a couple days. <laughs> what? It turns out that Goomer has a big MMA fight that night, but sadly Kat can't go. She's been dedicating all of her time to the babysitting service, but she has a test the next day at school. Dice gives her something she's requested, a drug from a foreign country that is supposed to help her focus and study. Dice, Goomer, and Sam come home to find the living room a total wreck. Sam's motorcycle is missing, Cat is passed out with her hair partially dyed blue, and with a little person who doesn't speak English handcuffed to her. We find out that the special medicine was supposed to be taken in small doses, with just a teaspoon added to a cup of water. Instead, Cat drank the entire bottle, and in a few hours had a blackout adventure. Wow, this is just like that movie, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Nona texts a photo to Cat of both of them with blue hair, and they deduce she might know what's going on, and they rush to see her. But first they handcuff the little person to a door and give him olives for food and a trash bag in case he has to go to the bathroom. At the old person home, they find that the center is doing their biannual hair coloring day, where a special team comes to give everyone unique hairdos. The event is called Everybody Dies. Isn't that cute? Nope, it's weird. I find it disturbing. In a flashback, we see that Kat ran to Elderly Acres after overdosing, and asked Nona to drive her to an MMA fight on Sam's motorcycle. Nona said that she can't drive a motorcycle, although a green-haired man at the residence said that he could drive her, and would if she agreed to get him a burger and fries at Bots. Sam and Kat run off to investigate, but Goomer and Dice have decided to have their hair done as well, and promise to catch up later. Kat gets distracted by this, and Sam tells her to concentrate on finding her bike, because if they can't find her bike, everybody dies. The two of them go to bots and get a robot to show detailed security footage of what happened when Kat was there. Kat came in, and immediately ran into the Skull Crusher, who Goomer defeated in the ring a few episodes ago. The Skull Crusher wanted revenge against Sam for hitting him in the ring, and he took the keys to her bike. Kat attacked him in the parking lot trying to save Sam's bike, and even though she failed, she did manage to steal his friend in the process, explaining why she was handcuffed to him. <laughs> Sam, Cat, Dice, and Goomer take the foreign little person to the back alley, where they exchange Sam's bike for him. The trade-off goes well, but Sam decides to beat his ass anyways for the trouble he's put them through, and she instructs Dice, Goomer, and Cat to head home with the bike and Skull Crusher's friend, as she and Cat have decided to keep him indefinitely chained up in their home as they make him do stuff for them. Slavery! So at the start of Season 1, Episode 13, Sam questions Kat over why there's a locked safe in her closet. Kat says it was there when Nona moved in a year ago, and it's a bit of a mystery what's inside. Kat, meanwhile, is working on a project for class where she's supposed to record a video to send to her future self. She'll then watch the video in 10 years, which I figure will be about 420 days from when I'm posting this. After the credits, Dice runs in and interrupts Kat's video, saying he has a problem. His mother and aunt are heading to a puzzle convention, and his mom is making him go, something he's not looking forward to as his aunt grosses him out. Dice's mom says he's not old enough to be left alone, despite being 12 and a half, and Kat chimes in that he won't really be a man until he goes through puppetry. Dice asks if she means puberty, and she says that's disgusting. Sam comes in and suggests the obvious solution to Dice's dice lemma. He can stay with them, 
because they are babysitters. Dice comes by the next day and announces that his mom is on the road, and he says he'll be back around midnight to hang out. The girls ask what's up, and he says he was invited to a poker game by a bunch of frat guys, and he has a good chance to make a ton of money. Sam and Cad, once claiming to just be his cool older friends, suddenly insist upon boundaries, as they don't want him going out alone. So the girls sit with Dice in their bedroom, as Cat records her time capsule, and Dice plays with a toy saxophone. Eventually, Sam finally is able to open the safe, and finds that it's not a safe at all, but a passageway to a hidden room, which is filled with old food, water, and rope. So you guys got food and water in there? Yeah, why? See ya! <laughs> Sadly, the girls do not have their cell phones, and they spend a bunch of time contained inside, eating very old fruit and peeing in empty jars. Cat suddenly has another food idea, a sequel to hot burgers, if you will. What if someone made Sloppy Joes, but served them between two waffles? Sam says they must survive and get to the outside to accomplish two things kill dice, and eat sloppy waffles. Eventually, Goomer shows up, but thinks the house is haunted and that Sam and Cat are now ghosts. A misunderstanding ensues where it sounds like Cat has killed Sam, and Goomer says he always figured it would happen the other way round. They eventually coach him to the safe, and he opens it. He announces he's brought chicken pucks and throws one directly into Cat's nose. Goomer has the address where Dice is currently at, and the trio go off to confront him. They then find that he is not at an adult poker game, but a little girl's birthday party, where he is performing as a dancer that all of the kids swoon over. After being sucked into a hormonal vortex, Dice is rushed home by Sam and Cat, who confront him over what's happened. Dice explains that his mom's laptop recently broke, and for her birthday, he wanted to buy her a new one but he doesn't have the money. And sometimes, when he needs cash, he dances for money. Sam says he doesn't have to put on the red tights anymore, because they will lend him the cash. Yes, that's really the dialogue. They then lock him in the safe with the pee jar and cook sloppy waffles. Cat points out that they totally neglected to finish the school project B-plot, but they shrug it off. At the start of episode 14, Sam and Cat are visiting elderly acres when Sam saves an old man from being run over by a runaway scooter. The man's daughter is grateful, and Nona happily says that Cat also runs a babysitting service. Service, and she suggests the woman hire them as a thank you. Alas, the woman says, her son, Oscar, can't be trusted to a babysitter as he is ridiculously clumsy and prone to injury, causing the old man to add that he is a massive disappointment. Eventually, they do end up convincing the woman, and the old man offers Cat a hundred dollars for saving his life. She says she can't accept that, so Sam does instead. After the credits, we cut to quite a depressing sight, as Oscar is on the ground, eating bland spaghetti, by hand. Cat is restless and tells Sam that they need to take Oscar out to have a good time, but Sam reminds her that this is the direct opposite of what Oscar's mother instructed. We find out that Oscar doesn't use forks because he once stabbed himself in the neck with one, he avoids chairs and tables because they have pointy edges, and he's prone to choking so his mother only feeds him wet noodles as they are a chokeless food. When Oscar goes to the bathroom without the girls, he slips and somehow gets his head stuck in the toilet a timely illustration of the predicaments that he is quite prone to. Sam finds this hilarious and flushes the toilet while he's stuck. Meanwhile, at the gym, Dice is waiting on Goomer and gives some training advice to another fighter while he waits. Goomer sees this and accuses Dice of cheating on him by training another man. You can already guess the rest of this joke, it's... It's just that a, a bunch of other times. Sam and Cat come into the gym and they bring Scott the Waz with them. I'm a boy. <laughs> Congrats, man. Scott suddenly gets excited when he sees a gumball machine as he explains that he's so sheltered he's never seen one in person. I've heard about gum like this. In ball form. Cat gives him money to get a gumball, but it rolls under a bench. Scott goes to get it, but a muscular gym member sits on the bench and it collapses over him. Later, at BOTS, we see that Sammy Classic Sonic fan is now wearing protective gear, but Sam promises that nothing dangerous can happen at BOTS. After this, three spear fishermen come in and decide to bring their spear guns in with them. 
Another person announces that his hand-sized poisonous pet tarantula has gone missing and is presumably out at the restaurant. We sit in anticipation of which of these two things will befall Sammy first before he instead gets sprayed with nacho cheese by one of the robots. Back at the house, Scott slash Sammy slash Oscar heals from his burns, and says it's truly for the best if he just sits in a room for the rest of his life, as it's the only way to avoid being hurt. Cat says this mentality just won't do, and asks if he likes any sports causing him to say that he likes watching golf on TV. The girls enlist Dyson Coomer to help him to the local putting ground, where he is hit in the face by three different golf clubs while trying to get water. Sammy's mom comes to pick him up and is infuriated that they disobeyed her instructions to have him sit on the floor for 10 hours eating wet noodles with his hands. She says that she knows how he has to live, and that they didn't have authority to question her judgment. As a storm brews outside, Sammy stands up to his mother, telling her she needs to apologize to Sam and Cat, and that if he lives the way she wants him to, his fantasies can never be quenched. He adds that she needs to realize that her actions have consequences, and if she doesn't like that, she can get the frick out. As his final argument, he says that even if he hurt himself today, even if he was bruised or burned or broken, it was the happiest day of his life because he got to live a little. And he's still standing there, he's still alive, and he has his own golf club, which he thrusts into the air, causing a lightning bolt to strike him over and over again as he holds it in place and we fade to black. He is dead now. This episode is called Hashtag Oscar the Ouch. It's obvious they came up with the title first, and then wrote an episode around it. It contributes nothing else. The plot to this episode is that a family is abusing a child that they don't love because he has bad luck. So Sam and Cat tried to show him that he can still be happy. And because they do this, he dies. Haha, ha, good one. Okay, so now that we've gotten as far as the 15th episode of Sam and Cat, I think it's just about time for a change in scenery. Yes, welcome everyone to my Halloween set. I, uh, I used to enjoy dressing up my set for Halloween themed videos, uh, but now I don't get to make seasonal content because all of my videos take 10 months to make and I have four mental breakdowns making each one. So instead I, uh, I funnel that inspiration into making temporary pop-up sets whenever we have a nice little seasonal episode to review. Now, uh, last time I went ahead and did this, it was kind of a big embarrassment because it turns out Victorious doesn't even have a Halloween special, but uh, this time things are different because Sam and Cat has an authentic, undeniable Halloween episode. So let's talk about Season 1, Episode 15, Hashtag Doll Sitting. We open at Bots, which is decked out in festive decorations of the season. Sam calls the red robot over and complains that her dessert was disgusting, and she wants it taken off her bill. The bot responds that she ate all of it and is licking the plate, and she says that she's still processing her pain. The robot says it doesn't understand pain, so Sam breaks one of its fingers, and it says it now understands. After this, Cat comes galloping in, wearing her Halloween costume. The Genie from I I dream of Genie. I'm sure the kids at home are gonna love that one. Cat announces that she decided to start trick-or-treating early in the girls' bathroom, bragging that she got a roll of toilet paper and some dental floss. Cat says they have to rush home so Sam can get into her outfit, and also because they have a brief babysitting gig. Sam complains this is bogus, as it's Halloween and Saturday, and they should have the day off. And now, for everyone's favorite recurring segment, Quentin puts too much thought into things. In this episode, it is explicitly stated that it is both Halloween and Saturday. However, this gets confusing when you take into account that Halloween did not fall on a Saturday in 2013. In fact, so far in the millennium, 2009, 2015, and 2020 have been the only years so far where Halloween has fallen on a Saturday, and 2026 is the only year where it's going to happen in this decade. So, 
what the hell is happening? What year is Sam and Cat actually set in? I do like the idea of just retconning that Sam and Cat takes place four years into our own future because it implies that iCarly retroactively is contemporary to current events. And there's something so funny about looking at a show that in every single way just screams 2007, 2007, 2007, and being like, oh, that's happening right now. Then there's 2015, which feels a lot more likely because Sam and Cat being set just slightly into its own future kind of accounts for a lot of the quirks of the series, like the cafe run by robots, for instance. And of course, you have to consider what seems to be the least likely, which is that Sam and Cat takes place in 2009. And like, come on. The idea that the iCarly franchise is stuck in the past, that's just ridiculous. My personal theory at this stage is that due to the shifting time scale and continuous time loop, uh, at some point, the NSU probably did like a bunch of leap years in a row by accident. Uh, so it's still set in 2013 but the calendar is really, really fucked up. This entire segment has been nothing but an excuse to film slightly more on the Halloween set. Do 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 Look at all that spooky content. Yeah, look look at all that. It Look at all that. It, it, it's crazy. It's zany. It's out there. Speaking of which, this episode features one of my favorite tropes in the world of TV. An intro sequence which is slightly altered to appear more Halloween-y. However, in this instance, it's kind of weird because there's no new material made for this. It's all just gimp shop and filters and that kind of thing. Sometimes there's a lightning bolt with thunder dubbed in, but it's still over the same shitty song, so I don't know what atmosphere they think they're building. After this is done with, we see the outfit Cat has picked out for Sam, and surprise, Sam is going as Cat for Halloween, much to her dismay. The thing that surprises me most about this sequence is that it seems like they gave Jim a shitty fake tan to make this joke work better, which is just strange because these days it feels like pointing out that Ariana Grande isn't naturally that shade is like some kind of edgy joke in the pop world. Like it's something that you would only bring up or point out if you want to be on her bad side. So it's weird to think that like back in 2013, no one gave a shit. It was just like, yeah, she has a tan. Who gives a shit? There's a ring at the doorbell, and a large, foreboding, European man enters, saying he's brought his daughter for the pair to watch over for the day. He goes into the hall, and brings back an American girl doll. Is it... is it weird that I know the brand? The mysterious man asks them to take care of Clarisse, then makes his leave as his pocket watch chimes. The girls are stunned at this exchange, but since he's paying double because it's a holiday, they ultimately decide they don't mind. Cat continues the evening as previously planned, as she has prepped a series of All Hallows activities for the kid. Sam mocks her for this, reminding Cat that Clarisse is just a doll, just as Dice suddenly bursts in through the front door, bringing gifts for all. For Cat, he brings a genie lamp and a spell book to complete her outfit, and for Sam, he has brought a pack of super puckers, stated to be candy so impossibly sour that they're illegal in the United States, although Dice knows a guy. Sam plans to give these out to children just to see the look on their stupid faces. However, Dice has left the candy at his place. Before he goes to get it, Cat insists on trying one of the spells from her new book and is extremely disappointed when nothing happens. Sam tells Cat that her plan for the night is the same plan she's done every year since she was nine. She's going to empty out a pumpkin, fill it with chili, eat the chili, and then unbutton her pants and watch TV on the couch. Oh, Sam. <laughs> You're so damaged. We hear a knock at the door as Dice has apparently come back with the candy, but when Cat opens it, we see that Cat's spell actually worked. Dice is now a monkey. Cat fully believes that her transformative magic book has come through in the end. And Sam goes on a tirade, telling her that magic isn't real, spell books don't work, and little dolls can't carve pumpkins. Just as we see that Clarice has indeed carved a pumpkin and is still holding the knife. Sam cautiously takes the knife away and tries to figure out what's going on. She calls Dice so he can tell Cat that he isn't a monkey, but the monkey is then seen holding Dice's phone. He also shits in Sam's bed, so, so yep, 
Uh, that, that's dice, all right. As Monkey Dice runs away, the girls hear a scream and run into the living room to see that it's just an old horror movie on TV. When they suddenly wonder who turned on the TV, they see Clarice is seated and enjoying the show. As the girls freak out, the doll responds with a grimly smile. Clarice's father comes to pick her back up, but comes up with a sudden addendum. If the girls want to earn more money, there is a Del DeVille concert that night, which he has three tickets. To. If they take Clarice and take a photo of her enjoying the concert, he'll pay them for the whole night and they can get into the concert for free. The girls are a big fan of Del DeVille and agree to the plan. They go to the concert and Del DeVille is apparently both the lead singer and the band name. If you want to know what the music in this segment sounds like, imagine every Maroon 5 song ever recorded playing at once. Halfway through the song, Del suddenly stops and insists a spotlight be put on the three girls. He's spooked beyond belief and identifies Clarice as his stalker, saying that every time he does a concert, that doll manages to be in the audience somewhere. Del calls security to kick the three girls out as the audience of teenagers boo them for even coming. The girls come home and find that Dice the human is sorting through his candy, just as the monkey races back into the room. Dice explains that the monkey is actually his aunt's service animal. I didn't show this earlier, but back when Goomer's mom showed up, there was a bonus credit scene of Dice taking care of his aunt, who had broken arms. So her having a service animal is actually consistent with that established continuity, which I didn't bring up because it seemed stupid at the time. I haven't seen my family in months. Cat is disappointed that her spell didn't work after all, and Sam tells her there's no magic in this world. After this, Clarissa's father returns, and Cat snaps at him, telling him to stop talking to his doll because she isn't alive, and it freaks everybody out. The old man can tell he isn't wanted, and asks his daughter to join him. In the doll's place, we suddenly see a little girl glowing with the ember of a spell cast at midnight. The girl thanks Sam and Cat for a wonderful wonderful night, and the father wishes them a happy Halloween, as they walk out the door and down the hallway. Sam quips, Who uses a pocket watch? As the funny sitcom music plays. So here's the big problem with this episode. I think we can all agree that fundamentally what has just happened deserves to go on the list. But what exactly are we going to write down? Because I'm tempted to write down living dolls, but in a major way that seems already covered by living puppets. So I think I'm just going to write down magic. That's the most unique thing that this episode contributes to the universe, because, like, we've had heaven, we get metahumans, we get time travel, but, but, but so few episodes in this expanded universe have the gall to just look at the audience and say, hey, magic is real. Fuck you. Okay, let's go ahead and clap back. So we've seen a lot in this project so far. Throwbacks to the past, hints of what will come in the future. But this next one is interesting because it's actually a little bit of both at the exact same time because this episode not only features a prominent guest appearance by a former Nickelodeon star of the 1990s, but it's also pretty much an accidental backdoor pilot to the series that would ultimately replace Sam and Cat. So let's talk about Season 1, Episode 16, Hashtag PZB. So at the start of the episode, Sam and Kat are getting into their typical mutually exclusive antics. Sam has invented a new game where she blows golf balls out of her mouth onto the table to see where it lands, and she's covered the table in peanut butter so it will all stick. Kat comes out wearing a brand new bedazzled outfit and says she's heading out, as she has an audition as a background dancer in a PZB music video. Sam reacts strongly to this, as she's a big fan of PZB and has pirated many of his songs. However, Sam is not a fan of being left in charge of the kid they're babysitting, who she claims is a nightmare despite us seeing that he's just an obedient Bible nerd. But Kat reminds Sam that they're supposed to be friends and that this 
PZB gig is important to her, so Sam should let her go. The blonde relents, allowing Kat to go as long as she has peas sign her golf ball. Kat says it has peanut butter on it, and Sam licks it off. Oh, Sam! Get help. Later on, Kat comes running into bots crying, saying that the audition went terribly. PZB was extremely rude, said that her hair color doesn't look natural, that she dances like a squirrel, and that her hat that says hat is stupid. Worse yet, he squished the golf ball Sam sent along. Sam is enraged and tells a robot waiter to bring her a pound of butter and one sock. But the robot says they do not have socks, so Sam will have to go along without one. We jump cut to PZB. PZB and his hype squad, who laugh uncontrollably at an incredibly stale anecdote he is telling. And surprise, the egotistical Pease is played by none other than Kel Mitchell, the previously established star of such Nick projects as All That, Good Burger, and Keenan and Kel. There's another connection here that you've probably caught on to already, but we'll talk about that near the end. Sam bursts into Pease's office and pushes his bodyguard Bunny to the side, hitting Pease with his own fruit and breaking his stuff. Pease ultimately says that he is impressed and that Sam has swag and spunk. You got that swag and spunk. How censored do you think this episode was in the UK? PZB says he wants Sam to be his new assistant, but Sam says she isn't interested until she's told that she'll be paid $5,000 a week, at which point she's on board. I got swaggy spunk! Yeah! Meanwhile, Kat is overwhelmed, trying to babysit on her own. Incidentally, the three kids Kat is seen watching here are the same kids that she babysat in the pilot episode and in hashtag new goat, something that I'm disappointed to say I noticed immediately. Sam comes home and the kids immediately immediately start behaving, as their fear of her apparently keeps them in line. Sam announces that she now works full-time for PZB, and Kat says that she needs to focus on babysitting. Sam reminds Kat that this morning, Kat said it was fine to leave Sam to babysit alone because they were friends, so surely the same conditions apply here. Besides, Sam says, PZ said he would teach Sam all about the music business and how to meet famous people. Some Think she'll never get from hanging out with Ariana Grande. But, Sam says, if her quitting and spending all of her time at the babysitting service is what Kat wants, she'll do it. Kat says that is what she wants, and Sam bails from the conversation, heading to work with Peasy. Afterwards, one of the pilot episode kids comes back with a clump of hair, with Kat explaining that that is their soap, as Sam is a very hairy girl. Okay. A few days later, we see Kat struggle over the control of kids she's supposed to be watching, while Sam sits in on a PZ recording. PZB's name is probably a play on Easy e but in every other way, he's based on Kanye West, especially during the musical performance, where Kel is channeling West very diligently. Uh, you live in the Ironically, PZB is also obsessed with Kanye and sees him tweet that he has five piranha fish. He notes that he only has four and he needs Sam to go out and get him two more, despite it already being very late. Bunny makes a sarcastic comment directed at Sam, so she takes his hamburger and throws it into the fish tank, where the fish eat it in a very believable special effect. Goomer and Dice head over to the apartment to help Kat with her babysitting workload, but find the place a wreck and Kat duct taped to a broom. The two are committed to helping Kat out until they get a text from Sam, who is recruiting them to help her find a place to buy piranhas for PZB. They swiftly abandon Kat, broom and all, as this new side quest seems way more fun. Hours later, Sam finally makes it home to find things surprisingly calm. We soon find out why, as Kat has outsourced a new babysitting partner, Mindy, who loves kids and is helping take care of the boys that they're looking after. Sam does not take this well, saying she's been working my butt off all day and night, and then I just, I come home to find you here with another girl? What did you expect? You work all the time and I have needs. Ugh. 
Sam wants Mindy gone and does a special Vulcan pinch on her elbow, knocking her out. Cat begins crying, and Sam tries to reconcile things, just as Peasy cramers through the front door. He has just found out about a rare animal called a tree biscuit, which lives in Acapulco. He wants one, so they're going to Acapulco to get one, and Sam has to come along. Cat tells Sam to go, accepting that their friendship is essentially over due to Sam now living in a whole other world. But in a surprising twist, Sam tells Peasy that she quits, causing him to start crying as he says that she's the best assistant he's ever had. Sam reminds Peas about Bunny, but Peas says that Bunny is no good. Dang, Peas, that hurt. Peasy says that now he needs a new assistant, and Cat volunteers Mindy, who is still knocked out in the kitchen. Bunny picks Mindy up and carries her out of the apartment, taking her abroad without her consent. Afterwards, the two rambunctious boys run back into the kitchen, and Sam knocks them out like she did Mindy. And scene. This episode was originally broadcast in September 2013. Within one year, Sam and Cat would be no more, with production long halted and unbroadcast episodes since depleted. That winter, a new show would be announced by Nickelodeon, the infamous Game Shakers, which began airing in September 2015. In Game Shakers, Kel Mitchell plays Double G, a famous rap artist prone to a sporadic and chaotic lifestyle intended to be a satire of Kanye West. Double G and PZB are, and I hope this is not a controversial take, the exact same character aside from the name change. The weirdest part is that in Sam and Cat, PZB's bodyguard and sidekick is a large man named Bunny. Meanwhile, in Game Shakers, Double G has an identical sidekick bodyguard played by the same actor who is also named Bunny. I figure that Peasy's name change was done to mark a distinction between the two incarnations of this character, giving Game Shakers more of a clean slate, despite how much it warps the NSU continuum like hickory wood left out in the rain. Now, I know that when I make theories about cross-show discrepancies, I have a tendency to hop directly to universe hopping and quantum superpositions, but my personal theory about this issue is that PZB and Double G are actually the same guy? If this character is meant to be a Kanye parody, then it's not a stretch to imagine him sporadically changing what alias he wants to be known as, as Yi has been known to do this in the past. But even if I'm wrong, at the very least, Bunny seems to be the same character in both shows, as this is even the belief of his performer, Bubba Ganter. What this ultimately means is that both Henry Danger and Game Shakers can confidently source a significant amount of their personal DNA all the way back to Sam and Cat. A very interesting story. But incidentally, it's worth pondering. Where does Sam and Cat get its own source DNA from? Well, Sam and Cat is heavily inspired by odd couple sitcoms of the olden days of TV, specifically the 1970s and 1980s. And this next episode is specifically designed to explore that. <gasps> oh fuck. Because this next episode of Sam and Cat also features extended cameos by actors known for older sitcoms, but not Nickelodeon sitcoms. Instead, this episode features Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams, known to older viewers as Laverne and Shirley. Yes, they really did do a Laverne and Shirley reunion special in the middle of Sam and Cat's first season. But here's the issue. I have watched a lot of sitcoms in my time, but not really sitcoms that old. And I don't really have context for what I'm supposed to be seeing here. So what I need is someone who was there at the time who actually watched Laverne and Shirley and can kind of cue me into what I'm supposed to be seeing here. And I think I know just the person. 
Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to my parents' house. I'm here with my father, Russ Reviews. Hey. And uh, I thought it would be fun if me and him, as father and son, sat down to watch this episode of Sam and Cat. Um, so dad, tell me everything I need to know about Laverne and Shirley. Well, it all started in 1974, when I was just four years old. That's when the world was introduced to a show called Happy Days. Now, you may remember Happy Days for the Fonz, but the show wasn't originally about the Fonz. It was about Richie and his friends and family, which included an older brother named Chuck. Now, once they figured out that the Fonz was the star, they wrote Chuck out, and by the end of the series... When it became obvious the Fonz was the most popular character, they made him the main character. Kind of like the Urkel of the 1970s. The Cunninghams even rented him an apartment they had over their garage, so he could be in as many scenes as possible. Now the Fonz got up to a lot of hijinks, and as the show went along, they got more cartoony. Now in season 5, the Fonz got really good at water skiing, so he decided to jump the shark. Literally. I mean, there was a shark in the water, and the Fonz jumped over it. So to this day, people still say, when a show has passed its peak, it has jumped a shark. So Robin Williams played an alien named Mork, who was going to abduct Richie, and had to be stopped by the Fonz. It turned out all to be a dream. But people, of course, loved Robin Williams because he was a comic genius. So they decided to retcon it so it wasn't actually a dream, and even reshot the ending for syndication. And that's where you get the spin-off, Mork and Mindy. Now Laverne and Shirley were two women that the Fonz had in his little black book, and in 1975 he went on a double date with them. Then they got their own show too, which was called Laverne and Shirley, which was also set in the fictional city of Milwaukee. And I mean all the characters from Laverne and Shirley moved to California, including Carmine and Lenny and Squiggy. And the actress that played Shirley left the series by the end, so we jokingly called it Laverne or just Laverne without Shirley. Incidentally, Happy Days itself was a spinoff of a show called Love, American Style, a show which I know absolutely nothing about other than the theme song, which was the cue to change the channel. In short, Laverne and Shirley ran for eight seasons, was a pretty good sitcom, and got an animated spinoff with a pig. Oh, fascinating. Um, okay, so, so with that out of the way, let's watch Sam and Cat Season 1, Episode 17, Hashtag Salmon Cat, the official Laverne and Shirley reunion special. I gotta go set that up now. So at the start of the episode, Sam and Cat are up to their typical babysitting pre-title antics, when there's suddenly a ring at the door. They open it and are greeted by a shady lawyer type, who serves them with a cease and desist. He explains that he represents the intellectual property of Salmon Cat, a popular children's TV show that was on in the 1970s about an aquatic feline amalgam. Salmon Cat was aimed at children, and so is Salmon Cat, so Salmon Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time Babysitting Service will have to find a new name. Cat tries to find a solution with words, but Sam has other ideas, and begins hitting the lawyer with tennis balls. After this, we are treated to a very unique version of the opening title sequence. Okay. That's the Laverne and Shirley open. Oh, okay, so they've recreated the... Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Schlemiel, Schlemizel, Hassan, Pepper, 
Incorporated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Shamil, Shamazel, Hossafat for Incorporated. Oh, and it's the the pear pad or whatever it was called. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the worst opening sequences ever. But it's funny. It's on the the pear pad. It's a good guy. I just think you're you're right. It's hilarious because it's it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're you're obviously not getting all of the video. Exactly. Right. Exactly. After the titles, we see Sam, Cat, Nona, and Dice at Bots discussing what's happened. Nona says not to worry about what's going on because lawyers like to talk a lot of fluff, but she admits it's not really something she's totally sure about. Hello! Are you enjoying your foods? Mm, yes, great. thank you. Uh, these are the robots. They have a robot restaurant in Sam and Cat, and you know, that's really interesting. It's really interesting that there's a, a restaurant in this show that has robots because Sam and Cat is kind of a transitional show because you've got iCarly, right? iCarly has a very grounded universe, and then you have the world of Henry Danger. And that's what's going on there. Okay. Dai says to the red robot that he never got served his curly fries, causing the blue robot to chime in that he is exceptionally talented at forgetting things, as he also forgot her birthday. Red requests that they not do this in front of the humans, causing Sam to think that they're dating. Red says that she isn't his type, causing blue to reply, I was your type at the Christmas party. That was one time! <laughs> As the quarreling androids slide away, Nona says she has to go to the airport as she's headed to Mexico for bikinis, finger painting, and hot peppers. The girls come home to the apartment but find it taped off by the police. It turns out that the lawyer from before went to a judge, and the judge ordered that the workspace of Sam and Cat's Super Rock and Fun Time babysitting service be closed off until the dispute is finished. Sam suggests they might sneak past the police and break in anyways, at which point the police officer guarding the door indicates that he would respond to this by tasing them. In his holster, he finds a banana, as we discover that Sam has stolen his taser. They do a tense trade-off, and the girls end up camping out in the hallway of the apartment building. During the night, Sam finds a pair of boys' underwear in the bushes and puts it on the sleeping officer's head. Suddenly, Kat has a breakthrough after hours of researching. She discovers that they can keep using the name Sam and Cat if they get permission from the creators of Sam and Cat, and that said creators, Sylvia Burke and Janice Dobbins, still live in Los Angeles. Thank you, Internet, for destroying everybody's privacy! So the next day, Cat goes to Feeney Villas to see Janice, while Sam heads to DeFazio Apartments to see Sylvia. The big reveal here is that Janice is played by Cindy Williams, while Sylvia is played by the late Penny Marshall, together best known as Laverne and Shirley. Now, the reason these two were singled out for a guest episode is that when the writers were first conceptualizing Sam and Cat as a spin-off, Laverne and Shirley supposedly remained their biggest source of inspiration and imitation. The cast also supposedly heavily pulled from the 1976 sitcom, as Ariana Grande once claimed in an interview that if she had trouble delivering a specific line, she would ask herself, what would Cindy do? What are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? Landing the plane. You got it. <laughs> Goodbye, Laverne. <laughs> Talk about that later. Sure. So the gimmick of this episode is that Kat is sent off to meet a much more concentrated version of herself, but 40 years older, while Sam does much of the same. So Cindy Williams plays Janice Dobbins because she was Shirley Finney who inspired Kat Valentine, while Penny Marshall plays Sylvia Burke because she was Laverne DeFazio who partially inspired Sam Puckett, but not Sam Malone. It's not confusing at all. You're just stupid. Kat tries to talk to Janice about the copyright dispute, but Sylvia's mind has a tendency to float to other topics. And she begins telling Kat all about her sports balls. She explains that she has an obsession with sports played with balls, and has taken pride in collecting one ball for each sports ball in the world, each signed by a famous sports ball player. 
Sam's attempt to stay on track also fails, as Sylvia has a vindictive and obsessive personality, as we learn that she has a microphone and speaker system installed at her apartment, which loudly projects her will onto any other person in the complex annoying her, especially barking dogs. Sam and Cat both separately pry, but discover that neither woman wants to talk about Sam and Cat, as they have long stopped speaking to each other due to a dispute they had a long time ago. We find out that Sam and Cat fell apart due to a notorious piece of drama surrounding an award show. The program beat out Sesame Street for an award and excellence in children's programming, but they were only given one statue. The two got into a fight over who would take it home, and in the process, it split down the middle. Since then, they have rarely spoken on kind terms. Both women separately make it clear that the only condition that they would ever see each other again is causing violence to each other. This overwhelms both of the girls, and they both run off. They reconvene at BOTS, where the Red Robot asks if they want to know about their new pork puffs. The girls say no, and the robot says he'll wait for them to change their minds. Sam suddenly has an idea, and says if the women will only get together to fight, that's exactly what will happen. Cad will tell Janice that Sylvia has challenged her to a fight, and Sam will tell Sylvia that Janice has challenged her to a fight. Kat says that maybe they should just change their names and move to a new apartment, but Sam insists that once the women are together, they'll remember what it was like being friends. They leave, and the blue robot asks Red if they bought the pork puffs. Red says no, and Blue says that now he knows what rejection feels like. I never loved you! Later, Sam and Cat wait at the fighting gym, expecting the women to come in and make peace. However, when they both appear, they are totally prepared for a brawl. From here on, the episode is quite embarrassing from a production standpoint, and remained a funny story to Penny and Cindy for the next few years. We had individual together. scenes with the girls, and then we just had this one physical scene, which I have thought, of course thought, this'll be a cakewalk. I have never felt so old, fat, and winded in my life. I'm on the ground like this, and I'm only on the ground because I can't get up. And she goes, I'll get on top of you like this, and we'll roll. Well, well because we get, we're wider now, and to roll was not... I was holding I on. don't think it's funny. No, they made us box, which is stupid in my opinion. And then we had planned out things that we hadn't done in fighting before, because we've done a lot. Yeah, whether we were slapping or biting a hair, whatever, we've done that. But they put boxing gloves on us, and we had rehearsed so we couldn't a little do bit, anything. A day, half a day or five minutes, whatever it was. Then they, when they were shooting, they said, stop, now punch her right in the face. I said, this is a children's show. I am not going to hit her in the face. I don't think that's correct. No, and you so were right were, in the end. I wasn't thinking of it like that. I was thinking of it as the punch that I gave, like Ron, but you were right about it. Oh! <laughs> but they were very nice, the girls. Um, Everyone was very nice. Yeah. I shouldn't have trusted you. Yeah, you made a mistake. Later, back at the Valentine apartment, the two women are all bandaged up, and sign the contract giving Sam and Cat permission to run their babysitting service. As thanks for this, Cat presents something she bought online, a vintage Salmon Cat plush from the 1970s, which the older women take quite fondly to. However, they can't agree which one of them should get to keep it, and they get into another tugging fight, which ends with Janice flipping onto the couch with Sylvia sitting on her. Cat asks if they're going to grow up to be like the two women, and Sam says she's certain that they will. Okay, that that was it. That was the the whole. That was the the Laverne and Shirley reunion special. What? Give give me your review of that. Like that. Like that. <laughs> Give me a review. <laughs> Seriously, what do you want me to say? No, whatever you want. What do you think of the episode? What do you? I think it was fine. Um, it was weird. Something popped in my head while I was watching it. Laverne always put an L on all of her stuff. 
Oh, okay. it was it was an L, and it just popped in my head, even though they didn't do it in the episode. Oh, okay. And I was expecting Lindy and Squiggy, and I, I misunderstood what was going to happen. It was just Laverne and Shirley. Yes. But I guess that was kind of cool because Penny Marshall died not too long after that. But um, it's weird. I can tell you about episodes of specific episodes of Happy Days, a whole bunch of episodes of Mark and Mindy, and not one episode of Laverne and Shirley. Yeah. Well, except for one. It was the one where they were planning to break into this office. And they you think they've done it, and then you realize they had just thought about it. And you were watching their mind palace, I guess. And yeah. so they actually do it. And nothing works out because nothing that they had planned works in real life. Yeah. But that was it, really. Yeah. Do you want to watch the rest of Sam and Cat with me? Not really. <laughs> no, it's... It's actually not a bad show. I enjoyed the episode, even if it was just... It was silly. Yeah. Well, um... Well, that that was our review of that one. So let's go ahead and move on to Season 1, Episode 18. At the start of the episode, Kat is seen being passive-aggressive while talking with Nona on the phone. Nona has apparently fallen down the stairs at the elderly home and will likely need surgery, but Kat is bored by the conversation and frustrated that it has to continue. While this happens, Dice sneaks in through the side door and uses a flashbang to make Kat think he teleported. Hey, I gotta call you back! Dice has blew himself up! Dice has just got back from Magic Camp and shows Kat one of the tricks he learned. He gives her a magic box, which she sees to be empty, and he tells her to throw some beans at the front door. When he does, she swaps the box with an identical one, which has a rat inside. The power of magic! Dice explains the sleight of hand, and Kat says he isn't magic, He's just a liar. But Dice says he's a magic liar, and they all celebrate. After the opening titles, we see Sam get home after taking a kid they were meant to babysit to the movies. Cat notes that they aren't scheduled to babysit anyone, and we find out this is just some kid Sam grabbed off the street without thinking. She apparently took him to an R-rated slasher, and he says that he's quite disturbed by it. So she throws him out and moves on with her day. Cat tries to duplicate the trick Dice did in front of her, explaining that Sam needs to throw the beans at the door when Cat says Abracadabra. Sam comments, I thought you asked me to stop making fun of your Abra, and Cat grabs at her sides. Get it? Cat has small boobs, that's the joke. Sam throws the beans without looking away, so the trick doesn't work. Sam says you have to be really smart to trick her, and when Kat says that she is smart, Sam spits out the drink in a fit of laughter. Later, at BOTS, Kat vents about this to Goomer and Dice, as Kat mopes that she needs a perfect trick to get one up on Sam. Looking across the restaurant, she suddenly sees two naturally red-headed twin brothers and runs towards them, begging their mother to let her babysit them for the evening. Then Dice and Goomer start talking about curly fries, and a bald man comes in and starts making Three Stooges noises. Goomer says that their ancestors found that hilarious. To make a long story short, Short, Sam comes home with chicken pucks and Kat is with one of the twins in the living room. Kat tells Sam that she shouldn't eat too many pucks because a recent study says it gives people memory loss. Sam goes back to their room and finds the other twin and races back to the living room to ask how the kid got back there so quick, causing Kat to say that the kid they're watching that day hasn't even shown up yet. After this, one of the kids shows up at the door and Sam rushes back to get Kat and Kat takes the kid back to watch over. Then the second kid shows up at the door and Sam starts freaking out, throwing her chicken out the window. Kat then comes back in with the other redhead and celebrates that she finally tricked Sam. Sam decides that she's had enough and wants to fool Kat with a twinscapade of her own. Because, as those dedicated to iCarly lore will know, Sam is, herself, a twin. Because she has an identical sister. And so Sam calls Melanie, reminding her of the twin pact they made when they were five, and she asks her to come to California. Yes indeed, this is the second of our four Ted Danson episodes, with special guest star... Jeanette McCurdy. So the next day, Sam draws a bite mark on her arm and tells Kat that she must have been bit by one of the twins. She says that this is bad because now she has a twin-fection, meaning she will grow her own evil twin. 
Cat calls Sam on her bluff just as Sam goes to meet her sister, hiding in a trash can outside. Sam gets Melanie up to speed and they do complex shots just to show off how advanced Nickelodeon sitcom special effects are now. Melanie dresses up like a deranged maniac and jump scares Cat, tricking her into thinking that Sam really does have a twin sister. Wait. How is this a trick? Melanie jumps through a glass window and stalks the girls to bots, where she jumps down from the ceiling and then kisses Cat on the lips. Man, Melanie is always showing up in these shows and making out with her sister's love interests. Sam learns that her evil twin kissed Cat on the lips, and Sam says this is the same as a twin bite, meaning Cat has a twin faction too. So realistically, what do we believe here? Do we think Sam concocted this stage of the plan, or do you think that Melanie was like, oh, I'm okay with this scheme if I get to kiss Cat on the lips? And Sam went, okay? Sam says a twinfection can be prevented by drinking water made from a dirty sock, and once Cat drinks Sam's dirty sock water, Sam and Melanie reveal their trick and then dance in celebration. This whole episode kind of makes Sam look pathetic in a really lame way. Like, Cat pranking her is actually an accomplishment, but Sam pranking Cat just feels like a low blow. It reminds me of that episode of iCarly where that 40 year old dude joined an elementary school wrestling team just to prove he could beat up a bunch of nine year olds. Like, no one doubted you could do this. You could have just not done it. In the post credits deleted scene, Goomer reacts to meeting Melanie for the first time. Why'd you throw yourself in the trash? Episode 19 is called Hashtag My Poober, and I'm terrified to find out why. At the start of the episode, Sam gets home from shopping to see that Kat has folded all of their money into a man. She says that she asked Kat to count the money. Why would she do that? Why would, why would Sam say to Kat, Kat, please count all of my money. What part of Sam's brain made her think that she should go up to Cat and say, Hey Cat, you seem good at counting money. Anyways, instead Cat has made a man and Sam, frustrated by this, goes to drink a root beer. Cat says if she takes the money man apart to count him, will Sam please stop drinking? And Sam agrees. After the arrangement is finalized, Cat puts on some swazzy music and starts dancing with Bill, saying she has to dance with him at least once before she takes him apart. Sam gets out a big pitcher of root beer and pours it all over herself. After the credits, we learn that Sam and Cat have saved up a lot of money from babysitting. Cat suggests they open a bank account, but Sam said her uncle said never to trust banks because banks get robbed. Cat questions if he was a banker, and Sam said that he robbed banks. Instead, Sam reveals what she bought earlier, a secret safe shaped like a pineapple. The mother of the kid they're supposed to be looking after stops by and makes a decent proposal to the teens. When the little girl was two, her parents gifted her a stuffed animal named Poober, and she became attached to it. As the girl aged, she never grew out of carrying the plush around, despite now being 11. The mother says if Sam and Cat can get the little girl to give up Poober, she will give them an extra bonus of $500. After the parents leave, the little girl accurately predicts that her parents have pulled this stunt again. Cat gets angry at how mean the girl is, but Sam says she reminds her of herself at a younger age. The girl responds that unlike Sam, she's cute, and Sam goes ballistic, mumbling something about giving a prison beat down to the girl. The situation repeats itself at bots as Sam lunges out at the girl for talking back. The little girl pulls up the notes written by Sam's parole officer on the public page of the Seattle Juvenile Detention website. Not how that works. She says that if they try to take Pooper again, she'll call Sam's parole officer and tell him that she used excessive force against an 11 year old causing her to be placed back in juvie. Sam decides they should let her keep the bear. Sam is so violently angry when they make it back to the apartment that Cat tells her to take her baseball bat and go hit on her hitting tree until she feels better. <sighs> you really get me. Cat asks the girl why she carries around Poober, and she says it's a secret. Cat suggests they swap secrets and tells her that the pineapple is fake and has all of their money in it. The 11 year old in turn explains that she's always anxious about meeting new people and finding out if they'll like her or not, but it's never been a problem with Poober 
who's always loved her no matter what. Kat tells her that she needs to have more self-confidence, and the only reason people might think she's weird is that she carries around that bear all day. There's a loud crash in the distance, and Sam comes running in, saying she needs a new hitting tree, and one of their neighbors needs a new car. The little girl agrees to get rid of Poober, and Goomer brings over a rocket he's built, as it turns out that Goomer is really, really into building rockets. Pretty cool, I'll buy it. The girl asks to have a final moment alone with Poober, and while the girls are in the kitchen, Dice mentions that a tree fell on his mom's car. Everyone rushes back to the rocket, and Sam launches it. Just as the girl reveals that she replaced the bear with their pineapple filled with money. Sam decides to get the $500 one way or another, and even threatens to beat on the brat, you know, it's only funny once. Luckily, Goomer's rocket is meant to be reusable, as after launch, it drops a parachute and floats down to the ground. Goomer drives them around in his truck, and we meet Kip, a homeless man that Goomer lets live in the back of his truck so he isn't left out on the street. Kip gives everyone grilled cheese that he's cooked in the back, and Sam figures out that Kat told their fruity secret. Kat says at least she didn't tell Dice that Sam knocked the tree down on his mom's car, and we cut to a transition. The rocket ends up falling into an ancient cemetery, and the gang goes inside to investigate. They find an office staffed by a scared night guard who turns out to be... Jade's roommate from the slap.com? Surprisingly, this is exactly what the episode is going for. As the night guard meticulously explains that he used to live in Seattle, worked as a DJ, and then worked at the Pear Store, and that he then moved to LA, retconning that every character played by this actor in iCarly and Victorious is the same guy for literally no reason. The guy says he saw something fall from the sky and thought it was a ghost, so he shot it with his gun. He drags the rocket out, now flayed with bullet holes, and while the girls check on their money, Goomer mourns the death of his beautiful rocket. The girl says that now they have to take her home, but everyone decides to bail, and they leave the 11-year-old alone in a cemetery with a creepy stranger, singing a song as the episode ends. With that, let's move on to an extremely important episode. Season 1, Episode 20. The intended season finale, if the ordering on the show wasn't so confusing that everyone pretends Season 2 is just the end of Season 1 for simplicity's sake. At the start of the episode, Sam is eating a bunch of meatballs that she found in the fridge before helping out the kid she's watching by pulling his loose tooth. However, she accidentally pulls the wrong tooth and then pulls out the right one afterwards. As the kid leaves, Kat comes home and explains to Sam that they're throwing a party at the end of that week in celebration of the Throbbing Moon, a tri-decade illusion caused by the approach of Jupiter, which causes the moon to look like it's throbbing with light. Kat notes that she's been preparing 45 meatballs for the party, and finds out Sam ate all of them because she needs help. Kat gives up and says she'll do something more basic for the party, but Sam insists that Kat's meatballs are excellent, and that they need to run to the store to get materials to make more. However, as they walk down the street, Kat sees a shoe in a bush, and gives gets extremely excited, saying it's the best shoe ever. She throws her old right shoe into the bushes, saying she doesn't need it anymore. A large hairy man in raggedy clothes walks by, and asks if he can have the shoe that she threw away. This character's name is Herb, and he also appeared briefly in Hashtag Secret Safe. His joke is that every time he shows up, you think that he's a common NSU stereotype of a homeless person, but then he subverts this by explaining that he's actually rather well off. I live in a condo. So? My life's going great. Cool. I'm thinking of buying a new home theater system. Bye. I'm pointing all this out because I think in season 1B he shows up a lot more often. Anyways, Kat is now distracted beyond belief, and decides that the rest of this A-plot is about finding the other pair to this shoe. This episode is supposed to be a representation of the pair's odd couple dynamic. Kat wants the shoe, Sam wants meatballs. Usually I would say that the disorienting tangents on the show are a detriment to watching it, and that either of these topics would make better standalone episodes than both of them being crammed in at the same time, but I do take enjoyment out of finally having an episode that has an honest-to-god A-plot 
plot and B plot, even if for just a brief moment. In the A plot, Cat becomes obsessed with finding the other pair to this shoe, to an extent which is rather unhealthy. Here we see Cat at her most deranged as she snaps at Dice when he suggests she just buy the same pair online. Cat knows that Dice is a man of operations, and she wants him to use every tool at his disposal to find out who made this shoe, who wore it, and why it ended up in the bush that she walked by the other day. Meanwhile, in the B plot, Sam figures out that Nona is the person who taught Cat how to cook meatballs, so she invites Nona over to hang out. Nona gets distracted and begins telling a story about when she lived in Buffalo, New York. She says that at the time she was dating a basketball player named Bob McAdoo, but Sam blows the story off. Bob McAdoo is a real famous basketball player, by the way. This is part of a kind of funny running gag they sometimes do with Nona, where they'll occasionally imply that she's had a really fascinating life, but the teenage girls are too self-centered to ever care to hear the rest of her story. Nona deduces that Sam has just invited her over for food and heads to the door. Sam jumps on her back to try and get her to stay, but Nona manages to get away anyways. Dice and Cat come in and say they've solved the mystery of the shoe thanks to Dice. Cat says if they can find the other shoe, she'll make Sam a million meatballs, and the two girls scream at Dice to get it done, until he becomes overwhelmed, nearly at the point of tears, saying sometimes the girls can be a lot. Eventually, Dice pulls up what he's found. There's a reality TV show filmed in LA called American Pipers, and in a recent episode, they captured footage of a girl on a bicycle running into one of their pipes, causing her shoe to fly off her foot. Upon closer inspection, this girl is none other than Stacy Dilson, one of the supporting protagonists of Zoe 101, who also appeared on iCarly a few times. Dice has found a news article about Stacy, which states that she's now at a hospital in very poor condition. So the team decide they're going to sneak into a hospital and steal a shoe so Cat will make enchiladas or something. Dice quotes a dead guy. I tell ya, get no respect. Okay. I'm not really considering this one of the Ted Danson episodes, first of all, because it feels a little too detached to be a Ted Danson episode. This would be like if Frasier had a special guest episode and it was Annie Tortelletti. You'd be like, who the fuck is Annie Tortelletti? The second reason is that I don't think Zoe 101 fans get anything positive out of post-series cameos. Zoe 101 ended with everyone getting relatively happy endings, and now those characters only show up to dispute said resolutions. Like poor Stacy here got bullied for years for having the speech impediment, and then in the finale, she's cured of it, and then is brought back in iCarly just so she can clarify that the speech impediment came back, and now she's in a coma. Girl can't catch a break. Sam and Cat go through Stacy's belongings in the hospital. Cat studies the girl's feet in a few gratuitous close-up shots. Sam pulls out her bra and scoffs at the size of it, and they eventually find the shoe. But their celebrations are so loud that Stacy wakes back up. Sam fakes her way through pretending to be a nurse, and Cat says that she's Stacy's friend who came to visit. Stacy says she doesn't have many friends these days, and that she doesn't recognize Cat. Pulling her to the side, Cat asks Sam if she should use her real name, and Sam says no. So Cat Cat says that her name is Sam Puckett. Sam notes that this is the only time she's ever gotten her last name right. Stacy notes, in a confused tone, that she doesn't know a Sam Puckett. Here's another example of confusion present at the disarrangement of the meta superposition. You see, in iCarly, whenever Stacy shows up, it's pretty consistently written that she is an iCarly mega fan, someone who watches the show every week and even is the person who kickstarts the shipping war at Webicon. But now that she's in this show, it's very important that she not remember this, because the iCarly web show isn't important to the narrative of Sam and Cat. So she develops an unspoken amnesia about her favorite piece of media, in-universe caused by a head injury, we presume, just to give the writers some slack with continuity. Cat says they know each other because they go to high school together, but Stacy suddenly jerks up, remembering that she doesn't go to high school anymore, as she graduated from Pacific Coast Academy many years ago, and now she's a sophomore at San Francisco State. Stacy catches on that something is wrong, and calls the doctors in to help. Cat is frantic to keep 
her new shoes and jumps through the bottom of a window plane to escape. Sam wishes everyone a happy throbbing moon and jumps through the top of the same window. Later, Dice, Sam, Cat, and Nona lay watching the moon sporadically glow as they eat meatballs. They admit that it's a pretty fantastic night. The moon is beautiful, Sam has her meatballs, Cat has her pink slippers, and Nona decides to cap things off by telling a story about the time she dated Nipsey Russell. And as the kids moan, we fade to black. In an out-of-character post-credits scene, Stacy's actress and Dice's actor play a game called Find the Lego Brick in the Tub of Cold Spaghetti. Kids, if a stranger ever asks you to play Find the Lego Brick in the Tub of Cold Spaghetti while on camera, tell an adult you trust immediately. So, like we did with the first 10 episodes, it's now time for us to discuss the hashtag crimes of this run of episodes. So let's go ahead and get started. Hashtag crime number 91 is Sam yanking a parking meter out of the ground and then taking it with her. According to my research, parking meters can be valued from $250 to $500, meaning that this most likely is applicable to California Penal Code 594, which states that any malicious destruction of government property valued over $100 can result in up to 10 years of prison time and or a fine of $250,000. Now, I don't think this would be typical. These numbers typically serve as a deterrent, and you have to keep into consideration that A, Sam has a criminal record, and B, Sam is somehow still canonically 16 years old, something that becomes less believable with every passing episode, but canonically she's underage, so that affects sentencing and that kind of thing. Hashtag crime number 92 is slavery, because that's pretty much what Sam and Kat do with this person. I also want to tack on here just off of the cuff that I personally believe you could probably get away with calling this a hate crime, because I definitely think you can make the case that the reason Sam and Cat think it's okay to keep a little person against their will is because they don't view him as a human being. Um, so to me, that, that seems like it would be a hate crime. Also, I totally forgot about this in the episode analysis, but Sam, like, takes an old man from an elderly home, and she loses him on Venice Beach, and he's never seen again? Surely that's, like, elderly negligence? Whatever, gut feeling. Hashtag crime number 93. Hashtag crime number 94 is cat loitering around a public bathroom and soliciting for goods. A violation of California Penal Code section 647D. Hashtag crime number 95 is Dice securing super puckers for Sam despite it being directly stated that they are illegal in the United States. Hashtag crime number 96 is Sam knocking out Mindy without her consent. Cause you'd, cause you'd consent to, you'd consent to getting knocked out, you see. This is, what a fucking dumb line. Hashtag crime number 97 is Cat being complicit in PZB slash double G's unlawful kidnapping of Mindy, who was then taken to Acapulco while unconscious. Incidentally, this is also game crime number three. Hashtag crime number 98 is Sam stealing a taser owned by an officer of the law. Hashtag crime number 99 is Sam going ballistic numerous times and launching herself at a girl she's supposed to be babysitting. Now, in episode 19, we find out that Sam has taken to hitting a tree at their apartment complex with a baseball bat to relieve excess anger. This is, by itself, illegal due to California Penal Code sections 384A and 622, as it's illegal to hurt or remove trees on properties which you do not own. Since the complex itself is owned by someone other than Sam, this is hashtag crime number 100. Hashtag crime number 101 would be Sam destroying Dice's mom's car by knocking the tree onto it, and this makes hashtag crime number 102 the group abandoning an 11-year-old in a cemetery with a complete stranger who has a documented history of hitting on underage girls. Finally, and perhaps one of the most deranged crimes so far, hashtag crime number 103 is Sam impersonating a nurse to break into a Los Angeles hospital to steal the shoe of a woman in a coma. That's 103 crimes across 117 episodes in the iCarly Extended Universe. I can't wait to see where the last 15 episodes of Sam and Cat will take us. And one day, I hope to find out.
Very early into working on this stage in the miniseries, I decided that I wanted to split this video in half, like I had previously done with iCarly and then Victorious. This was partially for logistical reasons, like the realization of how long this video would be if I didn't split it down the middle, and also thematic reasons, which I now have to over-explain due to recent events. Sam and Cat is a fascinating show because it's really the story of a bunch of executives putting two women together in a room who had nothing in common. No shared strife, no past experiences, nothing. And then they said, for branding purposes, you two are best friends. Hey look, we paid to put the both of you on the cover of Girls Life magazine. And we say in the magazine that you two are real life besties. So you'd better start acting like real life besties. And over the course of filming, and more specifically during the summer that fell exactly in the middle of their 40 episode production schedule, something significant happened to both of these women. Totally different things that changed their lives in extremely significant ways and really pushed them on even more divergent paths. And the weird thing about this is that to this day, you could argue that neither woman needs or deserves to be in a telling of the other story. And so my vision of the Sam and Cat two-parter has always been that at the end of the first video, we would do a telling of the series coming to a close from the perspective of Ariana Grande. And then at the end of part two, we would do a telling of the end of the series from the perspective of Jeanette McCurdy. And kind of the whole point of this would be pointing out that these two stories are completely tonally dissonant from each other, once again proving that these two women had pretty much nothing in common. Now, an important piece of context on the meta side of things is that I originally intended that I wanted this video to come out on June the 15th, 2022, and then I wanted Sam and Cat Part 2 to come out right about now because I knew it would be topical. But then a bunch of really, really awful stuff happened to me, and I just struggled to do anything for probably about a month and a half. And it was, it, I mean, this has been the worst year of my life, I'm not going to lie to you. That's how bad it is. Like, this has been the worst year of my life. And so working on this project was extremely difficult for me for a very long time. And because of that, this video is late, and I know that there's going to be a lot of people who are frustrated because they're going to allege that this video is clickbait because they clicked on the video expecting content that I was always saving for part two. And if that has happened to you, and if you are unhappy with the turnout of this video, I just want to say, oops. The point is that in this final intermission of Sam and Cat Part 1, I would like to cover a topic that has been inevitable since the beginning. The life and times of Ariana Grande. I think I say it a little bit different each fucking time. Ariana Grande was born on June the 26th, 1993 in Boca Raton, Florida. Her parents were both highly connected in the world of business. Her mother was a CEO at a family-owned manufacturing company, and her father owned a graphic design firm. Her parents divorced when she was very young, but she remained especially close to her maternal grandparents. By the time Ariana was 10 years old, she had starred in a number of local theater productions of musicals like The Wizard of Oz and Annie. And after she gained a professional manager in her early tweens, she landed a prominent role in the Broadway musical 13. During this time, she supposedly sought out the idea of doing an R&B album right then and there, but this was shot down by her managers, who said people weren't likely to buy an R&B album made by a 14-year-old. According to Grande, her choice to accept a lead in a Nickelodeon sitcom was merely her attempt to bide her time until she was old enough to pursue her true passions in life. I've been using phrases like supposedly and according to Grande because I, I take this whole part of the story with a grain of salt. It feels a little bit revisionist to me. I found that adults 
whenever they end up on the track where they're going to be, you know, for the rest of their lives, it becomes convenient for them to pretend that that was always the plan. Because sometimes, even at moments of great success, it's scary to imagine that you stumbled upon your destiny through haphazard circumstance. During this period, Ariana continued to maintain a YouTube channel, where she posted many videos with her friends from 13 and later, Victorious. It was here that she started to experiment with posting music online, through various covers which tended to go viral. The scars of your love remind me of us, they keep me thinking that we could have had it all. The scars of your love, they leave me breathless, I can't help feeling we should have had it all. Rolling in the as she filmed Victorious, Ariana continued to work on music with said manager for a theoretical debut album, and she was ultimately signed by a record label in September 2011. Thus, in December 2011, Ariana's first single dropped to the public. Now, saying this is a little bit controversial these days because, uh, well, let's just say most Ariana fans tend to consider this song non-canonical. Now at this point, I would like to ignore that advice and heavily analyze this song and the music video. However, we have a problem, because Ariana Grande's catalog is heavily protected by copyright. So I don't really have a way to review the material as it was originally intended to be shown. So here is Ariana Grande's debut single, Put your hearts up, playing at 95% speed, on my Shrek CRT TV. Put Your Hearts Up is one of the strangest beats in the story of Ariana's career, mostly because, as I've said earlier, you're really not supposed to recognize that it is the start to her career. Ariana has gone as far as to delist the music video on all official accounts, and she has gone on the record to say that she's quite embarrassed by it, once calling it the worst moment of my life. The song was heavily dictated by Studio Intervention, who wanted Ariana to release music which reflected the persona that she played on TV. In her own words, she stated that the song is bubblegum pop, and she's also added that the song isn't bad, it's just not fitted for her because she is not a bubblegum pop artist. Ariana has also stated in numerous interviews that early into her career, she had some anxieties that her blossoming fanbase would never come to understand that Cat Valentine was just a character. And taking that into consideration, it's easy to understand why she hated this specific song. Put Your Hearts Up feels like a music video by Cat Valentine, not Ariana. Down to the detail that Ariana keeps doing that doe-eyed, surprised by everything face in spite of it not matching the vocals at all? Looking at her origin from this perspective perhaps recontextualizes why Ariana was so heavily non-present in the music of Victorious. Because if she was already facing this immense pop culture identity crisis, Releasing solo music as Cat Valentine was completely against her better interests. Oh, um, real quick, one thing that I almost forgot to mention about this single, uh, it's the He-Man song. Like, you know, like the He-Man meme song. The one that goes like... <laughs> It's that song, and like I'm not exaggerating, they sampled the entire chorus. I think my favorite lyric in this entire thing is when Ariana suddenly says, Wishing on a shooting star in the sky. 
we can do anything if we try. Can't resurrect Gandhi. But if we put our heads together, we can do anything. That is probably my favorite pop song lyric of all time. Wish on a star. You can be who you are. We can do anything. Except resurrect Martin Luther King Jr. who was killed by the FBI. One could argue that Ariana Grande's bubblegum pop era lasted a little bit longer after this. For instance, in 2012, she released a remix with Micah of the song Popular from Wicked, which was one of Ariana's favorite musicals. I'm sure that piece of trivia will never come up again in the story of Ariana Grande's life. Then in 2013, she was working on a song called Pink Champagne, which she ultimately released not as a single and not on any album, but as a bonus track on Twitter. Around this time, Ariana became very serious about kickstarting her career again, this time on her own terms. And she ultimately accomplished this in mid-2013 when she released The Way, a collaboration with rap artist Mac Miller. So here is Ariana's second single, The Way, playing at 95% speed on my Shrek CRT TV. The Way may not be Ariana's first or even second single, but it's the first song she put out that actually sounds like she wanted to make it. It is the first Ariana Grande single that sounds like an Ariana Grande song. And it's also great, which is why it's a much more convenient place to start the story. The song nearly feels like a direct response to Put Your Hearts Up. It's not particularly edgy, especially compared to her later works, but it is a song for adults, which is something that was brought up often during the single's promotion. Interestingly, despite their chemistry in this song, Ariana and Mac didn't start dating for several years after its release, something you'd never guess watching it for the first time. In the end, The Way is a fantastic song and a fantastic start to an incredible career. My only real criticism of it is that it needs more lyrics about the immutable slaughter of civil rights leader Mahatma Gandhi. Ariana would follow the song up with two more singles and then would drop her debut album, Yours Truly, in August 2013. In just one summer, through a short stint of releases, Ariana had propped herself up to become one of the biggest stars in the world. Now, the elephant in the room at this point is that weeks after The Way dropped to the public, Sam and Cat premiered on Nickelodeon, which must have seemed strange at the time. Because just imagine, if you have to, that you're an Ariana Grande fan in June of 2013 who has just discovered her for the first time ever, and you suddenly hear, hey, she has a brand new TV show that's gonna be airing on TV. So you go and you seek it out, and it's a show for babies that has nothing to do with her music. People like to say that Nickelodeon knew, like Nickelodeon knew that Ariana was going to blow up exactly when she did, and that's why they greenlit the show. But, like, I, I don't think that's true. Because if Nickelodeon had predestination knowledge of what that year was going to be like for Ariana, the continuing adventures of Cat Valentine was not the show to greenlight. Wouldn't it make more sense to make a show where Ariana is playing a completely new character called, like, Ariana Stewart, and this character has the same hair color as Ariana Grande, and she talks the same way as Ariana Grande? Towards the end of the summer, as we all know, Sam and Cat took a production break, and according to what I can tell, I'm pretty sure they only took said production break so that Ariana could further her career. 
In August, Ariana made one of her first live performances at the Video Music Video Awards, where she performed an awkwardly choreographed melody of several of her newest songs. This would be followed up by a more professional-looking show done at the American Music Awards. Now, seven or eight years ago, when I started this YouTube channel, this is a sentence that I honestly never would have guessed I would end up saying. Let's talk about the history of Ariana Grande's hair. While she was on Victorious, Ariana had to maintain her physical appearance to be similar to that of her character. What this meant is that every other week, she would bleach her hair and then dye it the iconic shade of Cupcake Red. What Ariana took to doing in 2012 and 2013 is sometimes she would take breaks from filming and she would work on music videos and singles instead. During these periods, she would temporarily dye her hair black or brown in order to create a separation from the role she played on TV. By this point, her hair was heavily damaged by years of the process, and she took to wearing her hair in a ponytail to hide this. Here's why this is important. In July of 2013, Ariana once again dyed her hair back to its natural color she would never go back. And for the rest of her time at Nickelodeon, Ariana would wear a red wig whenever she was expected to play Cat Valentine. To me, this is almost a cinematic piece of storytelling. From this moment forwards, the emotional and physical tug of war between Ariana's two lives would stop existing. Her presence as an artist would always remain her main focus, and while she would still dedicate time to Nickelodeon, she would never let it split hairs ever again. With a top 10 hit now under her belt, Ariana began working on her second album, which leaned a little bit more into the pop sound. And in September of 2013, she also started filming season 1B of Sam and Cat. However, from here, the imminent collapse of her Nickelodeon sitcom and the ongoing launch of her musical career seem to mirror each other like lines in a poem. In the first weeks of April 2014, it was announced that Sam and Cat would be taking a hiatus from production. At the end of that month, Ariana Grande released Problem, a collaboration with Iggy Azalea. The song peaked at number two on the American billboards. Around the same time, Sam and Cat would win the Kids' Choice Award for Favorite TV Show. Ariana would accept the award alone. In early July, Ariana would release the aptly titled Break Free, which reached number four on the Billboard Hot 100. Less than two weeks later, after months of speculation and misinformation, Nickelodeon formally announced that Sam and Cat would not continue past episode 35. Not only would Sam and Cat not get a second season, but from a certain point of view, it didn't even finish the first. That same day, as the news spread online, Ariana posted a twit longer addressing the show's cancellation and saying goodbye to a character that she had played for five years. So the news is out about Sam and Cat. I felt it wasn't my place to make any sort of announcement, so I kept quiet until now. I want to thank Nickelodeon for allowing me to play such a special character who I hid behind for so long. What I mean is that when I was younger, People loved Kat so much that I used to pretend to be just like her. It took me a long time to be brave enough to separate myself and show people how different we actually are. I think that's honestly because I admire her so much. Her appreciation for life and everybody she encounters, her passion and genuine excitement for the little things that most people dread like school projects and work. She always saw negative obstacles as opportunities to make things good. One of my favorite things about Kat was that she never lost her sense of wonder. As we grow up, we become more and more jaded and fearful of how we come across. We hold back a little more, protect ourselves a little more. And although Kat goes through the same ridicule as everybody else does growing up, she never changed or lost her childlike wonder. To me, that's the bravest, most special thing about her. She actually reminds me a lot of Frankie in that way. 
So I know a lot of people will think this is a lot for some dumb kid show character, but to me, she's actually a lot smarter, stronger, and braver than all the rest of us. Hopefully we'll find out one day if Kat and Robbie ever got married. If I had any say in the story from here on out, I'd make sure that they were happily married with sweet, eccentric, Jewish, artificially red-headed babies. Kat would constantly find herself reminding Aunt Sam to leave the butter sock and other dangerous weapons out of the house. They'd live down the street from Jade and Beck, also happily married, with purple and black-haired, pale, grungy, beautiful goth babies. Thank you to the cast and crew, who I spent almost every day with for a good four or five years. Thanks for lighting us up beautifully, making the most incredible props, keeping us on track, and most of all, for making it such a positive work environment. The guys behind the scenes couldn't have been more pleasant or hardworking, and I appreciate them for that so much. Finally, thank you from the bottom of my heart to a true friend of mine, Dan Sh The final episode of Sam and Cat aired on July the 17th, 2014. Ariana's fanbase seemed to barely recognize the change, and 11 days later, the tri-collaboration Bang Bang kickstarted Ariana's post-Nickelodeon career in the biggest way possible. These days, it's almost difficult to imagine how big of a pop culture entity Ariana Grande truly is. Today, she is the fifth most followed personality on all of social media. And when you download Spotify onto your phone, Ariana Grande is one of the artists displayed in the page goading you to make an account. To an entire generation of music lovers, Ariana Grande isn't just a popular artist, she represents the concept of music itself, which only makes it more inexplicable that at the very foundation of her music career, she was playing a delicate balancing act just to keep Cat Valentine in her life for a few extra months. And that is the exact number of words that I am contractually obligated to say about Ariana Grande. Do, do, do. That's better. Okay. Motherfuck it. I am- Oh! So at this point, we're probably about 4 hours and 51 or 52 minutes into this. And, uh, that's a little bit of a problem, as those of you who watched my, uh, my Victorious videos will know. Because, uh, it's- it's an issue of, uh, of, uh, branding here. Uh, people are gonna get more mad about a time code that starts with a 5 than a time code that starts with a 4. So we need to push this video over the finish line, get us to a time code that starts with a 5, so we can make as many people as possible angry, then a bunch of angry people are going to make viral tweets about the video, and then more people are going to find the video that way. Um, incidentally, a uh, brief intermission here, I want to do a bonus intermission. This one is called, How Long Can Quentin Hold His Breath? that long that long i know that it's probably completely distant in your minds at this point but i hope that you guys have some sort of anticipation for part two where we're going to be reviewing uh the final 15 episodes of sam and cat although as a spoiler 
one of those remaining episodes is a bloopers episode. So there are only 14 real episodes of Sam and Cat left, because we all know that the bloopers episodes shouldn't count. But it's 15, it's 14 episodes and a bloopers episode. But the interesting thing is, it's not a lot of episodes, but some of those episodes are like the most memorable episodes. Like um, the episodes that people will bring up to you just like off the cuff, like, uh, like, hey, remember that episode where Sam and Cat make a meth lab? Like, you know what I mean? Like, like people, people will remember some of those episodes. So we're going to get into those. Um, and we're going to cover the end of the show again from, you know, the other side of the ballpark. Getting this video out gives a real sense of mixed emotions because, um, as I've said earlier, this was supposed to come out several months ago and then my life, uh, fell apart and, um, it's been really hard to get through everything and I wish I could tell you guys about it, about it all, but I, I can't, I can't sadly. And, um... You know, it, 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 some days it's hard to even imagine there being a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but, the, but the real mixed emotions come from the fact that I'm excited I finally got this out. But I am so depressed that I am so incredibly late with this video. <laughs> to the point that I'm putting... I, I, you know, like I said earlier, if part two was coming out right now, I would have done everything right. But instead, these last few weeks have just been a constant reminder... Of the fact that I did fail. <laughs> you know. Um, um, but let me tell you this. Originally the plan was. The first video was going to end. With a big long segment. Plugging the pre-order on Jeanette McCurdy's book. Because. I, I had always kind of felt this sense of guilt. Over the idea. That I always knew. You know. That I was going to have to cover the stuff that Jeanette was going through. And meanwhile, I was making, like, haha -ha funny content out of it. And I felt, you know, I sometimes felt pretty shitty about it. And I thought, well, the one thing, the way I can make it up to this, to her, is, is you know, when I first heard about that book, I was like, oh, I got to plug that book. I got to get people to buy that book, you know. And it was going to be an ultimatum for me. It was going to be like, if you guys like this video, you'd better buy that book or I'm going to come kick your ass. <laughs> and that was going to be my way to unload some of the guilt I felt about making this haha -ha funny content about stuff that at times it, that pretty much all the time it's not really that haha -ha funny um and then you know i missed my goal of getting out before then and now the book is like a bestseller like 20 times over so ending this video with an advertisement for the book feels stupid <laughs> because now we've gone back around where i thought i was going you know i thought i was going to help people come to understand that this book had come out instead because the book came out more people are going to watch this video so i've looped back around to being an asshole again <laughs> you know what i mean but but like i said i think the book is like a bestseller like 10 times over but you know if i can make if i can convince you guys to make it like a bestseller 10 and a half times over i think that's great to me and one of the big reasons i do want to plug this is that in part two, I'm obviously going to be discussing the contents of it, which is, like, also shitty on another level, I feel like, because then I'm, like, I'm, like, making a video that's almost like, well, here's what's in the book, so you don't have to buy it. So I want to really encourage you guys, like, you know, if you can afford to get some copy of this book, I think you should. I think you should support Jeanette, and I think you should go out, and I think you should buy this book. Um, you know, if you can find it, I, I know it's maybe hard to get some days but i hear the audiobook is actually like the ultimate way to get it um because it's actually jeanette reading the story and it, it, it delivers it in a whole different way but but no matter how you want to go about it just supporting this is i think a really big thing i want to like hammer home that like if you like this mini series and you have 20 free bucks in your wallet i think you should buy this book you know, that's just how I feel about it, period. And I'm going to have links to this in the description and all that, obviously. Um, uh, but, oh my goodness, it, it, it's been a stressful few weeks because I often... I, I'm depressed right now. And I've been trying desperately to get positive vibes and feedback on this video so I could get motivation to push through and finish it. And literally all anyone wanted to do 
was to tell me that the book was out. <laughs> like it was, I mean, I'm not, com I'm not complaining that she released the book. I'm not, but it was like, I'd post this video on like Patreon, I'd like the first three hours of the video to, you know, you know, am I doing this right? Try and give me some positive vibes. And like every comment would be like, did you know Jeanette McCurdy has a book? And I'd be like, yes, yes, I knew that, <laughs> you know? And then, and then I'd be like, but I'm trying to finish th this segment right now and I'm depressed. And they'd be like, well, it shouldn't take that long. Sam and Cat only has one season, you know? And it was just a loop of those two talking points over and over again. But I I'm serious when I say this, buy the book. Please, please buy the book if you like this miniseries. Please buy the book. Okay. Another reason this video is weird is that, um... I, it's, I've literally spent so long on it that just stuff I made at the beginning of the video feels like a hundred years ago, especially with the year I've had, like, and it's going to feel really weird. <laughs> like the Gibby stuff, for instance, like the Gibby stuff. First of all, I'm going to have all the, the telly snaps, uh, the, uh, iPad, you know, multicam photos in the description. So if you want to check all those out and, you know, do that posted the lost media wiki i don't care but it's gonna be weird when people are like talking to me about that tomorrow because it's like <laughs> that was like a billion years ago for me but i am really proud of those segments and this video and i hope you guys have enjoyed it i'm trying to think of what else i should say at the end of the year um i i didn't script any of this i'm just going off the cuff because i don't know if it felt like it would be a waste of time to spend like two hours <laughs> writing a script and then feeling like it's not good enough so i was like i'll just sit in front of the camera and talk who, who cares um but i wanted to say right now i'm actually um i'm actually if you're an editor right right now by the way and you think you can edit in the in like the style of of like the episode reviews by themselves because I, I i don't hire camcorder editors i edit all my intermissions and camcorder stuff by myself but I do like to hire, you know, I, I do like to hire people to edit down just like the audio of me talking over episodes. And I am looking for more editors to bring on because I'm working on a really big project. And on September the 1st, I don't know if that's before or after this video comes out, but on September the 1st, I'm going to have a four hour preview of a video coming out in April, which is going to be the longest video I've ever posted. So if you guys want to join my Patreon, it's going to be posted there. And I would love to see your guys' feedback on it because it is probably, at least as a pitch, the funniest idea, like the funniest pitch I've ever done. And I'm really excited to see how people bounce off of it. Sam and Cat has just been one of the weirdest shows to watch because it feels like if, you know, the, the joke is always like I always say in an episode, like I could be making this up. But like Sam and Cat feels like a show I, I made up. It feels like a, a show you have in like a night, in like a dream. Like, you, you binge a bunch of my videos, and then you have a dream. And, like, Sam, that's what Sam and Cat feels like. Like, just, like, all these episodes, I watch an episode, and I'm like, this doesn't feel... You know, like, an episode that's a sequel to, I, you know, to the iCarly Twin episode, that doesn't feel real. And all these weird revolving elements. I mean, to this day, the funny thing is, I still can't imagine Ariana Grande and Jeanette McCurdy standing in a room together. And that's all the show is. Like, I still can't imagine that in my head, and that's that's the entire show, and it still doesn't seem like a real thing to me. Um, what else should I say? Bye, Bonbon, bon, bye. I want to thank you guys for all the support you've given me these last couple years. Um, before, before this summer, I was having such a great time, and the bad stuff I'm going through has nothing to do with you guys. Because you guys have all been so great. And this project has been such a weird roller coaster, such a weird, wacky, dumb ride. And it has been the best experience I've ever had with the internet. So I want to thank you guys for, for pushing me to this whole new place. And um, I got my teeth fixed because of you guys. I didn't, <laughs> for like. The entire time I'd been doing YouTube, I'd never been able to afford to get my teeth fixed. So I went in and I had, I had, oh my God, it was so much. You don't want to even know. <laughs> but I got like, like literally, you know, just like it. So it's not even just like I'm doing better emotionally. Like I have teeth now and that feels great. 
And it's literally just because of all the support you guys have been giving me, you know. This project blowing up has, has helped me live a better life. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. And all that positive energy that you've been feeding to me over these years, all I'm asking is you filter some of it over here and you support Jeanette because I think I think she deserves it better. <laughs> I think she deserves, you know, so if, you know, I, I, I'm going to guess there's like maybe 1% of you who didn't know this was out. And if that's the case, you know, like really do buy the book. I want to encourage that more than anything else. Another thing I want to say, um, I've plugged this before. There is a chan There is a playlist on my channel called Long Boys, okay? And Long Boys is meant to be um, sort of an experience where you watch some of my videos and they're sorted from least long to most long until you hit this many series, then they're all in chronological order. And the idea is that it's like the further you get into this playlist, the more of an investment it is, right? And Long Boys is like my favorite thing I've done in years because it is, if, you, if you've just found the channel and you don't know anything about me, watch that playlist um, or, you know, at least watch the first couple of videos on it because you will really like get the channel a little bit more if you sit through that. But the, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because I have just recently added, I think this week, a Long Boys bonus round. And what this means is at the end of the Long Boys playlist, there is a second round of um, long videos, once again sorted from least long to most long. But these are all made by other YouTubers. Um, these are YouTubers that I watch. These are videos that I have seen that are also on the longer side, which I feel like deserve to be elevated as much as you guys have elevated this video. And so a, a couple of those YouTubers are, are real small. Um, I, I, there's, I think there's three of them that are below 100K. I think there's two of them that are below 10K from my memory. So um, if you've liked this video, I recommend you go and check those videos out because they're all fantastic. And please support those creators. And so just check out some of these creators that I've added to the playlist. You know, subscribe to their channels, send them my love. And, and um, I, think, I think this will be a great thing for you because you're gonna be finding YouTubers that are better than I am. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'll be honest, I, I, uh, I'm just so overwhelmed by some of the support I get for these videos that I just like to share that with other people. Um, and God, this has been the most inane rambling segment. I'm, I'm trying to live six months in the, in the future. That's all I've been trying to do since things went bad. I've just been trying to tell myself, well, you know, in a hundred days, maybe things will be 1% better instead of 30% worse. And it hasn't worked out so far. <laughs> you know, six months ago, things were better than they are right now, but I'm just trying to live in the future and just hope, wow, eventually things won't suck. Um, but I just want to thank you guys for watching to the end of this video. And God, I hope we're past the five hour mark at this point because, oh my goodness, I can't imagine what I'll do if I have to ramble more than I've already rambled. Um, but I think I've summed it all up. There's Gibby stuff in the description. Buy Jeanette's book. Uh, support creators in the Long Boys playlist. Uh, um, check out some of my future projects on Patreon. And I'll have Sam and Cat Part 2 out hopefully in the next 30 years. So with that... I've been Quentin... <laughs> fucked up my name. <laughs> so with that, I've been Quentin Reviews. And that's all you need. One day at a time, being a man. And his name's Go Go Gibby. One day at a time, being a man. And his name's Go Go Gibby. His name's Gibby. That's his name, Gibby. His name's Gibby. His name's Gibby. His name's Gibby. That's his name, Gibby. His name's Gibby. And he